Honourable Members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society, bless this Legislative Council, now assembled, to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role for which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This House acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pays its respects to their elders both past and present. Members, I have a statement. On Wednesday, the 4th of August 2021, the Leader of the Opposition sought my advice in relation to his intention to seek leave to table certain documents. These documents were correspondence passing between the Leader of the Opposition and the Chair of the Procedure and Privileges Committee relating to the current inquiry on the review of the standing orders. The Leader of the Opposition acknowledged in his speech that submissions to a parliamentary committee are confidential to the committee until such time as the committee agrees to release it. However, he appears to have been under a misapprehension that documentation not published by the Pro Procedure and Privileges Committee may be tabled and published in the Council Chamber because absolute privilege applies to that publication. I note at this time the Procedure and Privileges Committee has not published any submission or any other correspondence received by, by it related to its inquiry. The standing orders permit committees and ultimately the House to control the publication of committee records. The standing orders provide that private evidence, which includes submissions or any document or record received by a committee or committee material, including correspondence sent by a committee, shall not be published by any committee member or person unless otherwise ordered by the committee or the council. In these circumstances, it would seem contrary to the standing orders for the correspondence to be tabled. Members, are there any petitions? The Honourable Nick Guerin. President, I present a petition containing 2,172 signatures couched in the following terms. So the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australian Parliament assembled. We, the undersigned, are opposed to the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2020. We are concerned that the proposed law denies freedom of speech and expression and that it is so broadly drafted as to be open to misuse by organisations whose core business is to terminate the life of the unborn. We are particularly concerned that the prohibited behaviours that are not defined in the bill will be prescribed by regulations in future and could preclude pregnant women from receiving offers of assistance at a time when they feel, may feel pressured and are seeking support. We therefore ask the Legislative Council to inquire into why groups offering support cannot be adequately controlled by suitable conditions attached to police permits issued under the Public Order in Streets Act 1984 and whether sufficient authentic counselling and supports are currently in place to provide pregnant women with means for continuing their pregnancy to term. And your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. 
Are there any further petitions? Statements by ministers and parliamentary secretaries. The Minister for Agriculture and Food. Thank you, President. With the agriculture industry facing unprecedented labour shortages, the McGowan government is continuing to deliver innovative programs uh, to bring new workers into agriculture. In late July, we hosted a shearing and wool handling camp, uh, our second for 2021, at Andrew Kenny's Rubicon Farm in Badgingara. This is the latest in a series of shearing camps targeting uh, Aboriginal people, run jointly by the McGowan Government, the Australian Wool Innovation and the WA Shearing Industry Association. The training delivery model was refined at Rubicon Farm to upskill novice and improver shearers, shed hands and wool handlers, to support the transition of graduates into the workforce. 18 people who graduated from July's camp, including 13 novices and five shearing improvers. Eight of the trainees were Aboriginal, many of them picking up an old family tradition. Five shearing contractors visited the camp, working directly with the students to hone their skills and prepare for the workforce. We extend a big thank you to Dongra-based Mike Henderson shearing contractors for giving up 2,000 sheep from his normal contract with Rubicon for training, and to the Kenny family for hosting the camp. Our shearing camps are providing industry with a steady supply of new workers and are opening up real opportunities for Aboriginal kids in well-paid work. Are there any further statements by ministers and parliamentary secretaries? Papers for tabling. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I have the following paper to be laid on the table. Local Laws, Local Government Act 1995, Shire of Laverton, Bushfire Brigades, Local Law 2021. Further papers for tabling. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, President, I'm directed to present report number 133 of the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review, Fair Trading Amendment Bill 2021. Would uh, you uh, that report is tabled? Would you like to make a statement? Uh, yes, President. President, the report that I have just tabled advises. Oh, sorry, you're supposed to give me the call. But anyway, to the Honourable Donna okay, Farragher. Thank you. Um, President, the report that I have just tabled advises the House of the Committee's findings and recommendations regarding the Fair Trading Amendment Bill 2021. The Fair Trading Amendment Bill 2021 proposes to one, amend the Fair Trading Act 2010 by incorporating amendments to the Australian Consumer Law that have come into force prior to 1 June 2021, two, automatically incorporate amendments to the Australian Consumer Law into the Fair Trading Act 2010, subject to the amendments being disallowed by Parliament, and three, introduce a disallowance mechanism to allow Parliament the opportunity to disallow amendments to the Australian Consumer Law before they are automatically incorporated into the Fair Trading Act 2010. The Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review has identified that the disallowance mechanism impacts on the parliamentary sovereignty and lawmaking powers of the parliament for the following reasons. One, once a disallowance motion is moved, there is nothing in the bill to trigger a debate on the disallowance motion. And two, the amendments to the Australian Consumer Law do not come in within the terms of reference of any Legislative Council Standing Committee and will not be scrutinised by a committee. The committee has therefore proposed recommendations to address these sovereignty issues. President, in commending the report to the House, it is noted that the committee has recommended that Standing Order 67 be amended and that the bill be amended so that Commonwealth amending laws are referred to the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Le Legislation. I therefore move without notice that Recommendation 1 of the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation contained in its Report 133, Fair Trading Amendment Bill 2021, be adopted and agreed to, and I seek leave to continue my remarks at a later stage of this day's sitting. Is leave granted? Right. Leave is granted, and that motion now stands adjourned under Standing Order 190. The Honourable Donna Farragher. No, thank you, President. President, I'm directed to present report number 134 of the Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review, Transport Legislation Amendment, Identity Matching Services Bill 2021. 
Uh, that report's tabled. Would you like to make a statement? Yes, President. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Thank you, President. Uh, the report I have just tabled advises the House of the Committee's findings and recommendations regarding the Transport Legislation Amendment, Identity Matching Services Bill 2021. The Transport Legislation Amendment, Identity Matching Services Bill 2021 seeks to give effect to Western Australia's commitments made under the Intergovernmental Agreement on Identity Matching Services entered into on 5 October 2017 between the Commonwealth and all states and territories. The Transport Legislation Amendment uh, Identity Matching Services Bill 2021 proposes to authorise the government to disclose photographs and identifying information to a national driver licence facial recognition solution for identity matching. Amendments are proposed to the Road Traffic Administration Act 2008, Road Traffic Authorisation to Drive Act 2008 and Western Australian Photo Card Act 2014 to allow this to happen. The Commonwealth Government will operate and manage the National Driver Licence Facial Recognition Solution. The Commonwealth legislation seeking to govern the implementation of the National Driver Licence Facial Recognition Solution has not, however, been enacted. The Standing Committee on Uniform Legislation and Statutes Review has identified several clauses in the bill that impact the sovereignty and lawmaking powers of the Western Australian Parliament. The committee has proposed recommendations to address these sovereignty issues. The committee draws these clauses and the report recommendations to the Legislative Council's attention for consideration during debate on the bill, and I commend the report to the House. Uh, okay, and that uh, report stands to be debated. Is there a recommendation in there? Is there a recommendation in there? No. no it was just a statement. It was indeed. Contains no recommendations or motions. Thank you. Are there any further papers for tabling? Uh, are there any notice of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? Are there any motions without notice? Members, we move to order of the orders of the day, Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I move without notice that orders of the day numbers 9, 18, 19, 21 to 26, 30, 32 and 34 to 40 be taken after order of the day number 44. Members, the Leader has moved that motion. The question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, which takes us to order of the day number one. Uh, the Honourable Martin Pritchard. Thank you, uh, I move without notice that order of the day number one, City of Bunbury, Public Places and Local Government Property, Local Law 2020 be discharged from the notice paper. Uh, members, the honourable member has moved that uh, motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Before I give the honourable Martin Pritchard the call again, I should point out that there are a number of motions ahead of us um, regarding these, so we will just work our way methodically through them. Yeah. So it's. The normal practice is that the House would be given a reason, and normally it's because any issues that had been identified as potentially problematic have been resolved. Um, so I wonder if that's uh, if we're able to get a reasoning for each of those. Uh, Honourable Member, was the, was the reason for the uh, discharge not included in your statement? No, it wasn't, I'm afraid, uh, President, but I'm happy to give a reason. The reason being that uh, I and indeed the committee are now satisfied that uh, all of the concerns are now been resolved. Okay, thank you for pointing that out, Leader of the House. And honourable member, I request that you um, consider including reasons in the next bundle of motions that you are about to bring to us. Order of the day number two, Boxing Contest Rules 2020. The Honourable Martin Pritchard. President, uh, I move without notice that order of the day number two, Boxing Contest Rules 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. And, President, uh, uh, the reason being that all of the concerns have been satisfied uh, by myself and indeed uh, from the committee. Members, the question is uh, that motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number three, kickboxing. President. Honourable Martin Pritchard. 
Uh, I move without notice that order of the day number three, kickboxing contest rules 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. Okay. And by way of explanation, all of the concerns have been resolved uh, to my, my satisfaction and also the committee's. Members, the, the Honourable Martin Pritchard has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number four, the Honourable Martin Pritchard. President, I move without notice that order of the day number four, MMA contest rules 2019, be discharged from the notice paper. And by way of explanation, all of the concerns have been resolved to my satisfaction and indeed the committee's satisfaction. That opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number five. Uh, President. The Honourable Martin Pritchard. Uh, President, I move without notice that order of the day number five, uh, mail tie contest rules 2020, be discharged from the notice paper. And uh, by explanation, all of the concerns that I have and indeed the committee have had have all been resolved. Members, the Honourable Martin Pritchard has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number six. The Honourable Martin Pritchard. Uh, President, if I may sorry. direct. Oh, oh, sorry. The Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to a recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, order of the day number six, road traffic towing of vehicles regulations 2020, be discharged from the notice paper, as the matter has been resolved. Uh, members, the Honourable Lorna Harper has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The order of the day number seven, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 7, City of Greater Geraldton Public Places and Local Government Property Local Law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Uh, members, the Honourable Lorna Harper has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Honourable Lorna Harper on Order of the Day No. 8. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 8, Shire of Kilgardie Waste Local Law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the Honourable Lorna Harper has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We skip over nine and go to order of the day number 10, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, order of the day number 10, City of Belmont, Consolidated Local Law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the Honourable Lorna Harper has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Order of the day number 11, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, order of the day number 11, consumer goods, products containing button coin batteries, safety standard 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. The Honourable Lorna Harper has moved that motion. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Um, to the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number 12, the Honourable Lord A. Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, order of the day number 12, consumer goods, button coin, batteries, information standard 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the, that motion has been moved. The question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number 13, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, order of the day number 13, consumer goods, button coin, batteries, safety standard 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Uh, Members, that motion has been moved. The question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Uh, to the contrary, say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, order of the day number 14, the Honourable Lorna Harper. 
President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 14, Consumer Goods Products Containing Button Coin Batteries, Information Standard 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, that uh, motion has been moved. The question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number 15, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 15, City of Bayswater Waste Local Law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the day number 16, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 16, Bush Fires Amendment Regulations 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, uh, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the Day No. 17, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 17, National Disability Insurance Scheme, Worker Screening, Regulations 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, uh, that motion has been moved. The question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We, move, we skip 18 and 19 and move to order of the day number 20. The Honourable Lorna Harper. Thank you. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 20, City of Coburn Parking and Parking Facilities Amendment No. 1, Local Law 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Um, the members, that motion has been moved. Uh, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We now move to order of the day number 27. The Honourable Lorna, Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 27, Town of Cottesloe Local Government, Meetings Procedure, Local Law 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the question is that motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the Day No. 28, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 28, City of Rockingham Fencing Local Law 2020, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order of the Day No. 29, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 29, City of Canning, Dog Local Law 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. We skip over Order of the Day No. 30 and go to No. 31, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 31, Town of Victoria Park, Fencing Local Law 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as the matter has been resolved. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Now move to order of the day number 33, the Honourable Lorna Harper. President, I move without notice that, pursuant to recommendation of the Joint Standing Committee on Delegated Legislation, Order of the Day No. 33, Racing Bets Levy Amendment Regulations 2021, be discharged from the notice paper as this matter has been resolved. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. And that concludes the disallowance motions for today. We now move to order of the day uh, number 46. Uh, 
Uh, and before uh, we move to that bill, I have a statement. In relation to the bill, honourable member. We are about to commence debate on the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. This bill, by its policy content, may evoke emotive contributions, responses and views. Some of those views will be contentious to some members and not to others. I remind members there are a wide range of views on this matter and ask that each of you consider all contributions to the, this debate with respect as you consider this bill in each of its stages. So, members, we move to the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill 2021, and the question is the bill be read a second time. All those of that, so the Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thanks, President. I was a bit concerned that uh, debate was going to elapse then, so I'm happy to assist the House in, uh, uh, in um, kicking off the second reading. And I, I want to um, point out from um, um, the outset that I'll be speaking um, entirely uh, on my own behalf. Um, there is not a formal position um, of the opposition on this matter, and, and every member of the opposition is entitled to a conscience vote with respect uh, to this bill. So, um, that having said, I'm not the lead speaker um, for anyone apart from myself. Uh, President, I, um, this, this bill has had a, um, um, a fairly recent um, um, history, um, but one that I just want to go over uh, with respect to setting out um, some of the recent developments with respect to this bill. And um, members who served in the, uh, in the last parliament would be aware that uh, a bill in a fairly similar form uh, was tabled called the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill of 2020. And now, um, when I say in a similar form, it wasn't exactly um, the same form um, as the bill, that's, uh, the bill that's before us. And that was uh, made clear by the Minister representing the Minister for Health uh, in his response to parliamentary question without notice 316 on the 17th of June 2021, uh, when I asked, um, how does the bill differ from what was introduced into the Legislative Assembly on 14 October 2020? And, and the Minister's response um, was, besides a few editorial changes, only one minor change was made to the previous bill that was introduced into the Legislative Assembly last year. The removal of proposed section 306 capital C laying reports before House, House of Parliament not sitting. It was a procedural provision not related to the substantial safe access zones provision that required the minister to send their report on the review of the bill prepared after its fifth anniversary to the clerk of the House if, in the minister's opinion, a House of Parliament will not sit during the period of 21 days after the finalisation of the report. That provision was originally added to the previous bill at the request of the Parliamentary Council's office. Um, so I guess in some respects a, a fairly um, minor and non-substantive change um, to the, the, uh, the substance of the bill that's before us, President. But um, I, I haven't um, had the opportunity, nor have I sought an opportunity for a further briefing um, since uh, uh, the bill was uh, since, that, so, since the answer to that question was received. I have had a briefing on both bills, um, but uh, I thought it was a matter that I could probably just get uh, a response from the from the minister responsible on the record as to um, what's changed between uh, the 2020 vintage and the 2021 vintage um, of these two bills with respect to this tabling provision uh, of a um, of a review five years after uh, the bill. Um, um, comes, into, comes into effect. Now, um, members would be aware um, that have taken an interest in this bill. This bill creates, uh, for the first time in Western Australia, the notion of a safe access zone, um, not just within the bounds of a prescribed premise, but around premises at which uh, abortions um, 
are administered. And uh, it also prohibits uh, the publication and distribution of certain recordings uh, in the interest of protecting privacy. And it also restricts certain uh, uh, prohibited behaviours uh, within the safe access zone. Um, President, at that point, I, I'd like to pause and, and say, um, I think when I had my first briefing on the 2020 bill, I think at that time, um, the High Court had, had considered the validity of the Victorian and the Tasmanian uh, legislation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and, uh, and I think South Australia was in the throes of establishing a safe access zone regime in that state. I think, if my memory serves me correctly, it had passed one house but not the other. It was before the Legislative Council of, of South Australia at that time. Uh, obviously, more time has elapsed uh, between these two bills, and we now have before us uh, the, the 2021 um, version. And, uh, and as I understand it, Western Australia is, um, is indeed the last jurisdiction in Australia to implement uh, a regime of safe access, safe access uh, zones. And, and I think, um, uh, in, in some respects, that has allowed a number of things to occur. It has allowed, and, and I'll turn to the consultation um, report of the Department of Health um, shortly, um, but it has allowed us to have a very fulsome um, examination of the experience in other jurisdictions. Uh, it has also allowed us to reflect on um, the decision of, uh, I believe, the full bench of the High Court um, with respect to the constitutional validity of uh, the Victorian and the Tasmanian legislation. And as I understand it from my briefers, um, this legislation is modelled on uh, the Victorian, uh, the Victorian legislation. Now, um, when I, uh, President, when I when I um, prepare for um, contributions to bills, one of the first places I turn to is uh, a search of government media statements on the um, media statements um, website, and it's usually a, a useful source of information in terms of. Um, uh, identifying particularly historical statements uh, from the government or indeed um, former governments um, with respect to matters under consideration. And, and, uh, and on this occasion, um, there are uh, at least five um, media statements that I've been able to identify, which go right back to, uh, and don't, don't go very back far in time, only go back to 2019, President, but um, I guess what they do is they step out the process uh, that the government um, elected to pursue um, with respect to the way in which they um, identified uh, the issue that they sought to address, consulted um, with the community, um, created a, a, a consultation report, and then obviously Cabinet and government made a decision thereafter. Now, um, that's a, um, um, a process, I think, worthy of... of um, um, uh, worthy of, of some respect, um, unlike some perhaps re more recent um, government decisions. I think that this, is, this, this process has been done in quite uh, an, or an orderly uh, fashion. Um, so as I said, President, on the 8th of March 2019, uh, there was a media statement um, from the Minister for Health. And uh, I, th I think, in fact, they were all joint media statements with um, the Minister for Child Protection, Women's Interests, Protection of Family and Domestic Violence Community Services, the Honourable Simone uh, McGurk. Now, on the 8th of March 2019, it was um, obviously the start of this process where um, the government was simply signalling um, its intent um, to, to introduce um, this concept of safe access zones around abortion clinics in Western Australia uh, and that it intended to do so by the release of a discussion paper and a public consultation process following um, the uh, decision of, uh, of the High Court. Now, um, step forward a month on the 17th of April uh, 2019, um, the public consultation began uh, on the safe access zone um, regime with the closing date for submissions of May 31, um, 2019. And I think uh, that the High Court decision at that stage had only been, um, uh, had only been 
delivered uh, in the week prior. So it was in, in, in early April. Um, there was a judgment of the um, of the High Court, and, uh, and and the government moved fairly swiftly to release its its discussion paper and start uh, the consultation uh, the consultation process. Um, on the 10th of February 2020, so um, that's from April, uh, May submissions, end of May submissions close of 2019. In February of 2020, uh, the consultation report uh, was released, and that was a document that I'm going to refer to um, shortly because it sets out quite a number of the problems envisaged um, in crafting a legislative response uh, to this issue. And, uh, and it was interesting to read some of the um, uh, submissions, uh, not, not, not in their entirety, but they were obviously um, paraphrased in the, um, um, within the report uh, on this issue. Um, the government at that time, 10th of February 2020, indicated that legislation uh, was now being um, drafted following the public consultation uh, regime. And on the 14th of October 2020, um, the government uh, introduced a, uh, a bill, uh, I'm not sure if this media statement actually coincided with the date of introduction or not. Um, no, it didn't. Uh, yes, it did. The government media statement on the 14th of October coincided with the introduction of a bill into the Legislative Assembly. And I want to quote um, just from this media statement for now, President, um, which is entitled New Legislation to Ensure Safe Access Zones for Women. And it says the bill provides for a safe access zone which will include the protected premises and any area within 150 metres of the boundary. The zone will apply 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Within those zones, prohibited behaviours will include harassing, intimidating and threatening a person accessing premises at which abortions are provided. Uh, communicating by any means in relation to abortion in a manner that can be seen or heard by a person accessing the premises and is reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety, impeding a footpath, road or vehicle without reasonable excuse in relation to abortion and recording by any means without reasonable excuse another uh, person accessing premises at which abortions are provided without that other person's um, consent. The media statement went on to say, the bill also prohibits a person from publishing and distributing recordings of another person accessing premises at which abortions are provided if the recording could identify that person without their consent or reasonable excuse. Um, engaging in a prohibited behaviour in a safe access zone would attract a maximum penalty of $12,000 and 12 months uh, imprisonment. Um, and obviously the fifth of, um, uh, of those media statements was issued on the 26th of May 2021, uh, whereby uh, the bill was uh, reintroduced um, into, into the Legislative Assembly. So I think um, it's fair to say that uh, a bill being introduced in mid-October 2020 um, prior to a, an election year um, with an election in March was probably not going to progress uh, that far. And uh, in fact, I don't think it was even transmitted. Um, it looks like it passed the Legislative Assembly on the 11th of November 2020, but wasn't introduced into the Legislative Council until the 24th of November 2020. So obviously very late in the 2020 um, parliamentary calendar year, particularly ahead of a, of a general election president. Now, obviously, um, this, bill is, is, this bill is receiving a, um, um, a, a higher priority, perhaps, with its introduction into the Assembly on the 26th of May 2021, and uh, an introduction to this place on the 24th of June 2021, and we're now here in, in, um, in early August uh, debating the second reading. Um, second reading of this of this bill. Now, um, President, the other thing that uh, uh, I wanted to refer to, particularly in the context of um, the consultation report, in fact, I might go there first because it leads on to some of the correspondence that I've received um, with respect uh, to this bill. So, if members who are following this debate, um, um, there's there's a document um, worthy of your consideration issued by the Department of Health. Uh, it's, it's entitled Safe Access Zones, a Proposal for Reform in Western Australia Report 2020. And as I understand it, this was 
um, the finalisation of the um, uh, of the, cons the public consultation process. So it succeeded the discussion paper that was initially released, which the public consultation uh, occurred on. Um, but it was um, it was the report which then government made some decisions uh, in respect of. And it's interesting. Um, there's a number of, of references. I'm not going to go through this report extensively, but. Um, I think that um, the, the first place I wanted to start was around um, the number of submissions, and I think it was actually also quoted um, in the second reading speech. Uh, and, and on page four of this report, it says, the DOH received an extraordinary level of community and in industry engagement with the proposal, including 235 email and paper submissions and 3,949 engagements through the online survey. Um, over 40 public and private organisations made submissions. There were 3,311 respondents to the survey who identified themselves as WA residents, which equated to 83.8 per cent of respondents, um, which is indicative of the importance uh, of the proposal for the community. Now, um, at, the, at the back of this um, report at Appendix 2, um, there's a list of, of organisations and campaigns, and they probably wouldn't number more than 30, um, number 30. So I, su uh, I suspect that there were probably a lot of um, uh, generic campaign submissions, as you, as you tend to expect, members who have served on, on parliamentary committee inquiries and the like. And so it would be good to get a bit of a... Uh, I haven't found if this report, where this report perhaps um, isolates those um, generic responses from um, unique submissions. Um, but it would be interesting to know, uh, because in this list of organisations and campaigns at Appendix 2, um, the Do Gooder campaigns um, is listed, in, and I'm sure members will have received some contact from the same um, style of campaign in recent weeks with respect uh, to the reintroduction of this bill into, uh, into this parliament. Now, um, um, this report uh, uh, sets out at the, uh, at the start um, a number of recommendations. In, fi in, in fact, they make seven. Um, the first, obviously, being safe access zones legislation should be introduced in Western Australia. Uh, the second recommendation, safe access zones should apply to premises at which abortions um, are provided. Um, third recommendation, the scope of the safe access zones should be defined to be the protected premises and an area within 150 metres from the boundaries of the protected premises. Uh, the fourth recommendation, a safe access zone should operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the fifth recommendation, the definition of prohibited behaviour should be modelled on Victoria's definition of prohibited behaviour and its Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008. And the sixth recommendation, the legislation should not provide for exemptions. Now, President, um, I pause at the sixth recommendation because this is an aspect of, of the bill um, that I'd like to explore a little bit further in my second reading contribution because obviously there's a number, if, if I'm not mistaken, three um, reasonable excuse provisions um, in the bill. And, uh, and, and I, I would like to explore, um, whilst you may not um, technically... Um, call them an exemption. Um, I think they give rise to an exemption in certain circumstances, and I think quite properly. Uh, I'm not criticising the provisions, and the, expl and the explanatory memorandum also sets out um, some examples, um, some examples of where uh, um, uh, I think there might be four examples with respect to one or one or two of the reasonable excuses um, of what a reasonable excuse might be. So, in the context of uh, perhaps a court interpreting. Um, this bill. Um, I'd be interested to know to what extent um, that which is set out in the explanatory memorandum um, will, uh, will inform um, a, uh, a, 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 perhaps somebody who's been charged with an offence and, and a judge or a magistrate presiding over, um, over uh, that matter uh, with respect to these reasonable excuse provisions and, and whether or not we are actually doing, uh, we are actually achieving or partially achieving recommendation six, which with respect to um, exemptions. Recommendation seven, um, the legislation should provide for a maximum penalty of a fine of $12,000 and 12 months imprisonment for engaging in prohibited behaviour in a safe access zone and publication of, of visual data 
without consent. Now, um, uh, as far as I can tell, I think all of those recommendations, notwithstanding my comments on recommendation six, uh, all of those recommendations, um, as far as I can see, have been achieved in the, um, in the drafting of uh, both the 2020 and the 2021 uh, um, uh, bill. Now, um, before I turn to that, um, it's also interesting to know for, for members who may not be um, um, aware or who may not have had the opportunity of a briefing. Page 7 of this report also sets out uh, the places that will be uh, captured. So, uh, for example, the places that um, uh, provide abortions, abortion or abortion-related services in, in Western Australia. And, and there's a figure one on page 7 um, which shows that there are two private metropolitan abortion clinics uh, that according to um, notifications of abortions by type of health service in WA 2018, so 2018 figures, that 83% of um, abortions are provided in those two metropolitan clinics. And I think um, one is based in Midland and one is based in Rivervale, as, as, um, as members would be uh, aware. Now, um, so that's 83% of notified um, of notifications in 2018. Um, by comparison, uh, only 3% of total abortions are carried out in public metropolitan hospitals, 4% are carried out in public rural hospitals, and 10% uh, via telehealth and general practice. So um, um, those figures are, are interesting um, um, to, I guess, set the scene of, of um, of, of the context of this problem. And, uh, and I've actually seen, I'm not sure if I'll come across it later, President, but I've actually seen a higher figure quoted. In fact, um, I think I've, I've seen a figure of 98% uh, quoted. It might be in one of the um, pieces of correspondence that I'll, I'll, um, I'll speak to later. Now, when I had the uh, briefing uh, on the first occasion, President, um, I was told that this bill um, will capture 45 locations in Western Australia. So, in effect, it will create a safe access zone um, around 45 premises um, in, in Western Australia, um, two of which uh, are these private clinics um, that uh, I have just identified and, and where uh, I think it's um, accepted where the problem exists. But notwithstanding that, um, this bill will apply to a number of other places in Western Australia. In fact, most of our, um, most of our uh, uh, public hospitals, um, for example, um, will, will have uh, uh, this bill apply to them, um, um, notwithstanding that the problem um, that the government's seeking to address doesn't exist um, at, those, at those places. Um, President, I think at this point I probably want to um, um, talk about uh, the current regulatory regime. And it's interesting, um, and certainly this was the first occasion um, that I became aware of a piece of our statutory law called the Public Order in Streets Act of 1984. And, uh, and as I understand it, um, it's probably not an act that gets regularly referred to, because when I went and asked for one today from the Legislative Council office, they had to print one out for me. So that's probably an indication of, well, one of two things, perhaps, um, that it's in hot demand uh, ahead of the bill today, or perhaps it's not one that's frequently um, uh, requested by members in the consideration of, um, um, uh, in, in, in the consideration of their, uh, uh, of their duties. Now, um, as I understand it, um, there's a permit regime that exists with WA Police uh, uh, that falls under the Public Order in Streets Act of, of 1984, and that comes through um, with respect to this consultation report of 2020. And, and, and this is where I, I do have some um, concern with respect to the extent to which um, we're going to replace or um, add to an existing regulation with another uh, and to what extent it's actually going to address the problem. And, 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 and I'm sure um, that it will have a positive effect in terms of changing 
um, the behaviour at these two clinics. But um, the concern that I have is, is that currently um, this permit process regime um, is administered by the WA Police Force. And, and, uh, and the new regime under this bill will also be um, administered uh, by the WA Police Force. And there's actually some, some good commentary at page 20 of this consultation report in relation to the existing regulatory, regulatory framework. And I want to quote a paragraph um, from this section, President. It says this, WA Police provided some information about breaches of permits and the number of call-outs by police officers to attend tasks at Mari Stopes WA and Nanyara Medical Group premises. Um, breaches are dealt with by police officers as they, as they see fit when they attend. Any incidents are assessed and adjustments to conditions on permits may be made to maintain order in the streets for future prayer vigils. WA Police gave DOH, which is the Department of Health, details of 75 police attendance tasks and 14 offences recorded at Mari Stopes WA Clinics and Nanyara Medical Group from 2014 and 2019. It was noted that some of these tasks may not be related to demonstrator behaviour. The number of tasks recorded is also higher than the number of offences recorded, where no criminal activity is uncovered. The incident may be resolved without an offence being recorded. WA Police also advised that patients do not normally wish to, to take a matter any further as they want to move on and put this, pass, this part of their life behind them. Furthermore, it can be hard to prove that the behaviour occurring outside these premises satisfies the regulatory criteria to act. For example, for while move-on powers are available under the Criminal Investigation Act of 2006, the police officer must reasonably suspect that the person in question is doing or is about to do an act that is likely to involve the use of violence against a person, doing or is about to do an act that will or is likely to cause a person to use violence against another person, doing or about to do any act that will or is likely to cause a person to fear that violence will be used by a person against another person, committing a breach of the peace, hindering, obstructing or preventing lawful activity being carried out by another person, intending to commit or has just committed an offence, committing an offence. It says a police officer can only issue a move on order to one person at a time and a move on order can only be issued for a maximum of 24 hours. So where I started, President, um, with respect to understanding the existing regulatory regime is, is um, um, I posed the question, well, um, what, is, um, what is preventing the police from not, issuing, um, from not issuing these permits? And as I understand, um, there's up to 40 permits per year issued by WA Police um, for the purpose of procession, procession to prayer vigil and peaceful prayer vigil for locations in front of the two main private abortion clinics in Western Australia. Um, now, I can't recall exactly, because it was at my first briefing back in 2020, the answer um, to that question, but I, but I, I think it was um, with respect to um, the decisions uh, of WA Police, there was some sort of policy and obviously they had to be able to defend at, at what point they permitted a certain um, activity and not. And obviously um, 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 they were cautious around um, making decisions um, that were subjective rather than objective. And, and, I, and I think that was the, uh, the type of answer uh, that I received. But it's certainly something that I'd like to, to get an understanding of um, from the Minister in terms of understanding the extent to which the existing regime um, um, is deficient. Now, obviously, um, as I understand it, in most cases, these are um, um, uh, a fairly peaceful protests. Um, um, I have nothing to believe that if this bill becomes law um, that these people um, will seek to break the law. I, I don't know that, but, but I, I, my concern does then go to um, the police's ability to uh, manage potential offences, and, 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 and particularly um, if you think about the pressure on, on policing, um, what sort of priority would these types of responses be given by WA Police um, should the need arise, either under the existing, under the existing regime 
or under the future regime. And, and it's clear the police do respond because um, in this consultation report, um, there was actually references um, to responses and, um, and I think I also just read out some data with respect um, to charges um, um, arising from um, those responses. Now, um, I want to turn now to um, the issue of exemptions, which I did flag um, earlier in my contribution, President, and it's something that's come up as a bit of a theme, um, as a bit of a theme through out um, throughout the uh, uh, w throughout all of my research um, on this issue, and um, and I think I might just jump straight to the um, the Department of Health. So there's, there's a chapter chapter eight in this in this consultation report, which which sets out a number of the um, of the issues, and, and obviously this survey the survey that was conducted. Um, asked a number of questions, and, uh, and one of those questions uh, was with respect to exemptions, and it, it asked, should the legislation specifically exclude the application of the buffer zone in certain circumstances? A, exclude conduct occurring at a church or another religious institution. B, exclude conduct occurring outside parliament or government buildings. C, exclude carrying out of an opinion poll or survey during an election referendum or plebiscite. D, there should be no exemptions, or E, other, please provide detail. Now, um, 2,263 of the um, respondents to this survey, which equated to 77.3%, um, said there should be no exemptions. Um, no exemptions provided um, under, uh, un under a legislative response. And, it's interesting to read the analysis of the Department of Health, which leads to the recommendation six, which is the legislation should not provide for exemptions. And I'll quote from that now, um, President. Um, the question of whether exemptions should be included was carefully considered to ensure the purpose of the legislation was not undermined. In Australia, New South Wales is the only jurisdiction in which safe access zones legislation specifically include exemptions for conduct occurring in a church or other building that is ordinarily used for religious worship or within the curtilage of such a church or building, conduct occurring in the forecourt of or on the footpath or road outside Parliament House, the carrying out of any survey or opinion poll by or with the authority of a candidate or the distribution of any handbill or leaflet by or within the, with, the, with the authority of a candidate during the course of a Commonwealth, state or local government election referendum or plebiscite. Uh, it says the DOH has noted that in Club v Edwards, Kaifel C, J, Bell, J and King J rejected an argument that the extent of the burden might have been reduced by providing for an exception to the probation during election campaigns. It was commented that in the nature of things, the need for abortion services and the anxiety and distress associated with accessing these services is not lessened during election campaigns. If anything, the contrary is likely to be the case. Other exemptions that the DOH has specifically considered are exemptions for staff and persons accompanying a patient to the protected premises, persons employed or contracted to provide services at or near the protected premises, acting reasonably in the provisions, provisions of those services, persons involved in lawful industrial action outside protected premises, and exemptions for police officers acting reasonably in the course of their duties. However, the DOH considers the definition of prohibited behaviour in Victoria's legislation adequately caters for these circumstances and provides enough flexibility to ensure it will not capture other unintended behaviours. Um, it then goes on to say, while there are several churches and other religious institutions in WA that will fall within a proposed safe access zone, the DOH considers that conduct occurring in a church or other religious institution, such as an abortion-related meeting or sermon, will not be captured by the proposed definition of prohibited behaviour. Therefore, without further evidence of need, the DOH does not consider it necessarily provide uh, for specific exemptions in the legislation. So, um, um, President, the, the issue of, um, um, of exemptions, I mean, it, it was interesting because you look at the, and, and, and helpfully at Appendix 1 of this report, there's actually a, um, 
a, a, a cross-jurisdictional comparison um, within Australia. And you can see that um, this bill in many respects mirrors, um, if not entirely um, significantly, um, the regimes um, in other jurisdictions. And it's interesting that New South Wales has um, created these, um, these categories of exemption, um, particularly with respect uh, to parliament, uh, particularly with respect to parliament, although, um, as I understand it, I don't think that is a problem um, that exists necessarily currently in Western Australia, in, in, in Western Australia but um, it, it, may well, it may well be an issue in New South Wales, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, I mean, it could be a, um, a, a future consequence um, of the passage of this legislation and, and the application of a 150 metre at buffer zone falling within, falling within the precincts of the parliament. Um, so, so, President, I think that the, the issue of... Um, I'd like to understand from the government um, um, it's how, it, how it distinguishes between um, the reasonable excuse provisions uh, and certainly uh, in the explanatory memorandum there is some greater detail um, with respect with respect to uh, the reasonable excuse provision examples, which I probably won't have um, time to today to elaborate uh, more on President, but if members turn to page two of the explanatory memorandum, um, you'll see there that uh, there are four listed examples of a reasonable excuse um, with respect to uh, C and D, of proposed new section 202 capital P. Um, and uh, and I, as I said, I won't go into those in detail, but it's probably something that we'll explore more um, in the committee stage um, of this bill. Now, President, um, I wanted to turn now to the, um, some of the correspondence that I'd received um, on this bill. And I must say, um, particularly given the subject matter of this bill, um, the correspondence that I've received has not been, has not been um, plentiful. Um, there, there has been, maybe members have different experiences, um, and, and I'll be interested to know uh, when other contributions are made if those experiences are different, but particularly in the context of, of the, I think what are quite, was quite a significant response to the public consultation process um, undertaken uh, by the government. I think nearly 4,000 um, submissions or responses uh, to surveys, I think th uh, 3,949 engagements, which includes both of those things, submissions and, and um, survey responses. Um, um, I really just have had a, had a handful of, um, of, uh, of correspondence on this issue. And, and as I said, some of, those, uh, some of those have been in the last week or two, um, throughout the months of July and August, and they have come from a, uh, a do-gooder Campaign um, with a and each of them are um, are identical in their um, in, in their uh, in their submission to me, but obviously have written to me in support um, in support of the um, of the bill. But there is a there is a um, an interesting and, and I don't have time to read read their submission, which is identical uh, across the three. But um, uh, Mr. Acting President, there is a, there is a um, a sentence in this email. Um, which says, I'm also concerned that WA's out-of-date abortion laws cause unnecessary distress, delay and denial of abortion care. Now, that's something that's not um, um, expanded on further in these, in these emails um, to me, but certainly is something that... Uh, and I haven't had the time to go... Because I've reflected on these in the last 48 hours and, and I haven't had a chance to go back to any of these uh, people who have corresponded with me to understand... Um, what other aspects of the laws are deficient? Um, obviously, we're, we're regulating here with respect to safe access zones, but I don't think that goes to the issue um, that has been identified um, in these emails with respect to, and I quote, WA's out-of-date abortion um, laws causing unnecessary distress, delay and denial of abortion care. Um, Mr. Acting President, there's, there was also some correspondence which I thought was that I thought was quite useful from from um, 
uh, Murray Stopes Australia, uh, which I received in August of 2020. And um, I'm sure all members, um, or members who were members of the place uh, at that time, of this place at that time, um, would have received similar correspondence. But they actually provided uh, quite some localised information um, for me. And they said uh, in this, in this two-page letter, which I'll only quote selectively from in the interest of time, um, that last year, 645 people from the agricultural region Clients at Murray Stopes Australia Midland Clinic were subjected to these picketers. That is to say, they were provided services for contraception, surgical and medical termination of pregnancy on days when these picketers were camped at the entrance um, to the clinic. So um, it's, it's interesting that they've been able to provide quite specific information in terms of um, not just the number of people from my constituency, but also um, the numbers of people from my constituency who were subjected to the actions um, of, of people engaging in these types of protest um, um, during their visit to the Midland Clinic. Um, now, the, the letter went on to say, the picketing activity, while deemed harmless by the attendees, has a profound impact on the psychological well-being of both staff and patients. In 2017 and 2018, inundated by the number of patient complaints, about the protesters. We collected anonymous feedback from patients and their support people as to the impact of protester presence. I have attached a log of this information. We continue to gather feedback this year and will present it to the parliament um, in coming weeks. Um, now, the, the letter goes on to talk about um, um, the relationship with police and, and, also, um, and also the work of other state and territory ju jurisdictions with respect to safe access zones and also um, the High Court judgment, which I spoke about earlier. But when you read through um, this log um, that was provided and, and some of the actions that um, patients or potential patients attending this clinic were subjected to, um, I must say it is deeply concerning. And, and, and particularly given, given the circumstances in which um, patients uh, are attending these clinics to access services. Um, some of the things that have been um, said, or, said or done according to um, the information that I've received um, does give rise to concern, um, quite strong concern, and, and I suspect is the reason why um, the government um, has, uh, has acted with, with respect to um, introducing uh, with introducing this bill. Now, um, the Australian Medical Association also um, um, made a submission um, to the proposal for reform in Western Australia. And, uh, and again, um, members, in the interest of time, I will just direct members to, um, to consider their, their, some, their short submission over three pages, which, which effectively supports um, the regime that's being introduced um, here and that we're considering today in the Legislative Council. However, the AMA probably have gone one step further in saying that um, the concept of, of uh, protecting the rights of patients to access health care without harassment or interference should be extended beyond, uh, should be extended beyond um, the services that have been contemplated by this bill. And so they, they made an argument for um, a, a greater level of, or, or, or a broader um, level of application, um, which I think would be a, um, a much more difficult um, task, and this is perhaps the first step in contemplating future change. Um, but, but I accept, uh, I accept, um, um, I accept uh, the arguments that they make, and um, and and the final the final paragraph of their submission says the AMAWA would support reasonable application of safe access zones to any healthcare facility, not just limited to premises that provide abortion services, provided there was a need to enable and protect unobstructed access for patients and facility staff, or prevent behaviour that is intended to to discourage individuals from accessing legally available um, healthcare services. Um, Mr. Acting President, I'm running out of time, but I, I want to put um, one more issue on the um, on the record, which hopefully the minister can contemplate in the second reading of this bill before he gives his response, and that is um, the 150 metre rule. And, uh, and I notice it was something that was considered 
in the course of the consideration of the other place. Um, and, 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 I, and I want to know to what extent the government has contemplated the practical implications of um, the 150 metre rule, both in terms of those people wanting to lawfully protest um, once this bill passes, um, or somebody who's going to be making a judgment about whether an offence has been committed, whether that be a police officer or, or whether that be a, a court. Now, um, I don't want to trivialise this, uh, this matter, but if I could draw a comparison here, where we all have a six metre rule that we all have to abide by around polling places in Western Australia, and I see the argy-bargy that exists on polling day between polling day workers, polling day officials, it's, it's almost become a bit of a sport. Um, and that's a six metre rule. So I'd like to understand, and, and, and particularly given it's probably more of an implementation issue, um, how it is that we are going to um, make sure that uh, people, and also particularly given the limited number of, of places where this is actually um, a problem. So we're looking at two, two places, two private clinics in Western Australia uh, where this problem exists, but noting that they provide the majority of the services. So that's why the, the protests have been have been focused um, have been focused at these two um, at these two centres. Now, um, Mr. Acting um, President, I will and truly run out of time on, on this matter, and I certainly could have spoken um, uh, for longer. But I just wanted to quote. Um, I think the final. It is the final um, sentence of the second reading speech, which says, the McGowan government believes that the right to safety, privacy, dignity and respect for women accessing health care, especially during what is a very difficult time, is a right that should be protected by this parliament. I support uh, those words and I'll support this bill. Thank you. The Honourable uh, Samantha Roy. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to make a contribution uh, this afternoon on what is a very important piece of legislation before the House, the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. I'm really pleased to be able to rise today to place on the record my support for this piece of legislation, uh, which is going to provide safe access around premises where abortions are provided. And this will protect the safety, the wellbeing, the privacy and the dignity of women who are going to choose to terminate their child. The bill aims to deal with the ongoing instances of women being confronted by protesters uh, and the anxiety and the distress that that causes, not only the patients that are accessing these clinics, but also the staff that work in these clinics. I want to congratulate the Minister for Health, the Honourable Roger Cook, for introducing this bill uh, early on in this term. The passing of this bill will bring WA in line with uh, the rest of the country. In all of the other jurisdictions, uh, it is already passed uh, in law where we have safe access zones. I'm going to refer just briefly to the uh, second reading speech where uh, it notes that this legislation is modelled on the equivalent legislation in Victoria, which has withstood a challenge in the High Court in Club versus Edwards. The High Court decided that safe access zones do not impermissibly infringe the implied freedom of political communication and that such legislation is constitutionally valid. In addition, reports from clinics indicate that the Victorian model works in, a, in achieving the objectives of the legislation in facilitating a safe environment for women to access abortion services. And I have to say, Acting President, that I'm really proud to be part of this Labor government that is introducing this legislation um, to Parliament and to have a Minister for Health who is absolutely uh, serious when it comes to women's reproductive rights in this state and in protecting women from harassment when they want to access abortion services. And I think that's really important. I'd like to share with the Chamber uh, a personal story from a constituent of mine, Jessica Williams, and she has given permission for me to share her story. 
Her story has already been uh, made public in an uh, ABC online news article uh, back in the 26th of March in 2019. Jessica is the founder of Safe Access Zones, which led the campaign for this legislation over some two years ago. When Jessica left uh, an abortion clinic in Perth, she was upset and in pain. On top of that, she was being called a murderer by pro-life protesters waiting outside the clinic. The 36-year-old mother said she and her husband were confident they had made the right decision to terminate their pregnancy in 2013, but she still felt heavy with emotion. Sadness, grief, loss, confusion, doubt, hatred for myself, Ms Williams said, carrying all of those emotions into the clinic and then being confronted with people that are calling you a murderer and grown men calling out to you to not kill your baby is extremely traumatic. When you are already making a decision that can carry with it a lot of grief and mental, physical and emotional trauma, it can be very overwhelming and can have really disastrous consequences. Ms Williams said a safe zone would have made a world of difference to her experience at the abortion clinic in Rivervale. It would have been like going to your dentist or going to your GP, like any other normal medical appointment, she said. I think it's very important to note that with safe access zones, we are, we are impeding on their rights to protest. They can still protest. They do not need to be right outside the clinic in order to express that right. I want to thank uh, Jessica for allowing me to share her story. I know that she still has to deal with the trauma from those confrontations um, that she experienced back in 2013. Mr Acting President, in uh, New South Wales, uh, Penny Sharp from the Labor Party was heavily involved with the passage of the safe access zone legislation in New South Wales. And in her uh, final second reading uh, debate, which was back on the 24th of March in 2018, she very succinctly said, women should be able to go to the doctor and not have to explain themselves to strangers on the street. They should not have to be photographed. Their boyfriends should not have to be jostled. They should not be filmed. They should not be assaulted. They should not be called baby murderers. They should not be told they are going to hell. They should not be told that they should be repenting their sins. They should just be able to go to the doctor. And Mr Acting President, accessing abortion services is a legal medical procedure. And no one has the right to stand in judgment of any woman, but of those women who choose to access those services. Pressing the wrong button there, excuse me. Um, the Honourable Lorna Harper. I to rise today, and I'm privileged to rise today to um, speak about my support for this bill and safe access zones. Um, living in the East Metropolitan area, I'll probably refer to Midland as that is the area where I generally am. I heard that my honourable colleague um, mention about the necess about 150 metres might be too far. Um, it might be too. Apologies if I said it correctly. I'm paraphrasing. Um, what I meant is the 150 metre zone about the questions of why it should be 150 metres. My daughter, as I've mentioned, suffered from mental health issues, and she used to actually attend Headspace which is on the same street as um, Marie Stropes, which offers abortions, among other services. And as a teenage girl, it's quite confronting to walk down a street with people campaigning and shouting out things, not knowing that you're walking with somebody who is actually there for mental health. Now, Headspace has moved, thankfully, but on the same street, we've got child and adolescent mental health services. 
So people accessing that service also have to walk past this. Whether the people protesting actually speak to the clients of CAMS is irrelevant. They're exposed to it. We're talking about young children with already with mental health services. There are other services on the street as well. People accessing a legal medical procedure should not have to undergo any kind of interference. Unfortunately, in Midland, we have no option but to go to the private provider as the public hospital in Midland, which is run by St John of God, does not offer this service. And remember, it's not just abortions that are held at this clinic. There are other um, procedures there as well, including vasectomies, which I believe are also not offered at St John of God, Midland. It is, this is such a serious and important piece of legislation to protect people in WA, women in particular, and of course we cannot forget the staff, from being mentally and verbally abused by people who disagree with them. We all have the right to disagree with each other, but it's how about we go about that business of disagreement is how we should be reflected in society. And I know those words came out funny, but in my head it sounded perfectly sensible. Um, so I too stand to support this bill. I'm really, really happy and proud to be part of the government that is putting this essential legislation forward. Thank you. No, the Honourable Sophia Lamont. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, today I'd like to congratulate the Government on the amazing bill for the profession, protection of women and girls in regards to safe access to reproductive health care. I'd like to especially acknowledge the work of my friend Jessica Williams, who I know put in an incredible amount of effort into getting this bill here. One of the myths that is often promoted as truth around abortion is that women have regret about that, their abortion. And it turns out that most women don't. Most women, and it's stated that that sits at 95%, think that it was the best decision they could have made for themselves and the possible future of that child. Now I'm aware people aren't going to agree with me on this, and I'm also aware that people have been protesting out the front of Parliament House uh, to stop this bill from uh, going through. Now, I'm curious as to how it must feel to have your antisocial behaviour targeting vulnerable women and girls requiring extra laws to be drafted. Imagine thinking that this behaviour would ever place you on the right side of history especially when you look at the over-representation of rapists in our federal go government. I don't see anyone out there protesting that. If you don't agree with abortions, don't have one. Not your womb means not your business. It really is that simple. Thank you to all of those involved in creating a safer environment for women and girls. Mr Acting President. Thank you. The Honourable Adonna Farragher. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting President. Mr, uh, Mr Acting President, I rise to make a few brief comments uh, with respect to the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. Um, as has already been identified by the Honourable Martin Aldridge, um, both the National Party and the Parliamentary Liberal Party uh, has not taken a, a formal position with respect to this bill. Rather, it is a matter for individual members to form a view according to their conscience. In coming to my position with respect uh, to this bill, I appreciate that there are very firmly held views, both for and against abortion, and I respect that. And indeed, in this very chamber, uh, long before my time, uh, it has played host to hours and hours and hours of debate on this incredibly sensitive matter. Having said that, um, the bill that is before us currently is not about whether abortion should be legal or not. Rather, it is about whether members of this House 
uh, support a bill that provides for safe access zones around premises at which, at which abortions are provided. Now, as has been identified, uh, I think it was by the Honourable Martin Aldridge, presently, um, gatherings or demonstrations, or whatever you want to call it, outside of these premises are regulated through the WA Police, through both the issuing of permits, and I understand that around 40 uh, can be issued per year, well, up to, um, but more could be but on average. And there are also move-on orders under the Criminal Investigation Act 2006. Now, as I understand, with respect to these permits, they are issued to one person, but on behalf of an entity. And so that up to 30 people uh, can be approved to participate, um, albeit, as I, I, I understand, but I don't have the facts in front of me, that the numbers can be higher than that on occasion. Um, <clears throat> the purpose of this bill uh, is to insert a new Part 12C into the Public Health Act 2016. And the purpose, and I want to quote from the bill, the purpose of this part is A, to provide for safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided so as to protect the safety and wellbeing and respect the privacy and dignity of, one, persons, persons accessing the services provided at those premises, and two, employees and other persons who need to access those premises in the course of their duties and responsibilities, and B, to prohibit publication and distribution of certain recordings. Um, the bill does not in itself ban gatherings um, in total, but it does set parameters, uh, that being the establishment of a 150 metre boundary around the premises. It also sets out uh, what is not permitted uh, to be undertaken within that boundary, and that is set out in proposed new section uh, 202P. Uh, and the bill also creates an offence uh, to publish or distribute uh, recordings without consent of another person or without reasonable uh, excuse, and that's at 202Q. Um, informing my position with respect uh, to this bill, I have read uh, the 2020 Department of Health report uh, titled Safe Access Zones, a Proposal for Reform in Western Australia. I too, like, like other members, um, have received confidential testimonies, if I can put it that way, from uh, patients and their support uh, persons and staff um, who have shared their experiences. And I also want to thank members of the community who have taken the time uh, to contact me to express their views with respect to this legislation, whether it is for the legislation or against uh, the legislation. Now, I accept that there are two options that can be considered with respect uh, to um, uh, considering uh, this matter. And these were subject uh, of the discussion paper that preceded the 2020 report. That being to maintain the status quo uh, or to introduce legislation that we see now before uh, the House. In coming to my position in relation to this bill, it is my very strong view uh, that a person accessing any health or medical service, irrespective of reason, should be able to do so with privacy and respect. They should not expect to receive uninvited engagement, whether it is through a direct approach or by other means, by, with all due respect, people who they don't know. Um, but who, by the very nature of their actions, are inviting themselves into someone else's personal space. People with all due respect, who cannot possibly know the circumstances for why a person is accessing that service, who cannot possibly know uh, the state of that person's health, mental health or wellbeing. Um, who cannot possibly know um, their level of emotional distress um, and anxiety uh, and grief. Um, they simply, in my view, and perhaps to be frank, cannot possibly know 
what is going on in another person's life at that point in time. Put simply, it is a person's right to privacy, particularly as it relates uh, to accessing health services. And in my view, and in the context of this bill, that is paramount. Um, I accept <coughs> that there are deeply divided views on the issue of abortion. There will be different views in this House. And as I said at the beginning of my contribution, this House has seen hours and hours and hours of debate on this incredibly sensitive topic. And despite that debate, there will still be different views. And I would like to think that as a House uh, and as members and as a community, we can be respectful of both sides of the argument. But as I've said, <coughs> in coming to my decision with respect to this bill, this bill is not about the legality of abortion. It is about protecting uh, the privacy and dignity of those in our community who, in this instance, seek to access these services. Um, and members, uh, some other members have actually reflected on the um, the judgment of the High Court uh, of Australia back in April 2019. And I just want to quote one aspect uh, of that um, judgment. And it's from page 23, uh, paragraph 84. It says in part, a measure that seeks to ensure that women seek a safe termination are not driven to less safe procedures by being subjected to shaming behaviour or by the fear of the loss of privacy is a rational response to a serious public health issue. The issue has particular significance in the case of those who, by reason of the condition that gives rise to their need for health care, are vulnerable to attempts to hinder their free exercise of choice in that respect. Um, it is for those reasons, Mr Acting President, that I will be supporting the bill. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Thank you, Acting President, and uh, I too rise to make a brief, um, a brief um, comment on the on this bill, this Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. And uh, at the outset, I uh, obviously acknowledge my colleagues who have also said that uh, members on this side do have a conscience vote on this issue, and I recognise that for some, this is a very challenging, um, a challenging area, uh, challenging subject, if you will. Uh, but for me, my conscience is clear I'll be supporting this legislation. I think it is absolutely imperative uh, that we do all we can to protect those most vulnerable in our society. And in this case, when people, when women arrive at such a uh, profound decision uh, as to seek an abortion, I think it's absolutely critical that we uh, offer all the support we can uh, in keeping them safe and offering them that opportunity to, uh, to access those services with dignity uh, and confidentiality as well. Uh, and so, as I understand it, Western Australia is the last state to legislate uh, this provision. Uh, it's a good thing we are getting on with it. Uh, I think it's important. Um, you know, members will know from uh, members who were here in the last parliament will know, and I've probably spoken about it in this parliament, but. I am a dad to five daughters. Um, you know, I hope <laughs> it shows. <laughs> the lack of hair probably helps there. Uh, but you know, if if you know, I, I obviously hope that none of my daughters ever have to make that decision. But if they do, if they do, I would want them to uh, to be able to access those services should they choose that, um, knowing that uh, they weren't going to be confronted. That they could access those services with uh, dignity and and respect. Uh, because I cannot imagine how difficult it would be for uh, any woman to make that decision. So, again, I'll, I'll, I won't speak for much longer other than to say I absolutely support this legislation. Uh, I do think it is, uh, it is imperative that we provide that protection for, for people who access these services. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I can't imagine the, the anguish that people go through in choosing uh, to have an abortion, but uh, they should be afforded every protection once they do. 
Thank you. The question is the bill be read for a second time. The Honourable uh, Brad Pettit. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I also rise to speak in support of the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill. And I want to acknowledge, as many have around this House, that this is one of the, I know this is a difficult bill for some, but um, it is a clear view of myself and of the Greens that the purpose of this bill is quite clear. That is to support women's access to health services and workplace safety. It's not a bill about protesters, as is demonstrated by the fact that the corresponding offences are located in the Public Health Act, not the Criminal Code. This is an important distinction. As most of you would be aware, the Greens are a political party with our roots firmly in the protest movement, um, be it Franklin River in the 70s or more recently in terms of nuclear disarmament. It's certainly protest is something his party is, is proud to support. Um, in fact, it's very much a part of a healthy functioning democracy. But this bill is not about that. It's not about prohibiting protests. Rather, it's about providing a safe place for patients to access medical services. Patients who, as we've heard, are often vulnerable, distressed or in an anxious state and do not need to be exposed to any additional distress or potential harm for accessing legal medical services. I just wanted to quote Dr Philip Godstone, who is the medical director of Mary States Australia, who wrote on this matter to say, staff across the country see what a different safe access zones make to the health and welfare of our patients. Staff come to work each day without being shouted at and harassed, but women in Western Australia do not have this basic right. I think women in the state do deserve this, this basic right, and I'm hopeful that now Western Australia can join the other states and territories by having safe access zones legislated around, around clinics. As other members of this place and other, and other places have noted, Pregnancy terminations are not the only health service that these clinics provide, and it's been harrowing to hear about many people's experiences in trying to access these services. So, in closing, nobody should have to fear being bullied, harassed, or intimidated when trying to access medical services or just to go to work. And I'm hopeful that this bill provides the protections that women accessing these services need. Thank you. Thank you. The questions the bill be read a second time. Uh, the uh, Honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, Acting Speaker. I rise today to support the Safe Access Zone Bill and to make some brief comments on the topic. As has been pointed out by other speakers, this bill seeks to prevent harassment and protects the privacy of women accessing a health service that they have every right to access, as well as protecting the staff of abortion clinics around WA from harassment and intimidation. I would like to draw attention to the Health WA report that makes mention of well-intentioned protesters with various views who are seeking to offer counselling and advice, whether solicited or not. However, this bill first and foremost seeks to protect the safety and well-being of vulnerable members of our community from the, the, the vocal and well and less well-intentioned minority, which I think is the right move and the right balance to strike. To make some, some points on the timing of this bill, so as it's been pointed out, WA is the last jurisdiction to, to pass this, this uh, legislation. Tasmania passed similar legislation in 2013, the ACT in Victoria in 2015, and NT in 2017. So it's really, it's been eight years since the first act um, was, was passed on this. Uh, there was a, uh, a media statement by the government last year which, which said, and I quote, it's time to bring WA into line with the rest of the country. And that statement was made over nine months ago. So I think really WA is living up to the, the wait a while mantra. Um, but I am glad to see that this bill is, is now before the House. I also note that the bill is modelled on the Health WA Safe Zone recommendations, which is itself is modelled on the Victorian legislation. I will be interested to see and, and really ask some questions in committee of the, of the whole House uh, whether this legislation and really the 150 metre rule is, is flexible and fit for purpose for, for WA. I draw attention to there is a mentioned in the, the WA Health Report uh, that the 150 metre rule ensures patients and staff cannot be recorded with advanced technological devices. Now we all know that technology and innovation moves quickly 
and something that's considered advanced in the future will, uh, can become legacy very quickly. So I, I think it'd be interesting to see if, if this rule uh, is, is really applicable in the future. I know that ACT has a head of power uh, clause built in, which does give some flexibility uh, in the future. So it seems like the WA bill itself is a little bit more, uh, more stringent. Saying that, I do support the bill and I look forward to scrutinising further in Committee for the Whole House. Thank you. Uh, the question is the bill be read a second time and uh, Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, Acting President. Uh, look, I, I just would like to offer a few words only to really uh, put my position uh, in relation to uh, the issue of, of abortion in general. And um, I have, but before I do, I just want to make, make uh, clear that I, I, I deeply appreciate the comments that have been made by all the members here today and uh, have an incredible uh, sense of feeling towards those who are making those choices and difficult choices in their lives. And um, certainly I would be very um, saddened to think that at any point in time in anyone's life, uh, where the, uh, particularly a woman who, who were, were a woman who was choosing to undergo a termination, for whatever reason that might be, would be subject to any form of uh, intimidation, harassment, or uh, in any way uh, any distress in that process. But in saying that, I just want to put for the record um, my position in relation to the, the life issue, I am, I would call myself someone who is pro-life, someone who has um, you know, lived that as a personal thing, and I'm, as a man I, I understand that's not an issue that I have to face with personally, uh, other than the fact that um, you know, I, I, I just believe that from a point of view, as I know many women who have, um, you know, have, have Put that, hold that view very dearly and, and I have a great respect for because the issue of the child to me is, is also vitally important and I would like to see in society fewer abortions. I would like to see in society a greater respect for the child, the unborn child. Uh, I would like to see the provision of more choices for women who had to make that difficult choice uh, in relation to whether it be the issue of finance, whether it be the issue of housing, support. And I, I would like to see that. But in saying that again, I also hear um, what's been spoken of here today. I came to this place today without a position. I don't, other than I wanted to put on the record my views. Um, I, I came to this place not knowing which way to vote on this issue. Uh, I have been a party to, or, or at least uh, present in the, in the space of many passionate debates on this matter. And in, in that place, I've not contributed. I've felt it's not been my place to contribute. And I've listened to many very, um, passionate and articulate women who have spoken, both for and against this issue. So, so to me, it is something that I find very hard to make a decision on. But I, I felt that it was only fair to, to all those present to at least state my position on the life issue. And, and I hope that in saying that, that you see that that's my integrity, that's my honesty to you. Uh, as I said, I'm not really sure what to do in relation to the vote today. Uh, so, so I just wanted to leave that at that point and leave it with, with you today. Thank you. Members, we're dealing with the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, and the question is that the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting President. Uh, Mr. Acting President, I just want to make a few um, comments on this uh, particular bill, because as President, the President quite rightly pointed out, this is an extraordinarily um, 
a motive issue. But what I want to make perfectly clear, it is not, an, it's not a debate on abortion. We've had that debate. That debate has long gone. This is a debate on whether or not we have a 150 metre access zone to those health facilities that provide women the opportunity to terminate their pregnancy, which is their decision. It is their decision alone, or in concert with their partner or their, par or their friends and family. It's their decision. And can I say, uh, Mr Agging President, um, as we've moved on into the 21st century, um, something that's become more and more profound than ever is the power of the word, the power of the voice, the power of the labelling in absolutely every single aspect of our life. You know, as education minister, for former education minister for almost six years, I think one of the biggest issues that um, we as an education sector have had to confront, particularly over the last 20 years, is um, the more sophisticated methodology of bullying. In my days, um, in that rough and tumble of Kalgoorlie, bullying was a punch in the shoulder or a push and a shove, and it's not that at all. Bullies have become much more sophisticated. And the reason they've become much more sophisticated is because they're using the power of this, they're using the power of multimedia, they're using the power, they, they suffer in silence because of the power of the word. And people are made to feel diminished as a direct result of the words of those around them. And so many children suffer in silence and in such a complex environment, the, the world is such a battlefield, and those children suffer with self-esteem and resilience as a direct result of the words of others. That happens. That's happened everywhere. And in our now wonderful multicultural society, it's taken us over 50 years to come to a point, and we still suffer from it, where the words of one particular race condemn or diminish the views or attitudes of another race. And one of the great things about the, about the, um, the um, citizenship ceremonies that I attend, and we all do, is the fact that you have this plethora of different cultures that are coming together and brawn, drawn together, uh, great tapestry drawn together by that one comment, and that's Australia, and that's what we are now. We have become a much more of a rich, tolerant, multicultural society. And, and so those words, the words that have been used for decades and decades and decades to diminish a particular uh, race from another nation are gradually becoming a thing of the past. Another aspect of the power of the words has been with us particularly over the last 48 hours where we saw a footballer um, from Adelaide make a very racist comment against an Aboriginal man. Um, and I've got to say, I watched his apology last night and he was very, very contrite. I hope it was sincere and I hope it wasn't in response to the enormous public backlash that he suffered as a direct result of those comments. Now, um, as again, as a former Ab Aboriginal Affairs Minister for seven years, I loved that role. You know, I was bo born and bred in Kalgoorlie. I grew up with the one guy people. I have a deep personal affection for Aboriginal people. But Aboriginal people are the heart and soul of our nation. They're our First Nations people. And to be in a situation in the 21st century where we've still got people feeling they can demean an Aboriginal person because of his or her race, is, is extraordinary. And I remember vividly about when I was Aboriginal Affairs Minister, and I'm a proud patron of the West Perth Football Club, one of our players was suspended for a week as a direct result of the fact that he'd made a racist comment uh, to an Aboriginal person, one of the Aboriginal players. And I said to the coach, I'd like to speak with that player just to explain to him why that is such a powerful negative influence on the uh, for, uh, uh, on the, uh, the actual Aboriginal person. He didn't want to meet with me. <laughs> he didn't want to meet with me. I don't know whether he didn't want to uh, meet with me because he was fearful or perhaps, no, the coach said to him, no, he's going to take it. He's going to take the, the week off, take the penalty. Well, I said, I'm not going to get him off the penalty. Right? That wasn't the aim of me having a chat to him. I wanted to have a chat to him to explain to him why his comments were so inappropriate. And then I decided then, when he decided not to do that, I decided to go and I talked to all of the uh, presidents and CEOs of the various waffle clubs. And I said, we've got to do something here to change that culture within our, within our football, uh, football fraternity. 
So we introduced a cultural awareness program throughout the waffle. I don't think it's continued now, which is a little unfortunate. I really do hope the government does reintroduce it because it was really, really good. We didn't, we didn't just do it with the players. We did it right through from the hierarchy, right? from the presidents, the CEOs, all the administrators, etc., to try and develop that cultural awareness and cultural appreciation of Aborig Aboriginal people so that the players don't not make co racist comments because they think they're going to get a suspension, but because they know it is wrong, that the words that they espouse are wrong. They're so wrong. So we're doing that on all fronts in our society, and now we're looking, wondering what's the, what's the correlation. There's a very deep correlation here, because what we're dealing with here now is whether or not the words of another person are going to somehow demean or diminish or intimidate someone that is going to make one of the most extraordinarily challenging decisions of her life, and that is to, that is to terminate her pregnancy. Now, there's a raft of reasons as to why, as a woman, we'll have made that decision. But it must be hauntingly and hauntingly debilitating for a woman in so many instances, almost every instance, to make that decision that you, that I am going to go in and terminate the pregnancy. Now, I'm not going to ask why. I've had so many letters and emails with regard to this issue. And I'm not going to ask why a woman makes that decision to terminate her pregnancy. That is her decision. I'm not making a value judgment one way or another. But just imagine for one second, if you're making that decision, a decision that intimately impacts on your body and you're walking through and you've got those voices putting those seeds of doubt in your mind, when you're already feeling vulnerable, you're already feeling extraordinarily vulnerable, and then you've got someone that's going to come in and make you feel even worse. I don't want to be a party to that. I really don't. I can understand, I can understand why people who have a deep personal or spiritual conviction with regard to, um, with regard to abortion may feel the way they do. And I don't mind in their own place, in their own time, if they offer that counsel, they offer that advice. But when someone is making that very, very conscious decision to terminate her pregnancy. That is her decision. And she should not in any shape or form have added anguish uh, to make that uh, decision even more, uh, more difficult. She should not. So when she walks through those doors, she must have so much anguish going on in her mind. So much. And I like to think that we as a society are better than making it worse for her. So with that, in line with the rest of the nation, I think we've moved down that path. I, as I said, I'm not making a judgment one way or another on abortion, we've had that debate, but I am making a judgment on the power of the word. And words are extraordinarily powerful. And so for that reason and that reason alone, I think we've got to respect the decision of women when they go in and make the decision to terminate and so I will uh, be supporting the legislation. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Honourable Dan Cadding. Uh, thank you, Acting, uh, Acting President. Um, I'll only speak for a couple of minutes. I wasn't going to get to my feet, but listening to others, and especially listening to the Honourable Peter Collier, um, has led me to get to my feet. And uh, why? Because I want to start by saying that I agree with each and every word the Honourable Peter Collier said. And, uh, and admit that I could not have said it better. Every statement he made, uh, other than the support for the West Perth Football Club, and every example given is exactly why understanding this bill and what this bill will do and how it will, um, how it will improve safety for women is critical. So most importantly, I just want to get on the record that I support this bill. I would be happier to see the 150 metre zone extended even further, but I understand the restrictions within which this legislation has been drafted, or this bill's been drafted. Um, but secondly, I want to reiterate the most important point made by the Honourable Peter Collier. As a Senate staffer many years ago, I sat through hours of debate on the RU486 bill. Um, it, it was trying, those, those opposite, are, or those, opposite, those um, against the bill is probably a better way of putting it, um, tried to turn it into a de facto debate on abortion this was wrong of them. 
It was a disgusting tactic, and I certainly hope it will not be employed in this place. This bill is about the safety of women accessing our health system. That is a right they should have, and that is all this bill is about, and I commend the bill to the House. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Honourable Yuan Sigma. Thank you very much. Um, in, in keeping with um, this afternoon's contributions, my contribution uh, will also be a brief one. Um, but before I make it, I just want to acknowledge um, the fact, I, I think it's a heartening fact, that we can have uh, conversations or debates about uh, sensitive issues in a way which is well informed and respectful. And I actually think that that has been um, uh, the tone at which uh, the, the tone with which um, this matter has been discussed today, and I think it it probably reflects well on this chamber and to the public at large that we can conduct ourselves uh, with a measure of dignity. And as I think this chamber did during uh, the debate on the voluntary assisted dying bill in the last parliament. And I'll, I'll bring that up because I, I think that that was a, obviously a weighty moral issue. With respect to this bill, I'd make the observation that the moral judgment has already been made. This is not a debate about the rights and wrongs of abortion. That has been settled, and it has been settled in a way which I think meets with the satisfaction generally of the community uh, with which, uh, which we're honoured uh, to serve. Um, I am. You're reluctant to do this, I, I think, in a in a political sense these days. But but I'll, I'll I'll declare myself. I am a family man. I think my life has been more deeply enriched through marriage and through having children. And I think it is actually worthwhile uh, men being permitted. This sounds strange, but but please hear me out. I, I think to some degree debate on these issues has served to attempt to delegitimise the contributions of men. I think that is a mistake. I think that men have a responsibility. And I actually think we'll get a better social outcome the more responsibility that we put on men to actually act as men. I think it is absolutely clear that for a range of personal and medical reasons, no woman goes into a termination flippantly. There is an exacting and oftentimes excruciating judgment that that woman has made themselves to follow through with that procedure. Now, I will defend to my last breath two things. A person's right to agency and to make medical and health decisions for themselves. That is, for me, a red line that I will not cross. The second issue is in a democracy, the capacity to facilitate uh, differences of view, open discussion about, contribution, about issues which are difficult. There is, in my mind, nothing in this bill which impedes debate or silences those who have a moral objection to abortion or the termination of treatment. This is a practical bill which allows a woman to enact her legal her lawful rights to conduct her life. And to that degree, the bill is to be commended. Uh, I will support it. The question is that the bill be read a second time. I give the call to the Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I rise to speak on the public health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. I'll begin my contribution uh, to this de debate by underscoring an important principle, the principle that every Western Australian, every Western Australian, should be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded by other Western Australians. It is a sign of respect for one another. People should be able to carry on with their lives without being heckled and without being abused. However, Mr Acting President, it is equally worth remembering that just because something is lawful does not mean that it is ethical. Equally, just because something is lawful does not mean that it is beneficial. 
Indeed, we see this playing out in the corporate sector where there is an increasing societal expectation that businesses will not only comply with the law, but they will comply within an ethical framework. Our expectation that businesses be good corporate citizens means they, that we demand them to fulfil not only their legal duties, but also their ethical duties. And Mr Acting President, the current Royal Commission into Crown has heard from many experts arguing what Crown should have done and should do more of by way of prevention and problem gambling support for vulnerable groups, which include those suffering from mental illness and those from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. It is recognised that gambling is legal, and yet it is unethical to take advantage of people in difficult circumstances. Mr Acting President, while abortion is legal in Western Australia, as lawmakers, we retain a duty to ensure the framework in which a decision is being made about an unexpected pregnancy is free from duress and free from undue influence. Informed consent is not a principle that should ever be jettisoned. Equally, policymakers retain a duty to ensure adequate support exists regardless of what choice is being made about a pregnancy. Now, when many years ago I first heard about activism occurring outside abortion clinics, to be completely honest and frank with members, I was not enthused about the idea. I felt that there was a time and a place for people to express their views, and I questioned whether standing outside an abortion clinic was the right time and place. I confess, Mr Acting President, I had done no research. I had done nothing to investigate this issue, and I now accept that it was a view I held in ignorance. I had never really understood why people would stand outside abortion clinics until I went down to the Marie Stopes Clinic in Midland to see firsthand what was happening for myself. Now, since then, I have come to understand what actually takes place outside of Western Australian clinics. Now, it's important not to conflate what happens over here with what has been reported to have occurred in other jurisdictions, including in the Eastern States. Now, Mr Acting President, before I explain what I saw, I want to firstly draw attention to an article from the Baltic Times called Baby Statues Tell a Sad Story. That reports on an art installation between August and October 2012 that was placed in the town square of Riga, the capital of Latvia. This display featured life-size concrete sculptures, sculptures of 27 babies who all looked like they were sleeping peacefully. Some were on their side, thumbs in their mouth, some had their legs tucked up underneath them. Now, next to each of these babies was a plaque, each telling a different story written in English, Russian and Latvian. The stories next to each sculpture differ, and some are hard to read, but they tell stories like, my mum really wanted to keep me, but her boyfriend was violent, and she was scared of what would happen to her if she did. Or, my mum really wanted to keep me, but her mother told her she'd be ruining her life and threatened to kick her out of home. Or, my mum really wanted me, but she'd been taking drugs when I was conceived and was worried it would affect me. Or, my mum really wanted me, but she was an international student and felt she didn't, she, and she felt she'd be bringing shame on her family if she did. Mr Acting President, these stories stand out for a number of reasons. They provide an insight into the incredibly difficult situations and decisions 
that some have to make. Indeed, I've spoken to many women who have said they felt that they had no other choice. Another reason this particular news story stood out to me at the time was because of the number 27. The number 27, you see, Mr Acting President, that was the number of babies at that time being aborted in Latvia every day. Now, to put that in a Western Australian context, in 2020, the last calendar year, we know from answers provided in this chamber to parliamentary questions that there were 7,947 babies aborted in Western Australia. That equates to 21 a day, almost one every hour of every day of the year. Now, the stories told on those plaques are precisely why people stand outside abortion clinics. Now, national data tells us that on average, one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence. Now, if we use those numbers, it is likely that for every two women who arrive at an abortion clinic, who have made up their minds and who may well feel confident in their decision, there is another woman who is being coerced or by virtue of her circumstances can see no other way out. Now, as I said earlier, Mr Acting President, a few years ago, I went down to the Maurice Stopes Clinic in Midland myself to see firsthand what was happening there. I need to emphasise, no one knew that I was there that day. And until I report about it now, no one would have known that I'd been there. What I observed on that day was a group of people peacefully standing not far from the clinic, neither heckling nor harassing. They were self-evidently not there with malicious intent. They were there in case any woman sought assistance and support at a potentially conflicting time in their life. I saw people offering help with a demeanour of respect, empathy and humanity. Now, since that time, I have spoken to some who volunteer and without exception, they are motivated by compassion. Some, some have experienced abortions themselves and their, their lived experience has prompted them to support those in doubt, not wanting them to experience the psychological trauma they experience. The life of both the mother and her baby are precious and irrespective of condition, convictions. If abortion is truly to be about choice, then as a matter of fairness, people should be offered authentic choice. The A word, as I've referred to it previously in this chamber over the years, Mr Acting President, causes such deep political polarisation. But I do not believe this should shut down discussion on how to genuinely offer assistance. We now know much more about family and domestic violence. We now know about the insidious nature of coercion and in this instance, we're talking about the life of a human being. Now, as we continue this debate this afternoon, Mr Acting President, I ask members to acknowledge that if, if we had capital punishment in Western Australia, if people were sitting on death row waiting for state-sanctioned murder, cloaked as justice, there would be, there would be a significant outcry. And I imagine we would all agree that there would be protesters outside the prison calling for the abolition of the death penalty. Now, for my part, for my part, and I emphasise this, I am on the public record as having grave concerns about capital punishment because of its finality, the risk of mistake and the impossibility of recourse. Situations that result in irreversible and permanent measures like the taking of a life need to be considered extremely carefully. An individual's right to life has been described as the most fundamental of human rights. Now, whether the members agree or disagree, I ask them to acknowledge that we do have Western Australian people standing outside abortion clinics who feel just as strongly 
about human life as those protesting capital punishment. Now, meanwhile, I'm also on the record for noting that the review structures around abortion lack independent oversight. Now, while, I, while governments like to control the public discourse, and although abortion is widely recognised as a sensitive matter, it doesn't justify the ongoing lack of accountable and transparent oversight. Indeed, the storm raging in both domestic and international media discourses around abortion obfuscate an already complex conversation, and this has varied consequences for both mothers and babies. At the end of the day, Mr Acting President, the onus lies with the government to provide evidence for any reform it seeks. It is what I have previously described in this place as the onus to persuade. So I ask members for a moment to consider the evidence. And I'll start with page 21 of the report, Safe Access Zones, a proposal for reform in Western Australia, which my colleague, the Honourable Martin Aldridge, touched on earlier. That particular uh, discussion paper, Mr Acting President, says this from the government. WA Police gave Department of Health details of 75 police attendance tasks and 14 offences recorded at Marie Stopes WA Clinics and Nanyara Medical Group between 2014 and 2019. It was noted, it was noted that some of these tasks may not be related to demonstrator behaviour. Well, what does that mean? Let us interpret for a moment what the government is saying to us there. Now, take members to uh, uh, a, if you like, a witness statement uh, that I've obtained via the uh, Right to Life Association of Western Australia. It's no secret document because it's contained in one of their newsletters uh, from um, uh, last year. And it says this, reporting on, on the vigil that they had uh, attended. At one point, a person associated with the clinic parked his four-wheel drive near us, straddling the footpath and the street verge, with the exhaust pipe aimed in our direction. It was loud and smelly, and the police were very reluctant to attend. In the end, he drove away after about half an hour. Sadly, we later received an email from the police saying how disappointed they were in how we were behaving, including how we had parked our four-wheel drive on the footpath. In the end, I did reply to that email, as I'm sure it will end up being reported in Parliament, along with the hundreds of baseless complaints made by the clinic. This statement goes on to say, on that same day, I noticed piles of sugar had been spread around the street verge. The intention was to attract ants to make us uncomfortable. They go on to say, we talked to many women and others, and I know of two women who had a change of heart and decided to keep their child as a result of our presence. I'll just repeat that, Mr Acting President. We talked to many women and others, and I know of two women who had a change of heart and decided to keep their child as a result of our presence. Now, I go back to the evidence, uh, Mr Acting President, and I note that the, uh, my uh, former colleague uh, and the former Shadow Attorney General, the Honourable Michael Mission, on the 11th of June last year, asked a question to the then Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Health. In part, he asked, can the Minister advise whether and what charges have been laid or other action taken by police in respect of such incidents and the outcome of that action? The response was, I'm advised that this question should be directed to the Minister for Police. The other part of his question was, can the Minister advise why such assemblies cannot be adequately controlled by suitable conditions attached to police permits issued under the Public Order in Streets Act 19 1984? And the response was, this option will be considered in the final report. That was on the 11th of June 2019. Now, a week later, Mr Acting President, I attended the Standing Committee on Estimates and Financial Operations, and uh, the minister in charge at the time was indeed the minister who's currently got the conduct of uh, this bill, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, so he may uh, recall this exchange. And uh, at the time, uh, the chair of the uh, 
Estimates Committee uh, was the current president, and I said, Madam Chair, my next question to the minister is, what is the cost of administering permits issued under the Public Order in Streets Act 1984 for protester and demonstrator activities? And the Honourable Stephen Dawson, after some further discussion between us, said, we will have to take that on notice. And it was taken on notice as C as C8. I then said, how many charges have been laid in breach of such permits by sidewalk advocates offering alternative help in areas outside of abortion clinics? And the Honourable Minister ref uh, referred the, min uh, the question to uh, one of his advisers who responded. Mr Blanche said, yes, we can endeavour to find that information through our systems. And the Chair said, yes, that is now going to be question, question taken on notice C8. I then said, as part of that, which will need to be taken on notice, I would be interested to know what charges have been laid or other action taken by police in respect of such incidents and the outcome of that action. And the Honourable Stephen Dawson said, same answer, and the Chair said, and it is the same supplementary information number, C8. So, Mr Acting President, I take members through this to demonstrate that in June 2019, the Honourable Michael Mission asked a question and didn't get a response rack from the government. A week later, I went into the Estimates Committee to find out the same information, and I was told on three occasions that that information would be taken on notice. Now, the answer that came back in terms of the uh, answer on notice was as follows. The Western Australian Police Force advised there is no fee charged to persons or organisations seeking a permit to hold a public meeting and or conduct a procession under Section 7 of the Public Order in Streets Act 1984. State traffic estimate the cost for administration is $72 to process and issue a permit. In the 2018-19 financial year, to date, 150 permits have been issued, totalling $10,800. So no response, Mr Acting President, to the question as to how many people have been charged with respect to these protests that we are told are out of control and need this remedy. So the following year, Mr Acting President, I pursued this matter again in the, in the Estimates Committee and uh, asked uh, some questions uh, prior to the hearing, uh, having not received a response, despite the fact that I was told on three occasions it would be taken on notice the previous year. And I asked what was the cost of administering permits for protester and demonstrator activities in the 2019-20 and what is the budgeted cost for 2021? And I asked how many charges have been laid in breach, by per in breach of permits by persons in areas outside of abortion clinics? And this time I got an answer. The answer was this. This is for the 2020-21 budget estimates, the most recent ones. WA Police advised by the Minister to the committee this. There have been no charges, no charges laid for offences against Section 9 of the Public Order in Streets Act 19, 1984. That's the evidence on the public record, Mr Acting President, with respect to what's happening outside of abortion clinics. And I reiterate the point that it remains for the government to persuade members as to what is actually happening outside of the abortion clinics. And despite the fact that I've pursued this matter for a number of years, the latest evidence in the committee is that no charges have been laid. <clears throat> that seems to be consistent, Mr Acting President, with what I witnessed on that day when I went to visit. Now, I want to re-emphasise what I said earlier, that I firmly hold the view that people should be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded. But equally, just because something's legal does not always mean it is ethical or beneficial. And as a society, we have a better understanding of family and domestic violence and the nature of coercion and control. Now, it's in this context, Mr Acting President, that I think it's worth us noting that 500, 500 submissions were received in response to the Department of Health's discussion paper, and they outlined how some women are forced, manipulated and coerced into the decision to have an abortion, and approximately 250 submissions suggested better holistic counselling and support for patients to be made available. So in light of this evidence, why would we prohibit volunteers from standing outside an abortion clinic without intimidation, without judgement, saying, 
I'm here to help if you want me. Now, if this bill prohibits intelligent, decent people from being able to stand there and say, it is your choice, but I am able to provide you support and I'll journey this with you if you want, then we can stop the pretense that this is a pro-choice bill. It's plainly neither pro-choice nor, nor, nor pro-life. I cannot support a system that leaves someone with an unexpected pregnancy at the mercy of grey areas, coercion and misinformation, and at the same time allow others who care to be subject to excessive penalties for merely offering and providing compassionate support. In my view, Mr Acting President, we should be encouraging, encouraging a culture open to help and open to life, not suppressing it. The existing legal regulatory regime provides the right balance. And I think it's wrong for the government to uh, push these laws through our parliament that only serve the narrow interests of service providers in, under their charade of choice. Now, this is my fourth term, Mr Acting President, in this parliament, and I cast my mind back to, the second, to my second term. And I recall sitting in this chamber, listening to a debate about the philosophical underpinnings of why people are passionate about protesting. And as I've already said, Mr Acting President, what I've observed isn't protesting at all. It's people offering help and support to those who want it. But if it is about protesting, I'm not going to disclose the name of the members, but suffice it to say there were members who are now in government who lamented the Criminal Code Amendment Prevention of Lawful Activity Bill of 2015, and in particular the reversal of the onus of proof. Indeed, one Labor member said this, Reversing the normal burden of proof and require the defendant in the criminal case to prove his innocence is generally disapproved of and not supported by lawmakers in democratic societies. This practice has been condemned in a range of re reports by a number of investigating bodies. That includes the Senate Standing Committee on Constitutional and Legal Affairs in the 1982 report. The Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills of the Commonwealth Parliament has made clear in a number of reports its view that the reversal of the onus of proof should be limited in its application. The review of the Commonwealth Criminal Law 1991 Part 2 also made very clear its opposition to the reversal of the onus of proof, except in very limited circumstances. The West Australian Standing Committee on Legislation, on which I have been a member for a short period of time, has also acknowledged that it is opposed to provisions that reverse the onus of proof. The Commonwealth publication, A Guide to Framing Commonwealth Offences, Infringement Notices and Enforcement Powers, states very clearly placing a legal burden of proof on a defendant should be kept to a minimum. In other words, it should be avoided." End quote. Now look what we have here, Mr Acting President. There's a bill being brought in that reverses the burden of proof. For those members who were there at that time, that hypocrisy is absolutely mind-boggling. Now, a different Labor member during that debate quoted from a book entitled Speech Matters, Giving Free Speech Right. She said this, the right to protest and demonstrate, also known as the right to peace, peaceful assembly, is widely considered fundamental to democratic practice. Protesting is, in many ways, the epitome of collective, popular political speech in a democracy, and it is precisely the kind of political speech that ought to be protected. This is because peaceful protest is speech that directly reflects the two interrelated reasons for protecting freedom of speech. Protest is a kind of speech that is essential to democratic legitimacy because it enables everyday citizens to critique openly and debate essential questions of governance and therefore to practice democracy itself." End quote. Mr Acting President, past debates have taught me that no one will dispassionately explain how this is any different. Now, I also note that only 10 submissions, only 10 submissions of the 4,184 submissions received by the Department of Health said that the current legislative regime is inadequate and does not protect 
the wellbeing and privacy of individuals from the behaviour of demonstrators. That's 0.2 per cent of respondents. Now, I'm concluding, Mr uh, Acting President, if time permits me, before we interrupt for the taking of questions without notice. And I want to do so by um, reading from uh, an article written by Edwina Carr uh, Barraclaw. Uh, it's entitled, I was forced into an abortion by an NRL player and I regret it. It says this from uh, August, 28th of August, uh, 2019. I quote, he wore me down and it felt like I had no choice, she said. I felt so disempowered that there was no other option for me left but to have this abortion he wanted. I was made to feel as though I was a drama queen because I cared deeply about the baby that I felt connected to it. The article goes on to say, her pregnancy was viewed by the majority of people around her as a problem. Not once did anyone discuss a narrative where it was acceptable for her to have the baby. It goes on to say, a recent report published in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health found around one in six Australian women have had an abortion by their mid-30s, with other estimates predicting that number could be closer to one in four. A telling reminder that all women seeking a termination should have their emotional as well as physical health supported. It's something Ms Tarkey believes is crucial. I'm definitely not anti-abortion. I'm just here wanting women to truly know what their choices are and make an informed choice, she said. Some women want to keep their baby, but they don't know what to do. And that's the thing I want to reassure them on. There are ways to get support. Heartened by the many women who have contacted her to share their own similar story, Ms Tarkey is now a vocal advocate raising awareness around abortion coercion through speaking at events. And as I conclude, um, President, I'll read from this uh, testimony uh, from Western Australia. And it reads as follows. It's brief. And I now want to share with you just a bit about an early experience of mine. In 1994, when I was 20 years old, I lost my daughter, Angel Lee, at 22 weeks gestation due to immense stress caused by domestic violence and alcoholism on the part of the father. I gave birth to Angel, who died moments later and couldn't be resuscitated. Even when I was in labour, I thought I was going to give birth to something that was half blob, half human, yet she was fully developed, had the features of both her parents and was just the length of my forearm. After spending this time with her, I understood then the full humanity of an unborn child in the womb. I also understand what it's like to go home with an empty womb. Fast forward many years later and I'm standing in front of an abortion clinic involved in prayer vigils and I meet a pregnant mum going into the clinic for an abortion. We had so much in common. It was incredible and I felt like I was speaking to a younger version of myself. I talked with her and explained the ways in which we could give her free help and support. She began to cry and then laughed and gave me a huge hug. I asked, do you want to get out of here? To which she replied, yep, let's do it. So I drove her home. We exchanged contact details and she stood she took up the free help offered to her from a local pregnancy resource centre throughout her pregnancy and beyond. I was given the privilege of going to the hospital and holding her baby. I'm not sure if I can adequately describe this feeling. I know how close this child was to death and now to be holding and kissing this baby. It was like waiting for my own child to be born. This child will be treasured and loved forever. May I ask you, and I conclude here, members, who is going to offer sanctuary for these mothers and their babies if we don't. That's why, President, that people stand at the front of abortion clinics. Um, members, we, I will take this opportunity to interrupt debate for question time. Are there any questions? President. President. 
Thank you. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice of which some has been given is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer, 474. Uh, I refer to the media release of August 8, 2021, outlining the government's announcement of $1.9 billion to be added to the health budget in the upcoming state budget. And I ask one, how many of the new 332 new beds to be opened in WA will be housed in existing buildings and how many will be in as yet unbuilt wards? Two, how many of the new 332 beds will come from currently existing but unstaffed beds or wards? Three, how many of the 100 new doctors and 500 new nurses positions will be permanent full-time positions? Four, what is the annual budget impact of the additional wages of those additional staff and the new beds? Five, will this additional wage cost continue past the next election when the government's on or revenue is expected to correct to the normal long run levels? And six, if yes to five, what savings will the government make to cover the additional annual costs? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the leaders of, Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. Uh, one to six, the honourable member should put this question on, on notice to the Minister for Health. Huh. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice with, of which some has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. Uh, I refer to the Auditor General's Information System Audit Report 21. State government entities released last month, which reported 553 general computer control issues attributed to the 59 audited entities, which followed the 522 IT issues identified last year. And I ask, a, of the 42 per cent of this year's findings that have been previously reported by the Auditor General and not acted on, how many have been addressed since this report's release? B, with only 50 per cent of the audited entities, audited entities meeting the benchmark for information security, a drop of 7 per cent from last year, what processes have been put in place to protect the confidentiality and integrity of information stored in those systems? C, how many cyber attacks were reported in 2017 to 18, 19, 20 and 21? And D, how many of the attacks listed in C resulted in information being accessed by unauthorised parties? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. I do just note myself um, this question relates to a report on uh, entities across uh, the state government. Um, AD, A to D, as this question relates to multiple government agencies, it is not possible in the time permitted to provide a complete and accurate answer. I would recommend the member put this question on notice to the relevant ministers, minister for their response. The Honourable Colin de Grasser. Thanks, uh, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Government Regional Officer Housing, Grow, and I ask one, what was the total number of Grow stock as of June 2021? Two, what is the total wait list for Grow across all departments as of June 2021? Three, for two, please break down into wait lists for each government department. Four, in the absence of available Grow stock in a particular location, A, what is the course of action to ensure that uh, grow, uh, government regional officers have access to a house? B, what was the total cost to the government for providing alternative accommodation options? And five, if the Department of Communities does not collect this data or cannot provide a response to any of the above, why not? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, as of the 30th of June 2021, there were a total of 5,040 grow properties. <clears throat> two, as at 30th of June 2021, there were 217 additional requests for grow housing from client <laughs> agencies. Three, the information is um, in tabular form and I seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thanks, uh, President. 4A, requests for housing under the GROW program are met by allocation of vacant existing GROW stock, sourcing leases from the private market, expressions of interest from investors or local government, and constructing and spot purchasing properties from the GROW capital works budget. <coughs> Uh, B, the GROW program is responsible for providing housing. Individual client agencies make arrangements for any alternative accommodation required for their employees. Five not applicable. The Honourable Jon Sibmer. Uh, thank you, President. My question without um, notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. And I refer to an ABC online article of 24 June by Hannah Barry uh, called Dampier Peninsula Buccaneer Archipelago Marine Park Plan Attracts 17,000 Submissions. And I ask one, how many submissions on the draft Marine Park Plan were received from individuals or groups domiciled outside of Australia? Two, will those submissions be set aside or will they be considered in the formulation of the final draft Marine Park Plan before it receives ministerial approval? Three, how many submissions on the draft Marine Park Plan were received from Australian-based individuals or groups domiciled outside of Western Australia? And four, will those submissions be set aside or will they be considered in the formulation of the final draft plan before it receives ministerial approval? 
Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notes to the question. One, 871 submissions on the indicative joint management park. Uh, sorry, joint marine park management plans were received from individuals or groups domiciled out of Australia. Two, all submissions are considered. The location or origin of responses is taken into account to ensure that local issues are addressed in the finalisation of the management plan. Three, 12,520 submissions on the indicative joint marine park management plans were received from Australian-based individuals or groups domiciled outside of Western Australia. And four, the answer to two. The Hon. Nick Guerin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the article in the West Australian on 3 August 2021, Sex Assault Claims Rock High School, and I ask, one, is the alleged offender still attending the same high school as the female students he is alleged to have assaulted? Two, on what date did the minister meet with the school in question following this incident? Three, on what date did the minister meet with any of the families of the students involved in this incident? Four, what support is being offered to the students who have been assaulted? And five, what measures has the school put in place to protect other students from these type of assaults? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, no. Two, the Deputy Director General of Schools met with the school on 4 August 2021. It would not be appropriate under the communications agreement for the minister to meet directly with the school on an ongoing operational matter. Three, a meeting has been arranged with parents of two of the female students. Four, support plans have been created for the female students that encompass uh, protective security measures, support from the school psychology service and strategies for teachers and other staff to provide additional support to the students and their parents. Five, in addition to physical separation and increased supervision, the school has prioritised the delivery of protective behaviours curriculum so that every student knows what is acceptable, what to do to be safe and who they can go to for support. The Hon. Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, President. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the Supporting Communities Forum and I ask one. Will the minister list a the current membership of the forum and b the number of meetings, including the date of each meeting that the forum has held since 1 January 2020? The parliamentary secretary to the minister for community services. Thank you, President. I thank the member for some notice of the question, and provide the following answer on behalf of the minister for community services. One a as of the 31st of May 2021, community sector and government co-chairpersons. Michelle Scott, Director, McCusker Centre for Citizenship. Jody Kant, Acting Director General, Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage. Deputy Chairperson, Kate George, Consultant. Community Sector Members, Louise Giolito, CEO of Wacos. Dan Minchin, CEO of Chorus. Tricia Murray, CEO of Wansley. Maria Osman, Ministerial Multicultural Advisory Council Member. Julie Whalen, State Manager, National Disability Services, WA. Ross Wortham, CEO of Youth Affairs Council. Deborah Zanella, CEO of RUA. Felicit Black, CEO of Women's Health and Family Services. Kate Cheney, Director, Innovation and Strategy, Anglicare. Justine Collier, CEO of RISE Network. Emma Jarvis, CEO of Palmerston. Melissa Perry, CEO of Communicare. Denver de Cruz, General Manager, Inclusion Solutions. And Kelda Opperman, CEO of Zonta House Refuge Association. Government sector members, Mike Rowe, Director General, Department of Communities, Lisa Rogers, Director General, Department of Education, David Russell Wees, Director General, Department of Health, Adam, Adam Thompson, Director General, Department of Justice, Lane Chopping, Acting Director General, Department of Local Government, Sport and Cultural Industries, Emily Roper, Acting Director General, Department of the Premier and Cabinet, Susan Hunt, CEO, Lottery West, Jennifer McGrath, Commissioner, Mental Health Commission, Sharon O'Neill, Commissioner, Public Sector Commission, B. There have been 10 meetings, 24th of the 2nd, 2020, 17th of the 6th, 2020, 24th of the 8th, 2020, 5th of the 10th, 2020, 12th of the 10th, 2020, 13th of the 10th, 2020, 19th of the 10th, 2020, 23rd of the 11th, 2020, 28th of the 1st, 2021, and 24th of the 5th, 2021. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question is that another quick summary to minister, the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer the Minister to his response to question 383 asked on Tuesday, the 3rd of August 2021, and to the announcement on Sunday, the 8th of August, we get $4 billion to reboot Western Australia's health system. And I ask one, will the Minister commit to funding the ongoing services of the Soldiers and Sirens program, which provides essential services and support for WA Police, other first providers and veterans, and if not, why not? 
Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President, and I thank the member for some notes to the question. On remember, I saw an error in this question about 15 minutes ago, so I haven't got an updated answer for you. If it comes in at the end of question time, we'll provide it, if not tomorrow. The Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. <clears throat> My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Climate Action, C491. I refer to the 2019 WA Labor platform stating that in government, WA Labor will develop a measurable practical pathway to carbon pollution reduction designed to get to zero emissions by 2050. And I ask, given, the, given this measurable practical pathway is not contained in the WA climate policy, will the Minister please table it? If the pathway has not yet been developed, will the Minister please provide an update on the progress of this commitment? And three, is this pathway consistent with the findings and recommendations of the recently released IPCC report? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answers provided on behalf of the Minister for Climate Action. Questions one to three. The Western Australian Climate Change Policy outlines several measures which will develop pathways to net zero emissions. These include, but are not limited to, whole of system planning for the southwest interconnected system. Uh, will include scenarios for renewable energy and storage penetration consistent with national and state emissions reduction goals. State government agencies, including GTEs, will develop and implement plans to transition toward net zero emissions by 2050. And sectoral emissions reduction strategies will evaluate opportunities for cost effective abatement across Western Australia's key economic sectors and develop strategies to guide emissions reduction. Each of the above streams of work are currently in progress, and further updates will be provided in due course. The Hon. Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question without notice, in which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Can the Minister provide the COVID-19 vaccination rates of Indigenous West Australians broken down by age group and geographical region? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, the COVID-19 vaccination rates for Indigenous Western Australians information comes from the Australian Immunisation Registration (AIR), which is Commonwealth data. WA Health is not authorised to provide this data. The honourable Sophia Mormont. Thank you, President. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the parliamentary secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer the Minister to the harm minimisation strategies, priority substances and priority populations outlined in the Australian Government's National Drug Strategy 2017 to 2026, and I ask how many people are currently incarcerated for cannabis crimes in Western Australia, and two, how many of Western Australians currently incarcerated for cannabis-related crimes are associated with quantities pertaining to personal use compared to trafficable offences. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney-General. The member's question cannot be answered in the time provided, and I request that the member place their question on notice. <clears throat> the Honourable Martin Aldrich. Thanks, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to Legislative Council questions without notice 411 and 431 in relation to the State Controlled Border and G2G Pass applications and ask one, what guidance, material or policy has been established to guide decision makers in assessing G2G Pass applications, particularly those given discretionary approval by the State Emergency Coordinator or, or a person authorised by him? Two, please table any documentation identified in one. Three, how many G2G pass application decisions have been subject to internal review? And of those, how many were upheld and how many were amended? And four, have any G2G pass application decisions been subject to external review by the Ombudsman, a court, tribunal or similar body? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of, the, of this question. Uh, the following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. Western Australian Police advise one, all new directions issued by the State Emergency Coordinator are disseminated to staff once published. Operational guidance documents are developed to ensure consistency of decision making. A 24-7 COVID inspector is on duty to provide advice and guidance as required. Two, advice is being sought as to whether these operational documents can be tabled. Three, while matters are routinely reviewed by senior officers, the WA Police Force does not maintain the requested st statistics. And four, no. The Honourable James Hayward. 
Uh, thank you. My question, without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to the electoral uh, reform process embarked upon by the State Government, which was not on the agenda immediately prior to the last election, and I ask, one, have the costs of the Ministerial Expert Committee been finalised? Uh, two, if yes to one, please detail uh, the, the total cost to date, the cost of advertising, the cost of re remuneration of committee members, the cost of printing and comp comp and uh, putting it all together, uh, and uh, any other costs. Three, are there any other outstanding costs for the committee um, that have not been finalised? If yes, how much is still outstanding to date? Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on the the following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the remuneration of committee members on the Ministerial Expert Committee on Electoral Reform is provided by the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Associated resourcing costs will be included on the biannual report on consultants engaged by government, which will be tabled in the parliament in accordance with Premier Circulation Circular 2019-06. Executive support for the Ministerial Expert Committee was provided through the existing resources of the Office of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the shortage of suitable housing for homeless people in regional Western Australia, and I ask one, what new facilities have been contracted to provide accommodation for those experiencing homelessness in regional West Australia in the last 12 months? Two, for each facility in one, A, when did they start accommodating people experiencing homelessness? B, how many people experiencing homelessness will be accommodated? And C, what is the length of the contract? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Community Services. One to two, the Department of Communities have contracted with the Housing First Homelessness Support Services in the last 12 months, including the following Housing First Homelessness Support Services contracted in regional Western Australia. The Roman Catholic Bishop of Geraldton Centre Care Family Services contracted to provide the Housing First Homelessness Support Services, Geraldton, for the period 1 April 2021 to the 31st of March 2026. Anglicare WA Inc. contracted to provide the Housing First Homelessness Support Service, Bunbury, for the period 1 February 2021 to 31 January 2026. The Department of Communities has recontracted the Aboriginal Short Stay Accommodation Services in the last 12 months, including the following in regional Western Australia. Australian Red Cross recontracted to provide the Kalgoorlie Aboriginal Short Stay Service until 30 June 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 11 rooms. Mercy Community Services Limited recontracted to provide the Derby Aboriginal Short Stay Service until 30 June 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 30 rooms. Mercy Community Services Limited recontracted to provide the Broome Aboriginal Short Stay Service until June 30, uh, 2024. The service provides accommodation for singles, couples and families in 44 rooms. A full list of contracted homeless, homeless services in regional WA Western Australia is here and I um, seek leave to incorporate the table into hands up. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Uh, the Hon. the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. A question without notice, which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Water. I refer to question without notice 251, asked on the 15th of June 2021, on the Lennox Weir and the Carbonate River in the city of Busselton, particularly parts 2C and D, in which the answer told the House that surface water will be available to adjacent landowners, but likely at reduced levels. The Water Corporation is working with adjacent landowners to explore other opportunities and ask one, has the Water Corporation discussions, had discussions with the adjacent landowners? Two, if yes to one, when? Three, if no to one, when will those discussions occur? Four, what option, options for access to water has the Water Corporation discussed with adjacent landowners and what amount of water has been identified as available? And five, what is the salt level of the water the Water Corporation expects to provide to or give access to the adjacent landowners? The Minister for Regional Development. Well, I thank the member for the question, and the Minister for Water has provided the following information. One, yes. Two, a meeting was held on Wednesday, 26 May 2021. Three, not applicable. Four, the surface water that collects upstream of the weir, which is accessible to landowners, will still be available. 
The volume of water and the level of salinity is dependent on climatic conditions, rainfall and tidal movements and will vary throughout the year. Water Corporation will continue to work with the adjacent landowners to determine their water use requirements for agricultural purposes and to work towards a mutually agreeable outcome. Five, removing the weir stop boards and steel frames may see a short-term temporary increase of saline water in, in the upstream during storm surge events. However, this is an entirely natural process experienced in other river systems throughout the region. It should be noted that the current structure is not impervious and currently allows some saline intrusion. President. The Honourable Colin de Grasse. Uh, thanks, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to Government Regional Thanks. Officer Housing Grow, and I ask one, are there minimum security requirements for Grow properties? Two, if yes to one, please table the minimum security requirements. If no to one, why are there no security requirements? Three, how many houses did not meet the minimum security requirements at the last order of Grow Housing? And four, as of 30 June 2021, how many Grow properties are fitted with A, security screens on all doors, B, front door with deadlock, C, security screens on all windows? Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One to three, yes, grow dwellings comply with the minimum security provisions set out in Regulation 12B of the Residential Tenancy Regulations 1989. Grow properties that are leased from private landlords are audited prior to occupation to ensure minimum security standards are security provisions are met. If a grow leased property does not meet the minimum security provisions, the decision to accept the leased property sits with the client agency or an alternative property is sought. Cl individual client agencies may also provide additional security provisions to their employees. For this information is not collected in a centralised database and it would require individual analysis of each grow property. This would take significant time and effort and would be unreasonable to divert resources away from core business. The Honourable Yon Sidma. Thank you, President. My question without notice, which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, it's question 483. Uh, I refer to Western Australia's conservation estate and I ask one, what is the current size of the conservation estate by category A, national parks, B, conservation parks, C, nature reserves, D, marine parks, E, marine nature reserves, F, marine management areas and G, reserves managed under sections 51G and 51H of the Carm Act 1984 and two, for FY 2019-20 and FY 2020-2021, what levels of capital and recurrent funding were provided to DBCA to manage each of the categories A through G inclusive? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one, the area at 30 June 2021 for each category is A, national parks, 6,449,679 hectares. B, conservation parks, 1,154,192 hectares. C, nature reserves, 10,088,170 hectares. D, marine parks, 4,424,469 hectares. Uh, e, marine nature reserves, 132,000 hectares. F, marine management areas, 143,385 hectares. G, reserves managed under sections 51G and 51H of the CAM Act 1984, 1,081,536 hectares. Two, I have, I've been advised by the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions that to answer this question requires significant time and resources, and I ask that the honourable member place this question on notice. Uh, the honourable Nick Guiran. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the parliamentary secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to the Attorney General's media statement on 8 July 2021, which announced that the state solicitor's office will now be an in independent sub-department of the Department of Justice. And I ask one: Are you aware it has been? more than three years since the rec this recommendation was made in the Langelant report. Two, what has been the cost to the state in implementing this recommendation? Three, will you table the business case relating to this matter? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney-General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney-General. One to three, the establishment of the State Solicitor's Office as an independent sub-department of the Department of Justice was the subject of a Cabinet decision. It will have a minimal impact on the State's finances. The, the Honourable State. Brad Pettit. Thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Climate Action, C492. I refer to the Minister's forward in the Debray Climate Policy, which states, 
Western Australia's greenhouse gas emissions are rising and are expected to grow in the short to medium term under business as usual, and I ask, what are, West Australians, what are Western Australia's expected greenhouse gas emissions for 2025, and what data is this based on? Two, will the Minister please table the modelling or data containing this information? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Climate Action. One to two, Australia's national emissions projections are compiled by the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources to provide sector-specific analysis of factors driving emissions at a national level. The Commonwealth does not publish state and territory emissions projections. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thanks, President. My question without notice, or some notice, has been given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. I refer to the four jurisdictions identified as medium risk under Western Australia's controlled border arrangements, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia and Victoria, and ask one, are the conditions of entry for people seeking to enter WA using a G2G pass consistent across these four jurisdictions, or does each jurisdiction have individual conditions? Two, for any jurisdictions with individual conditions, please provide detail. Three, has the Chief Health Officer provided advice to WA Police to enable them to process G2G pass applications for travellers from medium risk jurisdictions? If yes, to three, please table this health advice. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. One to four. The Western Australia Police advise no. The approved traveller categories are consistent across medium risk jurisdictions. And as a result of advice provided by the Chief Health Officer in relation to the worsening situation in New South Wales, the Western Australia Police Force adopted a stricter approach in accordance with the directions. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you very much. My question without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the Bunbury Outer Ring Road and I ask, in relation to the southern section of the ball, has the Government considered alternative routes other than the current route through Jalorup? Uh, if, you, two, if yes, how many alternatives have been identified? Three, for each alternative route identified, what was the main reason for not pursuing that option? Four, what impact would the current uh, preferred route for the southern section of the bore have on the basalt resource near Anvil Road? Specifically, could quarry oper operations continue if the uh, current plans were realised? The Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to three, a number of alternative routes were considered during the planning process, with the comprehensive reasons for selecting the original route detailed in the southern section alignment selection report. Four, the basalt resource and its operation is being managed through the project planning and development. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question without notice of which some notice is given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Communities at C446, and it was uh, submitted on the 4th of August. I refer to the $6 million local government partnership fund for homelessness announcement recently, and I ask how many homeless beds is the program expected to deliver for each year over the next five years? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Community Services. Thank you, President. I thank the member for some notice of the question and provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Communities. The Department of Communities is supporting local government initiatives through Local Government Part Partnership Fund for Homelessness to respond to and prevent homelessness. The fund does not prescribe a specific number of beds. It gives local governments the opportunity to design and to deliver responses tailored to, tailored to respond to needs of the local community. The Honourable uh, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. Thank you, President. <clears throat> Question without notice of which some has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Ports, uh, 456. Uh, I refer to the Fremantle Port Authority's application under Part 5 of the EPA, EPA Act to amend its licence to export iron ore from 5.1 million tonnes per annum to 2.5 million tonnes per annum from August 2020. Uh, 2020 and I ask, one, what volume of iron ore was exported from Quinana Bulk Terminal for the financial years 2016-17 to 2021 inclusive? Two, why did the Fremantle Port Authority request to decrease its export of iron ore from Quinana Bulk Terminal from 5.1 million to 2.5 million tonnes a year, effective from August 25, 2020? Three, will the Minister table the process of decision within Fremantle Port Authority effectively halving its export of iron ore from the Quinana Bulk Terminal? And four, if not, why not? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, 2016 17, 4,301,838. 2017 18, 3,138,490. 2018 19, 16,079. 2019 20, nil. 2020 21, uh, 
Two to four, I table the attached publicly available document. That document is tabled. The Honourable Peter Collier. Thanks, President. My question without that, if it's some is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister of Police. I refer the Minister to Operation Tide and ask one, how many personnel are currently operating in Tide? Two, will the Minister provide a breakdown of the numbers according to areas of responsibility for those in one? If not, why not? Three, do any of those referred to in one receive an additional allowance while being deployed in Tide? Or if yes to three, what is the quantum of the additional allowance? And five, are those referred to in one permitted to engage in any secondary employment? If not, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following information has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The Western Australian Police advise one to two. There are 406 police officers and 39 police staff allocated to Operation Tide. For operational reasons, more specific information relating to staffing levels at individual business units is, is not publicly released. Three, no. Four, not applicable. Five, all Operation Tide staff are vaccinated and those undertaking airport and hotel quarantine duties are also subject to regular COVID-19 testing. Police take a rigorous risk-based approach when considering individual requests for secondary employment from officers attached to Operation Tide. President, Leader of the House. I ask the business of the House be resumed. The business of the House has resumed. Are there any further answers from um, ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I table documents in relation to question on notice number 150, asked by the Honourable Peter Collier to the Leader of the House, me representing the Minister for Housing. Uh, and President, um, during the debate on the Metropolitan Region Scheme, Belia Wetlands, Bill 2021, I undertook to pass on to the Minister for Transport the request for supplemental information for the Honourable Neil Thompson and the Honourable Nick Goyran. I have done that, and on behalf of the Minister for Transport, I tabled the supplementary information. That uh, information is tabled. Are there any further answers? The Minister for Mental Health. President, pursuant to Standing Order 1082, I inform the House that the answer to question on Notice 146, asked by the Honourable Neil Thompson on the 3rd of June 2021 to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, will be provided on 19 August 2021. Any further answers from Ministers or Parliamentary Secretaries? No. Uh, we return to Order of the Day number 46, the Public Health Amendment. Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. And <coughs> the question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable James Haywood. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. I struggled as to whether I was going to get up and speak today, um, but, and I've been very, very impressed by the quality uh, of debate that's happened. Um, and some, particularly some members have ex, uh, expressed their views uh, very, very well. And so I'm a bit torn in terms of my contribution, uh, but there are a couple of things I, I, I do want to say. Uh, I know that the, the discussion was around that uh, this is not about abortion. There's no question that's correct. Uh, that the discussion has already been had, the debate's been had, the decision's been made, and, and it is a lawful activity in Western Australia. Uh, I guess, for me, uh, born in 1969 and adopted from birth, um, it's always been something that's probably been a bit close to my heart because I've, I've been, I guess, over the years, come to the realisation that if we had had literally abortion on demand, which is what we have now, at the rate that we did have, then perhaps I wouldn't be here, given uh, uh, the situation in 1969. So I've always been a bit, uh, felt a bit personally connected to this debate um, because of that, because of that circumstance. Um, and I acknowledge as well uh, that uh, over time the laws have changed and I can see that there uh, certainly in some instances have been appropriate reasons for that. But it doesn't change people's sense of connection to um, these laws. Some of the things in this bill I, I absolutely support. The idea that people would be photographed and have their images shared on social media is absolutely abhorrent. Uh, and uh, I think that that type of shaming is absolutely disgraceful. Uh, I'm not sure there's been a lot of that happening in Western Australia, though, I have to, I have to say. Um, because, as the Honourable Nick Garan pointed out, the motivation for many of these people who turn up they honestly don't see themselves as protesting. I've heard a, a, lot, a lot about protesting. We've had some examples about 
some of the terrible things uh, that happen um, or potentially have happened in, in other places or, or may have happened here from time to time over the years as well. But my impression of the people who go to these places is that that is not their intention at all, that they are compassionate people uh, and that they are there because they believe, uh, they believe they're helping the vulnerable. We've heard a couple of speakers talk about how vulnerable uh, women are when they go to these places and I absolutely agree with that. I absolutely agree that the, by the time people are making this decision for themselves that they are in a very vulnerable state. Um, but unborn babies are also in a pretty vulnerable state. And I know that's not going to be a popular statement, but that is the reality. They're the ones that can't speak. And that might be a very strong statement to make. Um, I have a personal connection with a person who some years ago rang me from an abortion clinic and uh, they were in all sorts of strife. Uh, and this person uh, wanted to talk to me about what they were going through. They knew of my uh, adoption uh, and, and they knew of my view around abortion and um, how, you know, for that, for me personally, it's a difficult uh, journey. Uh, and, and, and obviously not, uh, not that supportive of it, although respectful, respectfully acknowledging that people have their own decisions to make in that space. Uh, and she, she asked me about, about what she should do in this circumstance. It was a fairly confronting phone call. Uh, I suggested to her that she just take a little bit of time to think about what she was doing, um, which she agreed to do. Um, but then told me that she felt bullied by the people in, on the inside of the clinic to, uh, to go ahead. Anyway, it turns out she didn't make that decision to go ahead and she did leave um, and that child's now eight years old. Now, again, I don't say share this story with any disrespect for anybody that makes their own decision um, and it's not my intention to do that. But what I am saying is the motivation for the people standing out the front is stories like the one I just told, and the stories like the one that the Honourable Nick Garan just told, about those people actually believe that there's a chance that the individual walking into this facility is in such a state of despair and such a state of vulnerability that perhaps they could use the help and the assistance that these people offer. Now, one of the other challenges, of course, is that um, is that people are, who are in that position, and even a long time after they may have had this procedure, uh, can take great offence to somebody even standing there, even without saying anything, just because they're standing there with a placard or a sign or whatever that they might have. Um, and that can also be confronting. And it's certainly not my intention to see people uh, suffer. It's not my intention to uh, wish anybody who's in that very difficult circumstance anything but, um, you know, the, the, the best support that they can have to be able to get through that time uh, and, and ongoing. But I do raise the point because I think some of the language that we've heard today around people who are protesting and some of the examples um, of protest action have been really abhorrent and really terrible. And, and and I can imagine that they do have a lasting and very hurtful effect on the individuals walking in. I certainly don't support that and I can understand uh, with that in the background why this bill may, you know, this bill's um, come forward and, and the concerns that the people inside the clinic would have. And I also agree completely with um, uh, some of the comments made by the Honourable Donna Farragher around the right for people to be able to access uh, medical treatment in privacy. I mean, it doesn't matter what the medical procedure is. You don't want it being shared around on social media. Or you don't want to be photographed or filmed or threatened or, or whatever. And it might be, uh, you know, it, it might be something that's a, a personal experience, another matter, whether it be a, a, a form of cancer or, or any procedure. It's really not anybody's business to be doing that. And I accept that. But I guess the point I wanted to make is that the people who, who turn out to these places, they are not there, uh, in my view, to protest. It's, it's my view that those people turn up because they believe that they are making a contribution and that they could actually assist. Um, and in some instances, there's no doubt that they have. Um, 
In other times, I, had, I have no doubt that people have taken offence or have been intimidated by their presence. And so I guess that's the difficulty, the, 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 the wing and wang of it all, if you like, in terms of the, uh, the competing pressures. The difficulty I have, I guess, with this legislation is that uh, if we're about trying to give people uh, all of the options, and we know that the people who access these services are, um, are required by law to be uh, offered counselling, and but there's, no, there's not a lot of visibility around how, how that all works or what all, or that all means. And I think that that's the difficulty, is that this legislation that's being put forward uh, will uh, certainly frustrate the efforts of those people, uh, which is what its intention is, of course, uh, to be able to um, uh, give people that support. And, and I accept, again, others mentioned that these are people they don't know, and that's right, but sometimes people just... Um, the reality is I know that, that through the work of President Problem House and others within, uh, within the state who do work with young people in this situation, we do know that there are stories where people do get through and don't end up uh, taking, that, taking those steps. So they have been able to help people. After this legislation is passed, that is going to be much, much more difficult for them to be able to do. Thank you. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I um, would just like to make a very brief contribution. And like others, in, including Honourable James Howard, I'm uh, extremely impressed with the quality of the, of, the, of the debate and the respectful nature that it's taken place in as a, as a new member. Uh, I have enjoyed that side of the debate. Um, I would just like to make a few quick comments. Um, so my, my stance on this, this bill, which I will be supporting, is that, is that anybody's right to access medical treatment is obviously something we need to protect. Um, uh, as much about privacy as anything, I, I see um, that, that to, to be a, 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 a fundamental right. And as well-intentioned as, as some of those protesters or people who turn up at these facilities might be, I think the privacy of the people seeking that medical treatment is paramount. Uh, in public life and in all sorts of positions, we do have to choose between competing rights, so um, freedom of speech, if you like, versus, versus other rights. And, and in, this, in this instance, I think this bill comes down on, the, uh, on balance on the right side of that, that argument. So uh, I will be supporting uh, the bill. Um, and it does, I guess, bring us into line with uh, other jurisdictions in Australia, and I think that is important. I think, uh, I think as the Honourable Peter Collier mentioned, that uh, that is important in Western Australia. Uh, so, again, a brief contribution, but supporting the bill. And I, I, I've, I've got to my feet to make that point because I think, of, in fact, of the way that we have been offered a conscious vote on this side of the chamber, so I think it's important and my responsibility to let the, the House know how I'll be contributing. Um, just a quick point that the Honourable Martin Aldridge raised and the Honourable Lorna Harper responded to about the 150 number. Uh, I think the Honourable Lorna Harper, Harper might have misunderstood the Honourable Martin Aldridge's point, and it is important that the people who have to put this law into effect uh, can do that. And uh, as was raised, the six metre rule, we've been there at election time. I can imagine a, a 150 metre tape measure being rolled out. So I would hope that that uh, can be clarified in the process. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Members, the question of the bill will be read a second time. The Honourable Brian Walker. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Acting President. Once again, I'd like to pay tribute to all the members who have spoken, heartfelt um, uh, contribution. I'd also like to reinforce the understanding that this is not about abortion as a concept, as a procedure. It is about safety, the safety of women, the rights of women, the, the, the ability to access medical care without being criticised. I could imagine, for example, and bearing in mind that this is personal to me because I deal with this on a regular basis. But I could imagine, if you would, someone coming in and confessing to me uh, some years back that they're actually having trouble with their, 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 they feel as if they are homosexual. And if I then shouted loudly, oh, that's awful, I disagree entirely, we'll have to do something about that and here's some medication to take away your, your libido. 
How, how would that go down? How dare I impose my views on someone else? They've come to me for a medical opinion. I need to deal with them as a doctor, not as a moralist. And yet we're comfortable with the concept that you can stand in the street and point at someone, ostensibly praying, criticising someone for, for needing a, a medical procedure. How dare we allow that? It's just it's not, uh, not acceptable. Also, I found very pleasing today that the male-dominated discussion actually didn't happen. OK, respectful, because it's actually a female issue. We might have a view if our partner is seeking an abortion. We might have a view, but ultimately, we don't have the uterus. Not our, not, our, not our problem. We might have an opinion. We might want to share. And it comes on to the question, of course, if you're looking at the whole concept of, of, uh, of sexuality and, uh, and uh, childbirth, is that we need to consider not just this current pregnancy, but all of life. I mean, it's not just at 18 your child goes away. You've got that child until you die. We've got a whole, a whole life to deal with this child. And the idea of, I can help you through the pregnancy, does nothing for how about you paying for the childcare? How about if you actually help put food on the table? How about if you help when I'm being assaulted at home and the police are doing nothing because there's no evidence yet and so I have to go back, especially in lockdown, and be confronted by my abuser on that daily basis? Who's going to help me with that? You? Nice people standing outside there? Of course you're not. And I've also found that the vast majority of the young women who come to me asking for an abortion are devastated. They're in a situation they don't want. The concept that I would not be in a position to give them advice, I find personally very insulting. That's why they're there. Help me. And for some of them, and I can look at a number of children, there's even one right now who's going through a pregnancy who was in severe distress for, for medical reasons. Okay. Keeping the baby, yes, that was her choice. She had an option, but we helped her work through that, and she was willing with that as well. That's fantastic. Um, and it does happen that we give advice, and they say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll proceed with the pregnancy. They have a, a time there of, of, of doubt, of concern. You talk through that, not just now, but the next time, the time after, make a decision, and this I've decided to do. And no criticism. I can give the advice. But the young woman has to make a decision herself. What is she prepared to do? And I can't think, there's maybe one or two who used abortion as a method of contraception. The vast majority are in a position they don't want to be, are seeking good advice, and if an abortion is to be their decision, that is fine by me. Now, I personally, if I had the skills, I wouldn't do an abortion. It's not part of my, my belief set. I don't like it. But that does not mean I refuse them. No, I send them on to people who are kind and caring and compassionate. And looking at these centres here, what they do excellently is they give psychological support. You may be walking through past this barricade of people ostensibly praying okay, to get psychological support as to what would I sensibly want to do. And if the option then is the abortion, fine, that can be done. But it doesn't mean just because I'm walking through that I'm going for an abortion. It means I have a problem, and this is the place to be where my problem can be addressed. Our duty is to protect the vulnerable. That's our duty. We have a duty to the people of Western Australia, male and female, young and old, to give them the opportunity for living life as they feel best, supporting the community. The concept that we could humiliate someone, give them guilt complex for the rest of their life, I remember the words just now of the Honourable Peter Collier. Excellent words. Words make a difference. The, the, the suicides we're having, young people bullied on social media, is not an isolated phenomenon. We need to protect the vulnerable. Now, you could then say, what about those with strong religious views? They have a right to express those views. They do indeed. But you've got to be genuine about it. You have to be genuine. Now, one of the 
laws, if you like, if you look at a religious book. One of the laws was, do not pray ostensibly in public. Do not make a big hue and cry. Do not stand in the public place and pray that people can see you're praying. The words of the prophet when he mentioned that was, these are hypocrites. It's a hypocritical thing to do. You pray in private. And if you then say, I have to pray in public, what you're also then saying is, I don't believe God actually is there or he actually works, because if he did, prayer would work. But now I'm going to have to do something more. So what you're basically doing then is you're making a bold ex uh, exclamation to the world, I don't really believe what I'm preaching. How dare you then try and stand as a demonstration for other people? It must be in private. Using prayer, shouting words to force, control, to hurt, is actually really unchristian, is it not? Can anyone tell me that this is what Christ would approve of? So the behaviour we've got there, it's the behaviour, not the act of going to get, seek an abortion, it's the act of keeping people safe from others who are seeking to cause harm, where the physical, that's the 14 cases perhaps, where the police could make a charge, or the non-physical, the insidious, the hidden, the bullying, which is intolerable and plays a role in our daily lives to the detriment of all in society. This is what we're facing. It's not just about keeping uh, the, 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 the clinic safe from such people. It's about a statement on our society that this sort of behaviour is no longer to be tolerated. Under no conditions, nowhere. But when these vulnerable people are passing by, these ones we have to protect. So I commend this bill, and I thank the, the government for bringing this bill forward. It is, it is beyond time. We're the last state in Australia. Let's make it happen. Because from a medical perspective, I can tell you from personal experience, this causes psychological harm. People are scarred, are damaged. This is not the point of putting a point of view across. This is causing harm. This must not happen. And a final point here, protest, by all means. We have a right to protest. A protest does not say you can also harass people. There's a difference between protesting and, and harassing. Protesting is our right. We're in a free society. We can make our point of view clear. But for someone else to have a different point of view, for me to then harass them for that point of view, is not democracy. It is not protest either. So I'll bring that point of view across. And I, I bring this passionately because I have patients who are suffering because of the actions of those people. I don't like it. No one likes it. So I commend this bill. Members, questions will be read a second time. The Honourable Martin Pritchard. Thank you, Deputy President. I'm going to make a very brief uh, uh, a contribution. First of all, I don't want anybody uh, on uh, either side of Parliament to think that uh, just because everybody haven't, hasn't spoken on this side of Parliament that they're not fully supportive. I'm very, very supportive of this legislation, and uh, that's one of the reasons why I didn't, wasn't going to speak, because the sooner we get it in place, the better. But I just make a couple of points. One. We're talking about uh, outside of an abortion clinic for women uh, and, uh, that are making a very, very difficult decision. And if you look at the legislation, what we're actually saying uh, to not occur outside of an abortion clinic in a public area, we're suggesting that the uh, ladies that are making this difficult choice should not be beset, should not be harassed, should not be intimidated, should not uh, inter interfere or th uh, threaten them should not hinder or obstruction, uh, obstruct them, should not impede them. Uh, we should not allow them to be, uh, uh, to be photographed uh, and recorded. Uh, that's what this bill is uh, protecting women from. So if you read the bill, it's a fairly simple bill. I'm not sure there would be too many people that would say that it is appropriate to, uh, to you know, threaten, hinder, harass. Uh, uh, women outside of an abortion clinic. Uh, I'm not sure too many people would say that that would be appropriate. So just read the bill uh, and I will be fully supportive of the bill. Thank you, Deputy President. Members, the questions of the bill will be read a second time. The Minister in reply. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, can I at the outset thank all of those who have made a con uh, contribution on 
this piece of legislation before us. The Honourable Martin Aldridge, the Honourable Samantha Rowe, the Honourable Lorna Harper, the Honourable Sophia Mormond, the Honourable Donna Farragher, the Honourable Colin de Grosser, the Honourable Brad Pettit, the Honourable Wilson Tucker, the Honourable Neil Thompson, the Honourable Peter Collier, the Honourable Dan Caddy, the Honourable Yuan Seven, the Honourable Nick Oran, the Honourable James Hayward, the Honourable Steve Martin, the Honourable Brian Walker and the Honourable Martin Pritchard, NLC. It has been a good uh, debate and I think we've all certainly heeded the advice uh, of the President uh, in her statement earlier on. I think it's been a, a, um, a respectful debate this afternoon as an issue like this should be for uh, what is an important piece of legislation, the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. Um, a number of honourable members have raised uh, questions or have asked questions in their contribution, so I'll seek to provide an answer to those uh, now, uh, noting of course there is an appetite to go into um, community of the whole uh, afterwards. Uh, in relation to the bill itself, so to the Department of Health as part of the extensive consultation process undertaken on the issue in 2019, received strong feedback from women and their family members about their experiences of visiting the main abortion clinics in Western Australia. It was clear and evident that a new regulatory framework is required to deal with the unique behaviours experienced outside those clinics. Uh, no other health service experiences this type of regular uh, organised protests. Uh, in the Honourable Martin Aldridge's comments, and I thank him for his comments, he raised a number of questions. So in relation to the, the, the timing of uh, the introduction of the bill, work on this project was delayed in order to take into account the decision of the High Court in Club versus Edwards, as it was important that we know whether safe access zones were constitutionally valid. Shortly following the High Court's decision on the 10th of April 2019, the Department released a discussion paper inviting community feedback on introducing safe access zone legislation in Western Australia. A final report, including the Department's recommendations, was submitted to Cabinet in January 2020, seeking approval to draft a bill to implement safe access zones in WA. Uh, when COVID-19 arrived, it required the Department of Health to focus or to pivot their focus on many other urgent COVID directions and COVID-related bills. However, the government was able to introduce the previous bill in October 2020, and it passed the Legislative Assembly, although, of course, did not pass this place due to the prorogation of Parliament. So we needed to reintroduce this bill, and we've done so as soon as possible following the recent state election. Um, the government is determined to ensure that this legislation becomes law, and as we are all well aware of the importance of finding a legislative solution to the ongoing problem outside the main abortion clinics in this state. With regards to the differences between the previous safe, safe Access Zones Bill that was introduced into this House in 2020 and the current bill before us, uh, and as the Honourable Member I think was previously advised, the bill before us is pretty much the same as the one that was passed by the Legislative Assembly on the 11th of November 2020 and was introduced into this place on the 24th of November uh, of the same year. Besides a few editorial changes, only one minor change was made to the previous bill. That was the removal of proposed section 306C, laying reports before House of Parliament not sitting. It was a procedural provision of advice, not related to the substantial um, safe access or substantive safe access zone provisions uh, that required the Minister to send their report on the review of the bill, prepared after its fifth anniversary, to the Clerk of the House, if, in the Minister's opinion, the House of Parliament will not sit during the period of 21 days after finalisation of the report. That provision, I'm advised, was originally added to the previous bill, uh, as well as to other bills drafted at the same time at the request of the Parliamentary Council's Office. I'm told they've indicated uh, that there is no longer a need for it and it has been removed from the 2021 bill. Uh, South Australia, the conversation I mentioned about South Australia, so South Australia has indeed uh, already passed a similar piece of legislation in their jurisdiction. That was assented to on the 19th of November 2020. So Western Australia at this stage is the only jurisdiction in Australia that does not have a legislative protection around those clinics. There is a risk that groups which support protests against abortions from all over the country, or even from other countries, uh, could target Western Australian clinics uh, and we could witness more and more protests. This concern was also mentioned in the report called uh, Abortion, a Review of South Australian Law and Practice that was published by the South Australian Law Reform Institute. The Honourable Member also queried about the method uh, of which the Department of Health analysed submissions received as part of the work on the final report uh, on the issue published in uh, February 2020 and, how, uh, and about how generic submissions were dealt with. I am advised that data was collected from the consultation responses uh, and was analysed by the Department of Health using uh, SAS Enterprise Guide and Excel computer programs. 
So frequencies and proportions were used to describe demographic data to, inter to identify the most common words and to summarise responses to the questions. The results of the survey and feedback in submissions were collated, thematically coded and analysed. Every effort was made to ensure the report is a true re representation of the various opinions across the submissions. Incomplete responses and duplicates from the same person and or containing the same content were removed from the survey. To check for duplicates in the survey, the department used the internet protocol address and time and date stamps of the submissions and checked for the presence of duplicate answers. It was possible for different people to submit responses from the same IP address, such as when multiple individuals respond from a library or a health centre or a home, and this was taken into consideration when checking for duplicates. Where duplicates were identified, one response was kept and duplicate responses were removed. The department received only 119 submissions from individuals via email who used the same campaign website and that was flagged in the report on page 12. The Honourable Martin Aldridge, in his contribution, also mentioned the exemptions provided in the New South Wales Safe Access Zones legislation. I'm told New South Wales is the only jurisdiction in which Safe Access Zones legislation specifically included those types of exemptions, and we did not identify any need to include them in our bill. The bill includes sufficient tests to, to ensure that those who should be Sorry, who should not be captured by this legislation, whether it is a protest outside Parliament House or a sermon about abortions inside a church, are not going to be captured. Uh, the Honourable Nick Goran, in his contribution, raised some concerns related to the possibility of women being coerced to undergo an abortion. Even though this bill does not deal with the existing procedures of undertaking abortions in WA, which is regulated by a completely different piece of legislation, now I would like to briefly provide a few general comments. In WA, abortion is available on request, provided that informed consent has been freely given by the woman, unless exceptional circumstances apply. The current requirements for counselling are specified in section 334 of the Health Miscellaneous, Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1911. By law, a medical practitioner, other than the one performing the abortion, must provide the woman with medical information about the medical risk of termination of pregnancy and of carrying a pregnancy to term, and must also offer her referral uh, to appropriate and adequate counselling about matters relating to termination of pregnancy and carrying a pregnancy to term. These are minimum legal requirements and do not prevent a woman from choosing to seek additional counselling or considering other support services that may be available. It is important that counselling is accessible non-judgmental, as I think a number of members have mentioned, impartial and imparted by trained health professionals. Counselling is voluntary. You seek it out when and if you want to. Now, some comments and questions have been raised with regards to the current regulatory framework that we have in Western Australia at the moment. Um, so I did want to just take a moment to properly explain the problems that we have identified with the current regulatory system for managing protester behaviour through the permit system under the Public Order in Streets Act 1984. Similar to the experience in other Australian jurisdictions prior to the introduction of safe access zone legislation, WA's existing laws do not adequately address the full range of behaviours engaged in by people who demonstrate at or near premises at which abortions are provided. This may be accounted for in considering the nature of the demonstrations outside these premises and the unique effect on the target audience. The vulnerable nature of the audience means that they are likely to be particularly affected by the presence and behaviour of demonstrators. Those protests have been going on for many years, and it is evident also from the testimonials that we received during the consultation process from Western Australian women that the current mechanism does not deter the protesters from harassing or intimidating those who try to access legal health services. Although conditions may apply to the protest permits, breaches of a condition on a permit are not an offence under the Public Order and Streets Act 1984, so WA Police is not able to impose any penalty on anyone. Unless a person commits an offence under other legislation, police are only able to, uh, to add more conditions on future permits, revoke a, an existing permit or issue a move-on notice. It is also the case that WA Police uh, are only there at certain times, often when the behaviour is not being demonstrated. The figures and information provided by police indicate that it is difficult for them to capture those unique behaviours outside, uh, outside these clinics as many of them are not currently offences. It can be hard to prove that the behaviour occurring outside the premises satisfies, satisfies the current regulatory criteria to act. No protester has ever been arrested or prosecuted for an offence identified outside an abortion clinic. 
Moreover, women who are usually the witnesses do not normally wish to take those kinds of matters any further and make a complaint, as they want to move on and put this part of their life behind them. They also want to protect their own privacy, and they are aware that the experience is generally a one-off. Therefore, I advise it's clear that the tools that WA Police currently have do not equip them to adequately protect women, their supporters and the staff of clinics from being able to go about their work or gaining access without being shamed, harassed or intimidated. A physical separation between the entrance to the service and the people who are seeking to protest outside is the solution to avoiding the harassing and intimidating behaviour. The bill will provide WA Police with the ability to enforce new offences, which have been tailored specifically to deal with the unique issues outside these clinics. The legislative buffer will largely avoid the current need for police officers to respond only after inappropriate conduct has occurred. Uh, a number of uh, Honourable members also mentioned uh, the 150-metre, uh, uh, the decision to, to, to uh, have the boundary 150 metres away from the premises. So this has been modelled on the Victorian legislation, which defines the zone as 150 metres away from the boundary of the premises at which terminations are provided. That specific zone was tested by the High Court in Club versus Edwards and was considered a crucial, sorry, a critical factor in the High Court upholding its constitutional validity. The High Court concluded that a radius of 150 metres was appropriate and adequate as to balance the purpose of the legislation. Also, uh, it is a size that was strongly supported by the community and health services in WA during the course of the consultation. 75.3 per cent of those respondents uh, were in favour, who were in favour of safe access zones supported a minimum of 150 metres. Experience from other jurisdictions in Australia supports a minimum distance of 150 metres fr from premises at which termination services are provided. Beyond 150 metres, it will be harder for demonstrators to distinguish patients and staff from a passerby. So in light of that, the government had taken the view that the 150 metre zone is the appropriate size for the safe access zones. Uh, we are of the view that a safe access zone of less than 150 metres will not adequately protect patients and staff who access or leave premises where abortions are provided. I think in the Honourable uh, Wilson Tucker's comments, he, he made uh, he asked about the, the, the possibility of uh, extending or indeed reducing the size of those safe access zones. That is not available uh, under the bill that is before us today. So it says 150 metres. Um, finally, uh, as I want all honourable members to better understand the terrible situations that some women needed to face here in Western Australia, uh, I would like to finish with just several statements that were made by those women and were recorded by Mary Stokes during the Lent period in 2018. Um, so these were quotes. Made the mistake of walking into car park past them, uh, using, emotive, using very emotive language, you're killing babies, Jesus hates sinners. Another comment was feel th feel, felt threatened. Uh, another comment was discussing the way they speak to people as a patient was confronting and unnecessary. Another said, they, another said they felt very judged. Um, another said that they felt very emotional because of the confronting posters of babies. Uh, another said both myself and my partner were affected by this and it was totally unacceptable. Another said it was quite intimidating, especially in the way they approached me. Uh, I'm here as a support person for my sister. I'm glad I was approached and not her. Another said a protester put hand inside car and dropped a bag. I threw it back. And a further comment was made that a protester paced in onto the driveway. I had to break and she waved her brochures at me, at me while trying to tap on my window. Um, the Honourable uh, Members for North Metropolitan, the Honourable Dan Caddy and also the Honourable Peter Collier, and their contributions spoke about the power of words, both written and oral. And I think the above statements are the statements that I've used just um, from the women uh, reiterate that point and the effect that it's had on them. This bill is ultimately about freedom of patients to access legal medical services, and that's point has been made by a number of honourable members, at termination clinics in a private manner and without harassment or intimidation in accessing these services. So again, can I thank all honourable members for their contributions thus far, and I commend the bill to the House. Members, we are dealing with the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. The question is the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Aye. Division called, ring the bells.
回も一回も一回も一回も一回も一回も Members to my right, if you can take a vacant seat, that would help、um, the council, the tellers in due course, or if not, those that remain standing, if you could just spread out on that side of the chamber. Lock the doors. Members, the questions of the bill be read a second time. Members voting with the eyes shall pass to the right of the chair. Members voting with the nose shall pass to the left of the chair.、Uh, I appoint the Honourable Pierre Yang as teller for the eyes and the Honourable Nick Garan as teller for the nose. And before the tellers tell, I cast my vote with the eyes. Sorry. He's right in front of you.
Members, the results of the division are finally ayes 27, noes 3. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021, second reading. Members, we'll now move into committee. I just want to remind members of the public gallery that it is disorderly to communicate with the chamber and also more so to photograph the chamber if indeed that occurred. We're in committee. Members, we're dealing with the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill 2021, and the question for the Chair is a clause 1 be stand as printed. The Honourable Nick Garan. Minister, during the second reading of the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zone Bill 2021 on the 24th of June 2021, the uh, second reading speech was delivered uh, by the Parliamentary Secretary, the Honourable Kyle McGinn, uh, on your behalf. And what was said uh, on that day was that, and I quote, except for a few minor changes, the bill before us is identical to the bill that was debated and passed by this House late last year. Uh, what are the minor changes in this bill to the 2020 version? Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Honourable Member, so originally the bill was titled the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2020, and so the bill before us now is 2021. So throughout the bill, I'm happy to, to identify them to you if I need to, but in a number of places in the previous bill it had 2020 and that now reads 2021. So, for example, the short title of the bill previously, it, it said 2020, and the bill before us now has 2021. Uh, if you've got the contents page of the bill, uh, so previously, I'm looking, so I'm looking at page uh, Roman numeral uh, one. Um, previously at clause five, in the previous bill, it said section 306B and section 306C inserted. Um, and then under section 306, 306B, there was a section 306C, 
which read in the previous bill, laying reports before, uh, before House of Parliament not sitting. So they are the, they're the changes. So obviously because three, so the dates, and then because that 306C was removed, uh, it doesn't, doesn't appear anymore. Gentleman Nick Grant. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. That's helpful. Uh, to the extent that I've got any further questions on that, then I will um, leave that to, until such time as we get to uh, Clause 5, uh, given that the rest of the matters are uh, self-explanatory and simply an update to reflect the fact that we're in a new calendar year after the election and that the previous uh, bill had, uh, had lapsed. Uh, so, Minister, uh, there was discussion, um, or reference, I should say, uh, during the uh, second reading. Uh, I think also, but in the second reading speech made by the uh, parliamentary secretary, but also in other uh, speeches made of a uh, discussion paper. Other than the discussion paper, were there any uh, particular stakeholders that were? consulted in the development of this bill? Minister. Thank you. So my advisers tell me that uh, WA Police were consulted, uh, as were a range of other government departments who were consulted as part of the, the, the cabinet process, honourable member. And I'm told the main um, clinics offering termination services were also consulted, and of course, along with, uh, as you previously uh, mentioned, um, people were consulted as part of that decision discussion paper. Process. Uh, we also, uh, I'm told, also engage with other jurisdictions around the country, too. Questions clause one, Mr. Anders Brinter, the Honourable Garan. Uh, Minister, you made reference to uh, government departments. Are you able to be more specific as to which government departments were consulted? Mr. Chairman, I'm not able to provide those to you. They may well be, they may well be in cabinet and confidence, but I'm not even in a position to say these types of agencies. But certainly, as part of the cabinet process, uh, the, the, as is the normal process, the, the um, cabinet, um, the what do you call it, the cabinet submission, uh, is circulated to, to, to government agencies, and then they provide a cabinet comment sheet in relation to, to the bill. So, um, Minister, the provision of the list of government departments that were consulted other than WAPOL, is that not able to be provided today because the information is not readily available or because it's secret information? Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, it's not readily available and we would have to check with the Cabinet Office as well about um, how appropriate it is for us to, to be able to release that information. So, um, I can't do that now. And, uh, Minister, would you uh, be willing to uh, undertake to see if you would be able to provide that information at a later stage? 
Minister. Uh, we can certainly inquire with Cabinet Services as to whether that's available. Gentleman Graham. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Now, Minister, you mentioned that um, another group that were uh, consulted in respect to the preparation of this bill uh, were the clinics. Is that is that the two clinics that have been uh, referred to, or are we talking about uh, more than that? Minister. Thank you. So, yes, that is correct. So, that is the uh, Mary Stopes and then the Nanyara Medical Group. The Honourable Governor. And, uh, Minister, are you in a position to advise us in what form that consultation uh, took place uh, with those two clinics? What I'm particularly interested to know is whether there were any in person uh, meetings or whether the consultation uh, was by way of written correspondence. Minister. Thank you. So I'm told there were in-person conversations and uh, and written conversation and written correspondence too. The Honourable Minister. Uh, now the written correspondence, uh, Minister, is that something that you're able to provide to the House? Yes, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not in a position to give you any correspondence. The Honourable Grant. Thanks, uh, Chairman. So, uh, Minister, once again, is that because it's not readily available or because it's a secret document? Thank you. So I'm told it's neither readily available, and I'm not in a position to to provide it. So we wouldn't ordinarily provide the correspondence between the government and those stakeholders in relation to the bill. General Wilson Tucker. The CT has equivalent legislation, which includes a minimum of 50 metres, I believe, for the for the safe zone and a head of power provision to grant distance extensions for specific clinics, depending on on the circumstances of the individual clinics. Did WA considering did this bill rather include uh, consider including a head of power provision uh, similar to the ACT legislation?
Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so I'm told the, the ACT was the first jurisdiction in Australia to develop legislation on safe access zones. Uh, jurisdictions and their thinking has evolved since this time, uh, and so, uh, so it wasn't considered. Um, we modelled our legislation here on the Victorian legislation, and obviously, uh, as I previously mentioned in my second reading reply, uh, we spoke. I spoke about the um, the High Court and the High Court decision that found that 150 metre distance. I'm, I'm, these are my words, not not the decision, but that were essentially reasonable. And so that was uh, that, that 150 metre decision was landed on based on that and based on the, the knowledge that the High Court found it reasonable. Members, noting the time, I shall leave the chair to the ring the bells. Honourable members, the Deputy Chair of Committees. Members, we are dealing with the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021. We are in committee and we are on Clause 1. The question is that Clause 1 does stand as printed. The Honourable um, Wilson Tucker. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Minister, when the bill was drafted, was legal advice sought to ensure a greater distance over 150 metres would not violate any freedom of right? freedom of speech rights. The Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Chair. Nothing else. <laughs> um, there was consultation across government in relation to that 150 metre distance, and the uh, advice received was, was that it was um, best to go in line with the High Court decision. Now, honourable member, earlier in the evening, in answer to a question that you asked me about the ACT. I did at the time say that the ACT was the earliest jurisdiction to bring this into, into being. I was subsequently advised during the break that in fact I was incorrect. So I apologise to you and to the House for misleading. The ACT was in fact the third jurisdiction to bring this legislation in. Um, and then there was a question earlier on about um, site specific zones. And so we ruled out site-specific access zones, so similar to the ACT, for a range of reasons, but, but in particular because varying the physical perimeter around such premises on a case-by-case -case basis would make enforcement of the laws complex and impractical. Police would need to establish the particular size of each perimeter for each individual premises, and that would obviously create a considerable workload for them. Uh, we have a range of both public and private facilities in our state that provide uh, termination services, and therefore this would compound the enforcement complexity. Um, WA's legislation provides a blanket approach to protecting all premises at which terminations are provided, and this is different to the approach taken by the ACT. The blanket approach makes it abundantly clear the public interest 
which is sought to be protected, namely the advancement of public health and the preservation and protection of the privacy and dignity of women accessing termination services. Having a system where some services are protected whilst others are not could potentially dilute the public interest which is being protected by the legislation. The result being a court may find that the legislation is not reasonably appropriate and adapted to the purpose sought to be protected. During the consultation process, it became clear that the community and health services supported the 150 metres uh, as the most appropriate size for the safe access zones in WA. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Given there is this blanket 150 metre rule for all abortion clinics in WA, what would be the outcome if the 150 metre distance isn't deemed as adequate? In, in the future in protecting the, the privacy uh, and staff of, of the clinics. The Minister. Thanks, Honourable Member, do you mind asking that again? We didn't hear the beginning of, of your question. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I was just mentioning so there, there's a blanket rule in place of 150 metres for, for all clinics across the board. I was just asking what would, what would be the outcome if that 150 metres wasn't deemed as, as adequate in protecting the, the women attending and the staff of those clinics. The Minister. Thank you. Well, as I've indicated previously, there's not the capacity in this bill before us to extend that perimeter. So if, uh, if such a thing was deemed in the future, well, then the government, the government at the time would need to bring further legislation to the parliament. But I will reiterate the point I've made previously in, that, in relation to the High Court decision. Uh, on the Victorian and uh, Tasmanian legislation and the fact that in that decision uh, that the 150 metre distance was deemed appropriate and reasonable. The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, I also would like to ask some questions about the 150 metre uh, zone, um, but I, I might just do so under uh, Clause 4 when we specifically do it, but I just want to indicate now, so when we get there, uh, there's no confusion. Um, uh, and I also want to pick up on um, the questions that the honourable member has been asking you with regard to the head of power and the ACT. But before I do that, I just want to go back to an earlier discussion that we had, and that was about the consultation with stakeholders. And you indicated that uh, uh, there were five groups that had uh, been uh, consulted in the preparation of this bill, WA Police, Government Departments, and we had a discussion around that, and we're going to see if we can find some further information, which is not readily available at this stage. I, I take it there's no change on that during the dinner break? The Minister. Thank you. As, you. as you are aware, I aim to please honourable member and where I can get extra information. Well, it's, it, where I can get extra it's, information. It's certainly very to a big change from last week. However, um, I, I can we advise you. We missed you last week. It must I can be advise you, I can advise you that the main stakeholders that were consulted as part of the work on the bill are so internal, so WA Police, as I've indicated previously, the Department of Justice, the Department of Treasury, the Better Regu Regu Regulatory Unit. Better Regulation Unit, I think it's called, um, the State Solicitor's Office, Parliamentary Council's Office, and the Minister for Women's Interests. So they were all they were all consulted as part of the, the work on the bill. In terms of which offices, um, ministerial offices, and other agencies were consulted, I haven't got that information. The Cabinet Office hasn't. The Cabinet Office was closed for the day, but that's certainly what I've got. Um, the just in terms of the final report from 2020 in Appendix Two, also lists. Um, the other organisations that provided submissions during the consultation process, to, in case you hadn't seen that already. The Honourable Nick Garan. So, uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, those government departments, Justice, Treasury, State Solicitor's Office, Parliamentary Council Office, and Minister for Women's Interests, that's a non exhaustive list at this stage, and, and there are others, but that information is not readily available at this point. I'm happy to point. The minister. So that is everybody that the agency consulted with. The cabinet process may have sent it to, um, to a number of other agencies that we're not in a position to be able to advise you tonight. The cabinet process involves a kind of a minister in conjunction with their agency suggesting who, which other agencies across government should get access to, to documents or get an opportunity to comment on documents, and that, that's, that's not available tonight. 
The Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, the, so back to the two clinics. There was some um, consultation with them in person and there's also, we know, some uh, written correspondence. Now, where it was left um, prior to the dinner break is that you indicated that um, it's not readily available. That's the written correspondence. And also, you seem to indicate that in any event, um, it, it, it might not be provided or probably wouldn't be provided or, or something to that effect. Um, I, I assume... Well, I'll interject yep. if you don't mind. Yes. So clarify. So, correspondence um, to a third party or from a third party outside government would need that party to consent to the disclosure before we could make it available. That's what my advice is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, rather than pursue that particular written correspondence, um, is the government in a position to indicate um, uh, the nature of the uh, feedback that has been uh, provided in the written correspondence? So, without actually providing it effectively, well, what did they have to say that uh, helped to inform the development of this bill? Minister. Thank you. So I'm told in relation to the, the report itself, so the, the feedback from those agencies is summarised in the report. Subsequently, though, I'm advised that, um, that um, since the election, I'm told, so as we embarked on the reintroduction of a piece of legislation, the conversation centred around, um, well, the agency sought feedback from, from those organisations as to whether the protests were still attending and so that the protests were still occurring and so that's what the, the conversation was about. The Honourable Nick Goran. And uh, Minister, what was, was the information that was provided by the clinics that uh, this continues to be a problem? Minister. Thank you. So I'm advised that, yes, we were advised that protests were still occurring and specific incidences were taking, taking place outside of those two clinics. Honourable Nick Grant. Now, this goes then, uh, Minister, to a broader issue. Obviously, the, the government is relying on the word of these uh, clinics. Um, what has been the system that's been implemented by the government um, to ascertain the veracity of what has been said by these clinics. The Minister. So the, so the decision the government made to, to bring forward this bill is not about what those agencies told us. We did consultation on the issue. We did, we did a report, we published that report, and as a result of that report, government took the course of action to bring a bill forward to the Parliament. Now, Honourable Member, in your correspondence or in your contribution earlier on, you alluded to some feedback that you had from an external organisation who said something differently. Uh, I too had a conversation with somebody in the last couple of days who actually goes to an accountant next door to one of those clinics. And she, this woman, who I trust deeply and sincerely, she told me that she has on occasion being, being approached as she's driven up to, to that street. And people have approached her to start giving her things and talking to her. Only then, when she walks into this accountant's, they walk away. So it's anecdotally, it's happening. Different people have got different views about whether it's right, whether it's wrong. But certainly, in terms of the, the consultation process that we took, we, when we undertook, 
that sought a range of feedback from a range of organisations and from the public, and based on that, we decided to bring forward a bill. The Honourable Nick Graham. Mm. So uh, this is a helpful uh, minister, and um, I, I think it's fair to say that um, certainly I, I'm not aware of anyone who uh, disputes the fact that uh, people approach people. So the, the situation that you've described uh, sounds to me entirely plausible. I don't know this person that you're referring to. I accept what you've said, that uh, you trust this person. Um, and the uh, sequence of events that they've described uh, sounds entirely consistent with everything that I know of uh, uh, these matters. Um, the approaching of a person, um, uh, one would think, is not offensive. But it's the na it's so let's explore that a little bit, because uh, when, I, when, I, uh, when you or I might approach each other, I'd like to think most of the time uh, we, we, we're not offended by that approach. Now, of course, in this situation here, we're talking about a much different set of circumstances, and as I think all members have recognised in the contribution of their debate, um, it is also in very, sens in very sensitive circumstances. So. Um, uh, what, it, what information has the government relied upon, uh, whether it be in the discussion paper or in the subsequent consultation uh, with stakeholders, that um, gives those approaches some sort of uh, character? Uh, is there a, a particular type of uh, behaviour uh, that is accompanying the approaching of people uh, that is uh, considered to be the mischief that the government wishes to uh, fix at this point. I want to give a very, um, uh, I want to give a, a, an example, uh, Minister, and when I do so, I emphasise before I even give it, uh, because I note that there are um, people keenly watching a debate, and um, in this particular debate, I find that um, unlike what has happened over the course of the debate in the chamber today, some people external to the parliament have a, um, a tremendous capacity to blow things out of proportion. So the example I'm about to give is in no way intended uh, to be a like-for-like -like example, but it is intended uh, for me to describe what I talk about uh, approaching somebody and whether that type of approach is offensive or not. So I want to give you the example of handing out a how to vote card. Now, uh, you and I, Minister, will have no doubt done that um, on many occasions uh, this year, particularly in the lead into March. And when we do that, we do approach people. Sometimes we might take steps towards them. Other times we simply stand there and people come towards us. Now, you, like myself, has, have been involved in many uh, election campaigns. And I'm sure that, like me, you've also witnessed some individuals, they may be from our party, they may be from other parties, who behave in a fashion which I would describe as uh, unacceptable. In fact, I remember going um, uh, and working in the um, uh, Rockingham area in the lead up to the election, and one of our volunteers was spat upon. Now, I know that every member in this chamber <coughs> will uh, condemn the spitter uh, for their actions, and rightly so. So there is certain types of conduct that we all, dis we all agree is unacceptable. And what I'm asking in this particular context is, is there information that the government have verified to confirm the character of the approaches that have been made? The Minister. Uh, thanks very much. Um, Honourable Member, I will draw your attention to the Safe Access Zones of Proposal for Reform in Western Australia Report 2020. Page 13 of that. Minister, just by way of interjection, is this what's generally described as the discussion paper? Or is no, that it's a the report. So the this final, is a, a report subsequent to the discussion it paper. Yep. So page, four, sorry, page 13 of that document, summary of submissions and impact, the, 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 the block is titled Impact on Patient Health and Wellbeing. And I'm going to quote from the document. Approximately 50 submissions provided examples from patients and staff regarding interactions with demonstrators outside the clinic. Minister, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, did, you, did you mention a page number? Page 13. Because for, for whatever reason, the version of the report that I have here has got no page numbers. Now, I don't know if that's just because my photocopier is not as I will sophisticated see. as it's yours. A page. It's got a... <laughs> But it just in order to progress things, yeah. would it be possible you could table that report? 
mm. we can make copies Presumably available. Still put a copy. I'll give. Well, I, answer the question. Yeah. yeah, I'll answer it because I want it. Um, so, I'm quoting for it again. So, approximately 50 submissions provided examples from patients and staff regarding interactions with demonstrators outside the clinics. Of these submissions, the majority described the experience as traumatic, stressful, overwhelming, awful, horrible, painful, hard, scary, hurtful, confronting, upsetting, frightening, horrifying, putting off, disturbing, and distressing. Um, approximately 50 submissions, and I'm going on to the next page, page 14, approximately 50 submissions com commented that demonstrators act as a barrier to access to safe abortion services. Approximately 50 submissions made comments to the effect that a health service is not an appropriate place to protest or that demonstrators could protest in other places outside the safe access zones. So that's from the document, that's from the report that came out and that was an analysis of submissions. I remember in terms of the, the um, in terms of the, the, the uh, example you gave in relation to you know, elections and election days, and I you know, understand people get distressed and offended, um, you know, I would suggest, and it's probably open to people to write to, their, you know, to the minister and, and express a view about that. I mean, I certainly spent a couple of years as Minister for Electoral Affairs, and I've, I've never had any correspondence from anybody suggesting that the, pain, that the, the, the process was so painful and hurtful and awful that we should stop handing out how to, how to vote cards and stop having people there. However, if people felt that, it, it would be open to them to write to the, the minister and indeed politicians to ask for that process to be stopped. But these are comments that were, that were, that were, were made as part of submissions into the process where people said that they felt hurt, etc. Um, you know, got interacting with demonstrators outside these clinics. Now, as has been pointed out previously, this is not a phenomenon that solely happens in Western Australia, mm -hmm. and there have been examples given of other jurisdictions in Australia and indeed around the world that this stuff happens. The Honourable uh, Nick Goran. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair and uh, Minister. Thank you for the uh, response, and um, uh, which I found quite helpful. And uh, again, I reiterate uh, that my example is uh, not intended to be uh, like for like, and, and I know you, and you know you recognise that as well. Uh, merely talking about the type of behaviour which we all um, would condemn. Now, Deputy Chair. So the Minister. If I may. So the Honourable Member asked if I would table a copy of the document. I'm happy to do so now, just so that the Honourable Member can have a copy that does have page numbers on it that he can quote from. So if I provide that. The Honourable. Sorry. That document is tabled. The Honourable Nick Goran. Uh, thank you, Deputy Chair. It's so, um, Minister, thank you for tabling that document. Now, um, you helpfully referred to some information and some uh, submissions. Now, those submissions, the summary of submissions that you referred to are under Table 2, which is entitled Submissions in Favour of the Proposal. And, it's, and uh, you referred to various extracts there. Uh, where they, the report talks about approximately 50 submissions have said this, approximately 50 submissions have said uh, that. Now, my, my question then is, what was the process that the government then embarked upon to ascertain the veracity of those submissions? I accept that the government have received those submissions. So if we take, for example, one of the paragraphs which refers to approximately 50 submissions provided examples from patients and staff regarding interactions with demonstrators outside the clinics. I accept that the government um, have received approximately 50 submissions. Just as a, a, an aside, it's not clear to me why the government um, or well, the writers of the report needed to consistently refer to approximately 50 submissions. I don't know why in a document like this we couldn't be precise and say exactly how many submissions were received. But nevertheless, let's um, uh, take it at face value that there were approximately 50 submissions that were received and said what this report says that they said. But what was the process that was then embarked upon to um, in the government's mind, confirmed the veracity of what was being alleged.
The Minister. So, Honourable Member, the, the, the issue has been in the media a number of times. It has been reported that these altercations were taking place outside these services. Um, the police have confirmed that outside these areas uh, issues have arisen, albeit I have made the point earlier on and you made the point that no one was charged as a result of, of the current legislation. But people have indicated that these types of altercations have been happening. Now, in terms of the, um, the consultation process, I mean, obviously, a range of organisations submitted uh, to the, 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 the consultation process, and the outcome of the consultation process showed that 2,927 of all submissions were in favour of introducing safe access zones around premises at which abortion services are provided in Western Australia. The Honourable Nick Graham. Mm, thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, so, uh, Minister, you indicated that there's been media about this. Is that, is that media in, res in respect to Western Australian incidents? I mean, I certainly am happy to concede, without any further debate, that there has been media coverage with regard to international incidents and also um, uh, incidents in the eastern states. Um, but that, of course, is not the concern of this, this parliament. Uh, for the time being, we're, considered, we're concerned about West Australian uh, matters. So if it is the uh, government's contention that the submissions are supported by West Australian uh, media reporting, um, are we in a position to identify any of that reporting? The Minister. Thank you. So I'm told that, yes, the stories have been in Western Australia, not international stories. The fact that the issue is happening here has been, has been published. Uh, however, in terms of whether we've got a copy of it, uh, uh, I'm, so an advisor is bringing to my attention a story on ABC News from March the 25th, 2019 where a woman talks about how protest has compounded her feelings of grief and loss after her abortion. And it talks about her exiting a Perth abortion clinic, teary and in pain. She remembers being called a murderer by pro-life protesters waiting outside. So that was, that was published, as I said again. ABC, Rhiannon Shine, on the 25th of March, 2019. In terms of some of the submissions that were received, while they've not been made public, I've seen at least one where you know, a, a, a submitter talks about um, people trying to take her car licence plate number, trying to take photographs of her outside, the, uh, outside of the, um, the, the clinic. Um, I, I think that shouldn't be happening. And I think you know, in terms of the contributions made by quite a few here tonight, acknowledge that people should be able to access medical services without people intervening or you know, or trying to, you know, trying to cause, cause them to do something else. So it, it has been in the media. That was one of the issues, but it has been an issue um, that we're, we've been aware of for a time. And a decision was made after we embarked on the process, had a proper consultation, put out a report that legislation was the best way to deal with the issue. Honourable Nick Grant. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Uh, Minister, uh, you'll recall that in my second reading speech, I uh, went out of my way on at least one occasion to emphasise that a very important principle, and that is that I believe, and I think this is what you're saying as well, that every Western Australian should be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded by other Western Australians. <clears throat> that doesn't change. Uh, uh, nothing has changed uh, since I said that earlier. Um, so at least in that regard, I think that we are of one mind. You mentioned that um, uh, one of the incidents discussed things like the taking of photographs. Are there any um, uh, West Australian laws? Imagine, Minister, that this bill didn't pass tonight. Are there any laws at the moment in Western Australia that enable um, a police or any other investigative body to be able to um, uh, pursue a complaint of harassment or intimidation, um, uh, and even possibly prosecute people for such thing. Do, do we have any laws of that nature in Western Australia? The Minister. Thank you very much, Honourable Member. Probably is a short answer. You probably know better than me, uh, given your legal background. Uh, I did actually make a note 
of your contribution earlier on, and I did write down that everyone should be able to go about their lawful business without being, I think, abused is what I wrote down, but it might have been a different word you used. Um, we have made a decision, the government have made a decision, that this bill before us now is the correct course of action in terms of dealing with complaints raised by people um, who are trying to access uh, legal medical services. Uh, this is the course of action. We've, so I can't, I can't comment. On it. The, the, the advisors I have here are health advisors. They're not advisors from uh, other agencies. They're advisors appropriate to the bill before us. So I can't. I'm not able to canvass other laws uh, that exist on the statute book. Uh, I can just talk about the legislation before us this evening. Um, you might have a different view about uh, a, a different course of action should have been taken in terms of a diff different piece of legislation. Can I say if the House decides this evening or indeed in the next couple of days not to pass this, well obviously the government would have, have to go back to the drawing board and look at what else we might do to deal with the issue uh, that people are facing outside these termination clinics. However, this bill is before us now and so until the House has voted uh, and given and had its final say, uh, I'm not going to canvass uh, any other options or opportunities. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Uh, thanks, Deputy Chair. Um, Minister, uh, I mentioned um, in the course of my second reading debate a number of 45, and that was um, the number of locations that I was advised in my 2020 briefing um, that will um, be impacted by this bill. Obviously, a lot of the discussion has occurred around the two private clinics that deal with the uh, majority of uh, abortions in Western Australia. Are you in a position to confirm whether 45 is still the current number, and if you have a list that you can provide um, of those 45 locations? Minister. Thank you. I'm advised that the number of WA premises that notify uh, abortion to the Department of Health varies each year. Mm -hmm. So that, that figure may well have been correct at the yep. time that was disclosed to you. Um, however, I'm told, um, at least later, in, in, or certainly during that same year, uh, there was a time when the legislation would have applied to 50, 50 premises. Okay. There were 50 premises that notified the Department of Health that they performed abortions. So they included 15 hospitals, 34 general practice, practices, uh, and one other. Um, I'm not sure whether that, that other was. I, can, I, I haven't got that information before me. In terms of where they are, I don't have an exhaustive list of those. Uh, and, uh, and to be honest, I'm not sure it, it, you know, it's in the best interest to table a list of the 34 general mm. practitioners around the state who may well offer these services to their clients because it may well have an adverse, uh, adverse impact on, on those services. The Honourable Martin Aldrich. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks, Minister. I mean, I, just on your last comment, I, I did contemplate that same um, problem, but then I had, had resolved myself in the fact that, um, that surely if somebody's going to be referred to services, then these aren't secret services. They are um, publicly available health services, so um, there wouldn't necessarily be any secrecy around where these services could be accessed. Well, now, well, we interjection. Yep. Certainly in terms of the 15 hospitals. Yeah. I don't have a list. That's probably easier to do. Yeah, sure. Uh, in terms of the general practitioners, again, I have a list, but the general practitioners are probably in a different category yep. to the hospitals. Sure. Um, so I guess my next question on this point um, is, is how, I mean, this is obviously going to bring in a prohibited behaviour regime and it's going to restrict people behaving in certain ways, but also um, using recording devices and distributing recordings in certain circumstances um, for which somebody will face a penalty of up to $12,000, I think, and 12 months imprisonment. Um, now, how will, given the, the broad application of uh, the boundary of a premises and within 150 metres of a, of a premises, so we're talking, you know, in a, in a suburban or in an urban context, 
Um, that's quite a radius if you, if you think about it. Um, how, how would one know um, necessarily these locations and where uh, they may well be captured, uh, their behaviour may well be captured by this bill and where it may not um, once this bill receives assent? Minister. Thank you, uh, Deputy Chair. Uh, Honourable Member, so uh, my advice is that, um, so in 2018, which is the last lot of information I've got, um, a total of 7,816 abortions were notified to the Department of Health, with 83 per cent of those abortions taking place at those two clinics. Uh, and so, you know, so 82 per cent, so 17 per cent were, were, um, were taken elsewhere. We have no evidence to suggest that there are protests anywhere else other than outside those two centres, uh, the, the um, Nanyara Medical Group and the Murray Stopes, Murray Stopes Centre in Midland. So it's not, it, it's not happening elsewhere. Uh, it's only happening at, at those two places. And so that's, you know, I, 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 so it's a good question you asked, but it's, it's not a problem elsewhere. It's only a problem in these two places. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Yeah, no, no, no. I accept that, Minister. I'm, I'm just contemplating. Um, um, I'm just contemplating what would happen. Um, I mean, particularly the 34 general practitioners. Um, I mean, if I think about some of the community contexts of where general practitioners' offices are. Um, um, you know, they could be in shopping centres or in, in, in retail areas. Um, I'm just wondering whether or not, uh, and even, you know, what is the, when, when does a general practitioner's office um, become a premise at which abortions are provided and when does it not? Um, is that assessed on a calendar, on a calendar basis based on the notifications? That you were talking about. So, when a when a in a calendar year, if a premise um, um, doesn't engage in any terminations, then it, it no longer is a prescribed premises, or sorry, not prescribed premises, a premises for the purposes of this bill. Um, I'd just like to understand because I mean this could be an issue that arises, perhaps un uh, perhaps on an unintended basis, um, you know, where there might be a protest within 150 metres of a hospital or within 150 metres of, of one of these GP practices, perhaps not knowingly. Um, I think these are, these are questions that um, <coughs> you may well say will be for the implementation phase of the bill, but I think we need to have some understanding of, of the practical application at this point. <coughs>
The Minister. Thank you, sir. It's a complicated issue, honourable member. Um, so, in terms of when, so the state find out after the fact, honourable member. Um, um, the the medication that's used, is, I understand, is, is fairly tightly regulated, and that needs to be they need to have a uh, they need to be registered to to, uh, to be able to access the the medication to use in the terminations. Um, I will reiterate the point again that um, the, the, the list, the list has, has never been made public, and it's not been a similar list has not been made public in any other jurisdiction either. There has, there has been no cases reported of these types of protests happening outside random GPs in Western Australia. Um, you know, there is a, a, a you know, so what would happen? Well, you know, I mean. If there was to be a protest outside a random GPs at some stage, the police would obviously look into the matter and determine, and, you know, investigate and determine whether there was actually uh, termination services being provided by a particular GP, and then they would then, at that stage, decide to take a course of action. Now they may well decide to probably to provide a warning to the person who was, you know, who's, who's if they could find the person who was. Um, who was protesting at the time, uh, but it would be up to police as to how to, to deal with the issue. But it's, it hasn't been an issue thus far in Western Australia. As I indicated, those protests happen um, outside of those two, two clinics that I've previously mentioned. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. I, I, appreciate, um, I appreciate that point. Um, the problem that I see here is the unintended consequence, and it's twofold. I think, um, the first is uh, actually um, actually having the protesters or people wishing to engage in a prohibited behaviour um, know where the no-go zones are and where they aren't, um, and um, and the other. Uh, the other issue is, is how you, um, how these activations um, happen. So you don't, well, how how you how you avoid entrapping somebody, or how how somebody unknowingly will commit an offence. Because remember, minister, ignorance is no defence at law. Um, so if if I'm in the Hay Street Mall, um, wanting people to sign my petition for abortion reform in Western Australia. And unknowingly, there's a general practice within 150 metres of my location in the Hay Street Mall who practices medical abortions. I've committed an offence under this, under under this uh, future act. Um, your response to me doesn't give me much confidence um, around when a place will and won't be designated. Uh, premises for the purpose. I mean, I understand the problem that's going to be resolved at, at the two clinics in question, um, and, and, and I agree. Uh, my issue is in is at the other 48 premises. At the other 48 premises. I mean, just because the conduct and behaviour of individuals today doesn't necessarily mean that that conduct is going to be the same into the future. Um, and we're looking at up to 50 premises here, which will change. Um, it's still not clear to me what exactly will be the trigger um, for the purposes of this bill. That's probably a matter that's better considered at Clause 4 when we look at particularly the terms, um, the terms that are used. Because I think, Minister, you said that um, for a general practitioner to practise medical abortion, so that is non-surgical abortions, um, they require a higher level of registration or approval um, than an ordinary general practitioner. And so that registration status will be the, at the point at which that general practice becomes a premises subject to this bill. Um, I think I'm going to leave that as a comment um, for now until we get to later in the bill, Minister, but that, that does it does concern me in, in both making sure that we don't um, entrap people unknowingly 
but that we also make it clear to um, people who are going to engage in prohibited behaviours that they do so outside of the potentially 50 no-go zones that this bill creates. Um, Deputy Chair, I want to um, ask about the current regulatory regime um, and, and why it's deficient in the context of the need for this new regulatory regime. And in, and in the Minister's second reading response, he addressed this issue. Um, he said in regard to the current regulatory framework, um, the current uh, currently does not adequately address the full range of behaviours, and I agree with him um, on, on that point. Um, he went on to say police are often not there when the behaviour is expressed and often having witnesses prepared to make a complaint or give evidence, um, they are often not willing in the circumstances. Now, I'm not quite sure how those, uh, those last two issues are, different, uh, uh, are resolvable by this bill, because I, I can imagine that if you're going to um, charge somebody with an offence, you're still going to probably have, under this regime, those two latter issues remain. While this may be a better regulatory approach, actually having somebody make a complaint and be willing to um, be a witness to that complaint isn't necessarily resolved, uh, in, in my mind, by this bill. Now, um, one of the questions I raised in the second reading speech was, um, if we accept that this behaviour ought to be prohibited, why are the West Australian Police Force issuing, issuing 40 permits per year for this, for this behaviour to occur within the vicinity of these two private practices. Minister. Thank you. So why they're doing it is because they legally can, honourable member. So we don't have the protections in current legislation that we will have if this bill before us passes. So quite simply, somebody can apply for um, a permit now and can get it. And I think it was you and your contribution earlier on, you spoke about some of the limitations or the restrictions around the permit and the fact that you know, it can, it can be for a period of time or it can be up for, you know, I think, up to an amount of 30 people. So that happens now under existing legislation. That won't be able to happen under this new legislation. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Yeah, uh, I, th I think I was, I was trying to stretch my memory in my second reading speech um, and, and I talked about the subjective versus the objective. And, and I think I was advised in 2020 that... Um, if the police were to make some judgments, if you like, that this sort of behaviour ought not to be happening, so therefore we won't issue permits, that may be subject to some sort of um, external review. Um, perhaps it will be alleged that it's discriminatory, it's, um, it's a, uh, a breach of somebody's um, um, freedom of speech or political expression. Um, and, and, I, and I got the impression, and I just wanted the minister to sort of clarify whether my recollection is sound or not, that police were reluctant um, um, to make judgments about the types of things that were happening. Um, um, and, and so therefore, what I was trying to understand was when the police force currently receives an application under this obscure act, um, that I mentioned um, um, earlier, the uh, Public Order in Streets Act of 1984, what assessments do the police make in, in, in approving a permit? Are they purely public safety considerations, like will, will the conduct of this protest um, obstruct traffic and potentially put protesters at, at a personal safety risk, or are there other considerations, perhaps policy considerations, um, that are considered or not considered in the context of that permit process. Minister. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is we don't know. Remember, that's the, the police do that. But, um, but my information, the information I've been provided, suggests that, um, and police have confirmed this, that no permits have been refused. Um, the criteria to refuse granting a permit for a public meeting or, pr or procession under the Public Order and Streets Act 1984 is limited uh, and does not seem to capture some of the unique behaviours identified outside the main abortion clinics uh, in WA. The Honourable Nick Garan. 
Sorry, <laughs> the Honourable Martin Aldridge. <laughs> Apologies. Thanks, Deputy Sorry. Chair. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Um, okay. Um, so my next question, Minister, is how, given this this um, bill before us only amends the Public Health Act, it doesn't amend. It does not amend or repeal the Public Order in Streets Act of 1984. Um, how will these two pieces of law interact with one another? So will it, um, I assume that uh, a permit will still be required for a gathering of, I think it's three or more people in a public place. Um, I assume then, if this bill passes, it will be a ground of refusal for a permit if, if a permit application was to contravene the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Act of 2021? Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. So, in relation to the issuing of those permits under the Police Order and Streets Act 1984, the police would need to be confident that the person accessing the permit, seeking to access the permit, was not seeking it to have a protest outside one of these, one of these services. Um, that you know, could be seen or heard by a person or oh, where's the other words we use? That that could be set, harass, intimidate, interfere with, threaten, hinder, obstruct or impede a person accessing or attempting to access um, or leaving the premises at which abortions are provided. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Yep, so I, I so I accept that. This bill's limited limited to the abortion services and protests protests relating to that. So it doesn't prevent other protests from happening within um, the safe access zone that aren't related, um, um, but my my um, my issue is particularly, or more so, since um, my earlier questions around the 50 premises, is so will will the police officers responsible for the issuing of permits under the Public Order in Streets Act of 1984, will they have? live access, for want of a better term, to these list of, the list of premises to which this Act will apply, which we don't have access to now, um, because I assume that's going to be a key piece of information um, that a decision maker in WA Police Force is going to need to have to say, I've just received an application, there wants to be a prayer vigil in a certain street in a certain suburb, um, I need to satisfy myself. That, um, that this protest isn't going to occur um, within 150 metres 
of a safe access zone. Uh, sorry, within a safe access zone, not within 150 metres of one. Within a safe access zone. And keep in mind that the nature of some protests, they're not stationary. Um, sometimes protests are mobile. They may, there may be a walk involved. And so is that, is that what's going to be available to, available to the WA police? And then will the decision maker say, um, the nature of this protest and the location of this protest is going to be a breach under the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Act of 2021, therefore the permit is denied, and that is a ground for refusal under the Public um, Orders Order in Streets Act 1984. Because remember, Minister, you said to me there are limited grounds for refusing a permit. Um, is, is one of those grounds that issuing the permit will, will um, offend another statutory law. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so just in relation to the sharing of, of a list of premises with the police, um, this is something that's being considered and it has been considered and is being considered still um, before that that'll you know happen before the commencement of the bill of the bill. Um, and it will take into consideration any operational needs identified by WA police. I am advised that police are already aware of the clinics where protests have been occurring to date, so they're aware of that. Um, um, and that's, you know, the, the, so the, the, the approach we're taking here is similar to the approach that was taken by the states, in particular Victoria, when they implemented their legislation. Um, in terms of the, the permit itself, so the, the, the police don't have to take into consideration, um, you know, this bill in the issuing of their permit. However, under this bill, it does say that it is an offence to engage in a prohibited behaviour, in prohibited behaviour, within safe access zones, and it's likely that the police would look at this and understand this bill. And in terms of issuing the, the, the um, issuing the permit, they would decide, well, you know, probably, you know, to assess it properly and think, okay, hang on, where is this taking place? Is it taking place out of one outside one of these clinics or one of these services that provide an abortion? If that's so, okay. Well, there's these penalties for doing various things, and you know, I draw your attention to, to page four of the bill uh, and 202P, which lists, you know, that a person must not engage in prohibited behaviour within a safe access zone, and that there's a penalty. Um, and then, for the purposes of <laughs> subsection one, a person engages in prohibited behaviour if they do certain things, um, or they communicate by any means in relation to an abortion in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. So the police have their process. We've got this bill. They would take this into consideration, likely. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Um, I'm nearly finished on this line of questioning, um, um, Minister, but I, I think we have got a problem um, with this issue. Um, and as you said, there are limited grounds for police to refuse a permit under the Public Order in Streets Act, Act, Public Order in Streets Act 1984, and I agree with you. As I said in the second reading, first time I read the Act was this morning, um, and there are limited grounds, and that's why it's not an effective um, framework for managing um, what is termed in this bill as prohibited behaviours. I agree. The problem that we have is that um, section 7, subsection 2 of the Public Order in Streets Act 1984 says, 
the commissioner or an authorised officer shall not refuse to grant a permit, shall not refuse to grant a permit for a public meeting or possession in respect of which notice has been given unless he has reasonable ground for apprehending that the proposed public meeting or procession may a occasion serious public disorder or damage to public or private property b create a public nuisance c give rise in any street to an obstruction that is too great or too prolonged in the circumstance or d place the safety of any person in jeopardy now they are the limited grounds in which police can refuse a permit my concern, Minister, is I think this bill should have also amended the Public Order and Streets Act of 1984 to make a ground of refusal if a permit was to offend the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Act of 2021. And the reason why is because you're going to have people applying to the WA Police Force for a permit to protest, effectively. And according to the Act, there's no ground, unless it meets one of those four categories in 7.2 of the Act, unless it meets those four categories, there are no grounds. It says, the commissioner shall not refuse, shall not refuse. So you're gonna have a situation where the police commissioner potentially will be issuing a permit to protest, which is clearly an offence under the bill before us. But he'll have to issue that permit because he has no right to refuse it. And then somebody rings the police and says, we believe there's an offence being committed under the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Act of 2021. And they turn up and the protesters have a permit from the WA police saying that they have a right to protest. I, I think this is a, um, an oversight minister. Um, and, and I'd like you to... Um, contemplate the scenario that I've just envisioned and ask whether or not the government agrees that it is a problem and whether or not we should be, as part of this bill, making a very simple amendment to the Public Order and Streets Act of Minister. Thanks, Mr Deputy Chair. Look, I'm advised, so the, the police have obviously been engaged in the legislative process in terms of putting this legislation together. Neither they, nor the State Solicitor's Office, nor the Parliamentary Council's Office, nor anybody else has suggested that we would need to make an amendment to the But did they contemplate that problem? To, uh, well, I, c I can't comment for, uh, for agencies in terms of what they contemplated as part of the decision-making process, but I can say they have been engaged in the process, they've been engaged in uh, either the drafting of the legislation or they've been consulted on the legislation. Hasn't been an issue that's raised, so, uh, and, uh, and I'm further advised, hasn't been an issue that's been raised in other jurisdictions either. And so um, we believe that the legislation before us will do what it needs to do. Deputy Chair. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Um, I, I appreciate that hasn't been raised. That's what worries me. Um, that's what worries me, Minister. Um, is that we'll be potentially passing um, tonight uh, an inferior piece of... If I can have the call. Minister. So permits again, so Public Order, Public Order and Streets Act 1984, yep. Clause 7, permits. The Commissioner or an authorised officer shall not refuse to grant a permit for a public meeting or procession in respect of which notice has been given unless he's reasonable ground for apprehending that the proposed public meeting or procession may 
you've got an A and yeah. you've got a B yeah. cause create a public nuisance. Yeah. Now my advisors tell me that if there was if there was a protest outside of one of these clinics and people are putting things in people's faces or providing material that's offensive, that would cause a public nuisance and so that would be captured by that. Deputy Chair. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Um, Minister, <clears throat> I think we're clutching at straws now. You, 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 can't have it, you can't have it both ways. Um, I've accepted your argument that the Public Order in Streets Act 1984 is an inferior regulatory framework for dealing with these prohibited behaviours. I can't then accept your argument that the WA Police Force will now, all of a sudden, stop issuing 40 permits a year because these prohibited behaviours are going to create a public nuisance. Well, if they're a, a public nuisance now, they're a public nuisance after this bill passes. I, I think that you are setting up a, a, a situation which I don't think you have contemplated, or the government has contemplated, which is going to require the police to issue a permit like they have on the 40, time, the 40 occasions a year that you said that they've had no, no ability to refuse because there's limited rights of refusal in the Public Order and Streets Act 1984, so therefore they've had to grant 40 permits. You can't then say it's a public nuisance and we're going to stop issuing, issuing the permits. So, Minister, I, if the bill doesn't pass um, this evening, I really think you ought to get some urgent advice from the Solicitor General about this specific, about this specific matter, or, or at least ascertain whether this particular problem was contemplated. Because I, um, you know where I, what my position is on this bill. I don't want to be passing an inferior piece of legislation that, um, from a fairly simple amendment, uh, well, it won't be that simple. We'll have to amend um, the long title and um, clause one as well. Um, but we can do it. Um, a relatively simple amendment could, uh, could resolve um, this matter by bringing in to 7.2 of the Public Order and Streets Act 1984 an immediate right to refuse a permit if issuing a permit would likely contravene the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Act of 2021. Minister. Look, I'd say at the outset that the government's not going to entertain that change. I'll draw your attention to the purpose of the bill that's before us now. And so, um, part 12C purpose. The purpose of this part is to a to provide for safe access zones around premises at which abortions are provided, so as to protect the safety and well-being and respect the privacy and dignity of yeah. persons accessing the services provided at those premises, and employees and other persons who need to access those premises in the course of their duties uh, and responsibilities. If we go on to 202P on page four, it this makes clear that it is an offence to communicate by any means in relation to, an ab to abortion in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person accessing, attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. This sets out what essentially is offensive and that, and that will be captured by the other bill. Deputy Chair. The Hon. Martin Aldridge. Um, I agree, Minister. It sets out an offence under the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill of 2021. That's not my issue. My issue is that, according to your own argument, police are going to have to issue a permit to protest under the Public Order and Streets Act of 1984 because it is not a, it is not, it is, it is not a um, right of refusal of a permit that it creates an offence in a bill in the bill that we are considering now. Um, I understand your arguments around the bill. Uh, apart from the deficiency that I, 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 I think that there is now in the bill with respect to the interoperability, that's the issue, is the interoperability between the Public Health Act and the Public Order and Streets Act 1984, where the Public Health Act says you cannot do this, but yet the Public Order and Streets Act says we're going to give you a permit to do it. Um, if you don't accept that that's a problem, we're going to have to... Um, differ on that point of view, but I urge, I urge the government to seek some advice on this overnight and provide some, some clear explanation to the House as to how these two 
pieces of state law are going to operate with one another. Minister. I'm not taking up your offer, thank you. Uh, so we'll have to agree to, to, to disagree. I'll make the point again, though. The Public Order and Streets Act talks about creating a public nuisance. The bill before us tonight gives the police confidence that should people be outside these, these facilities um, protesting, being offensive, harassing people, giving people you know, documents that are offensive with you know, babies on whatever, they, that, would give, that would allow the police to be able to use B of the Public, Street, public Order and Streets Act and not give the permit. Uh, members, the question is that clause one stand is printed. I give the call to the Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Chair, um, I've got a number of matters uh, uh, arising at this time. Now, Minister, you mentioned in response to the Honourable Martin Aldridge that um, WA Police have advised that they've never refused, ne never refused, uh, one of these uh, applications under the Public Order and Streets Act of 1985. Oh, sorry, 1984. Um, what's, the, what's the source of that information? Because I know you indicated earlier you don't have uh, police advisers are not available. Um, where do we get that information from? Minister. Thank you. So the Department of Health has been advised by WA Police that they've checked their records and they could not see any evidence of a permit having been refused. The Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, now, Minister, uh, I will say at this point that that is consistent with what I also understand this matter, but <coughs> with this caveat, do you have information as to whether Western Australian Police have failed to respond to an application as distinct from refused? Minister. Yeah. No, that's not Minister. Thank you. So, no, we don't have that information. The Honourable Nick Garan. So, uh, for the record, uh, Minister, I understand that in recent times, West Australian Police have failed to respond. Uh, there's an argument there that there has been a constructive refusal. Um, so whilst I accept that, uh, certainly on the information that I've been provided, uh, that there has never been an uh, outright refusal, um, uh, I would specify at this time that uh, the information that I've been provided in recent times is that Western Australian Police have simply failed to respond to application. Uh, how um, readily available would it be, because obviously you've indicated that the uh, Department of Health have been in contact with WA Police and they've uh, checked their records and they say that they've never refused, how readily available would information of this sort be, that is, um, when was the last time that an application was received by WA Police? Minister. With the greatest respect, honourable member, this is not estimates or another parliamentary process. So the issuing of permits falls under another piece of legislation. It's not in the bill before us tonight. So with the greatest of respect, I don't think it's appropriate to, to while we're canvassing the bill before us, to seek those information you know, on tan tangential issues. So I, I don't have it, I'm not sure, but it's also an issue. And, and you know, honourable member, that I do try to, to be helpful in these debates and where, where appropriate seek to, to find other information. I don't think that information is germane to the bill before us tonight and it's not, certainly not going to change your view and I don't believe it's going to change the views of, of any honourable members here tonight because it's not in the bill before us. The Honourable Nick Garan. Uh, look, that may well be the case, uh, Minister, but I'll make a couple of points. First of all, <coughs> um, I'm not the one who told the House that WA Police have never ref refused that information. No. You, and, and I am, honourable member, but it's certainly asked, asked, asked of me. That's right. Yes. You, you provided that information on the basis of the best information available to you, which I recognise. I'm simply identifying that I understand on information provided to me uh, that that is not correct in the sense, in the sense of 
uh, a constructive refusal in the sense of failure to respond. That's why I took the, the issue up. It wasn't originally one of the questions that I had uh, pursued. Now, in, in terms of Mr Deputy Chairman, um, the suggestion by the minister that it's not germane to the bill, well, we've got a regulatory framework at the moment in Western Australia, and that involves the Public Order and Streets Act of 1984. The contention by the government is that that particular regulatory framework is inadequate, insufficient, uh, to uh, address the, the mischief that the government would like to see fixed. One of the ways in which that can be done is by way of this bill. But at the heart of it is, is there a problem at first instance? Now, in order to know that, we need to be able to ask some constructive questions around the Public Order and Streets Act 1984. I accept that the Minister's not in a position tonight to be able to assist that with, us with that. Um, but I, I do um, refute the contention that it's not germane to the issue. If it's not germane to the issue, why are we here? There's not a problem with the Public Order and Streets Act of 1984. I don't think there is a problem. The government says there is a problem. It's the onus is on the government to provide that information to support their contention. If there's no problem, then there's no need for this bill. Now, apparently the government says this bill is necessary. Uh, that said, um, Mr Deputy Chairman, through you to the uh, Minister. Uh, Minister, I did in hear you indicate earlier to the Honourable Martin Aldridge um, that uh, it was the intention of government, as I understand it, to advise West Australian Police of the locations. Now, I just want to take up two issues here. One is that there was a discussion between you and the Honourable Member of a figure of 45, and then there was also a number of 50. And then there was a breakdown provided of 15 hospitals, 35 general practices and, and, one, and one other. Is there a way that we might be able to, and potentially might even be able to, uh, supply a document? I know, you, and I recognise you've already indicated you can't supply, or not necessarily can't, but at this point not inclined to provide a list of the 35 uh, general practices, and I accept the reason why you've indicated that. Um, irrespective of whether I agree with it or not, I accept that that's where we're at. But is there, is there some form of document that can be provided to the House which sets out the actual number and perhaps the classes or categories that make up that number of locations? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Chair. So, Honourable Member, just back to the conversation that I had with the Honourable um, Martin Aldridge earlier on. Uh, I did advise the House um, that um, if the legislation had been enforced in 2020, the legislation would have applied to 50 premises that notified the Department of Health that they performed abortions. He had recalled a figure of, I think, 40, or which was which was a previous figure. I, I'm further advised that the numbers can change from year to year, and in fact, um, in 2019, there were 46 premises that year that provided the services. I also advised that there were 15 hospitals, um, 34 general practices where, where the, the terminations were, um, uh, the service was, was provided, and one other. I'm not clear what that one other is, and I'm, I'm sure we can investigate that. In terms of a list, though, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not going to provide a list of, um, of the, the general practices where the terminations are provided. Um, I'd also just go back to the, the issue and the fact that 80% you know, of the terminations are provided at two services. Yeah. I'd have to check on it, we'll, and we can we can check that. It may not be not urgent. But no, no. We can we can check what what's captured by that. But certainly, yeah. I mean, the, the hospitals are probably an easy list, and it's probably you know you can, you can kind of guess which hospitals where these services are provided currently. But for yeah, I don't create a problem, another problem, by, from this debate by providing a list when I don't have one. Yeah. General Nick Duran. No, that, that, thank you, Deputy Chairman, and thank you, Minister. No, there's no problem there. So, 
Um, for the purposes of this question, let us say that there are approximately 50 locations. I accept that it can change for the reasons that you've just identified. Now, you mentioned to the Honourable Martin Aldridge that it was the intention of government, as I heard it, that uh, West Australian Police would be advised of those uh, locations. Obviously, if that were to occur, then they would have to be provided in some form of, of a list. That's not what I'm seeking at this time. But you mentioned that the intention was to do so before the bill commences. And I just want to ask you to just take some further advice about that because, as I understand it, the intention is that the bill will commence in, uh, on the day after assent. Um, so is it really the case that we're intending to advise police uh, of the locations you know, as quickly as this week? Minister. Let's be clear. So, the police have already been advised of those facilities where protests take place. That's happened now. In terms of whether there's, a, whether there's, there's the provision of a further list, that is under active consideration at the moment. It hasn't, it, there, there hasn't been protests outside of any of these other places so far. So, it, it's just you know, w whether, whether an, a list needs to be provided given it has been an issue. John Ronick Duran. Yeah, look, I, I guess in a, in a sense it's um, it's a, a, a little pointless to to say that the West Australian Police have been advised of the location of the two clinics because, of course, we recognise that West Australian Police are the ones issuing the permits where the protests are taking place. So uh, it follows that they are already well aware and have been aware for for, for quite some time uh, about that. Now, with regard to the consultation that has ha occurred uh, <coughs> with WA Police, um, uh, is it the case that there is any any document that can be provided to the House? Is there? Yeah. Is it possible to provide any document to the House which um, summarises, provides some information with regard to well, what is it that WA Police have advised? Uh, the authors of this bill. In the construction of this bill, in the drafting and in the preparation of this bill, you indicated that there were these five categories of uh, stakeholders. One of them was West Australian Police. What is it that they have said to, to the government that has assisted in the, in the construction uh, of this bill? Is that able to be provided in any documentary form? Minister. Thanks, Deputy Chair. Unfortunately, I'll remember it's not. So that any any engagement with government agencies as part of this process is captured by the Cabinet and Confidence uh, rules, so I, so I can't provide a document. I will just check as to whether the, in terms of submission was made as part of the process that perhaps I can bring to your attention, so hold that thought for a second. Members, the... Minister. Thanks, Honourable Member. Um, thanks, Deputy Chair. And thank you, Honourable Member. Honourable Member, uh, what I think you're trying to get to, and I'm just trying to tease this out, is you're looking for a document about kind of comments that WA Police made in relation to the, the substance of the bill or indeed how the bill was constructed. So, no, I don't have that information. I, I, what my advisers are bringing to, to my attention is, um, is again, the report the Safe Access Zones a pro a Proposal to Reform in Western Australia Report 2020 and page 20, which talks about police providing information about breaches of permits and, uh, and, and about giving the Department of Health details of police attendance tasks um, 
an offence as recorded at the two facilities. But I, so, so I'll bring that to your attention. But if you're asking for a submission from police or as part of the process, no, I don't have that, and, and it would be captured by Cabinet in confidence. Uh, the Honourable Nick Garan. Thank you, Deputy Chair. So, um, Minister, for example, at page 20 there, um, where it talks about WA Police gave the Department of Health details of 75 police attendance tasks, Department of Health have that in their possession. Is that something that can be tabled? Minister. Thank you. So we're not in a position to, to share the correspondence on the member, but what has been shared is, you know, is, is the interaction with police. And in this document, it, you know, it lists the numbers. And um, but I can't go into any more, any further detail than that. The Honourable Nick Garan. Mm. Well, the, re the reason I ask, uh, Minister, is that you'll see that following on from that, there's spe specific reference to 14 offences recorded at Marie Stopes WA Clinics and Nanyara Medical Group between 2014 and 2019. And that just seems potentially inconsistent with an answer that's been provided earlier, which says that there's been no charges laid against Section 9 of the Public Order in Streets Act of 1984. So what were the nature of these 14 offences? Minister. Thank you, sir. Honourable Member, I can tell you the types of types of things that, that were deemed offences. So there was a, things such as public disorder, disturbance of the peace, uh, assault. However, you are correct in pointing out, as I have previously, that there was no charge as a result of so the police talk about it as an offence, but it wasn't actually a charge wasn't made. Someone wasn't brought to charge as a result of the be, of the behaviour at the time. Um, there is just if you, if you kind of go on to the next sentence here, it does say it was noted that some of these tasks may not be related to demonstrated behaviour. So I think that's a further qualification. So it is, it's, it is kind of unusual and difficult to understand. However, they have, you, you are correct. There have been no charges laid as a result of the offending behaviour, or indeed the uh, the tasks, if you use that word as well. It's, it's really peculiar, um, Minister, because then it even goes on to say the number of tasks recorded, and that's of course a reference to the 75, is also higher than the number of offences recorded, which is of course a reference to the 14. When no criminal activity is uncovered, the incident may be resolved without an offence being recorded. So what that, how I read that is that the 14 is where criminal activity has been uncovered. And the difference between the 75 and the 14 is where criminal activity has not been uncovered. Uh, but 
in the absence of the and, and the Department of Health have this information because we know that it says here WA Police gave Department of Health details of this this information. I uh, I accept that uh, you know you can't um, bring forth. You're in, you're in a, sorry, you're, you're on a, no, a okay. thought plane, but um, so so what police gave health was a chart essentially, a, a, chart, a, a chart, a chart with numbers on it. There was no detail listed about specific cases or anything. Um, so it's kind of high level stuff. What they termed in this document as uh, as an offence, uh, and and, and they, they were those things that I that I alluded to earlier on. So that was the and public disorder, disturbance okay. of the peace, assault. However, the, you know, we're both, well, we, 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 we've both now canvassed the fact that there were no charges laid as a result of it. So obviously it's a case of terminology that the police use, um, but it, they didn't actually, they didn't charge someone as a result of that offence. Yes, and um, so further to that, um, Mr Chairman, um, through you to the Minister, uh, is this chart available? Minister. Thank you. So no, it's not. It was it was provided. It was provided to the agency in confidence, knowing that the that, that some of the numbers out of it could be put into this document, but it's not it's not available publicly. And and, and, and remember, as as we know from from this place ordinarily, and I think there were some questions in question time today, the, the operational detail from the police is is, ne is is not disclosed to Parliament, but just the high level stuff. Often is. Gentleman at ground. Now, um, there is reference then, of course, to the capacity for the uh, police to issue um, uh, move on notices um, or what is referred to as a move on order. Um, does WA, uh, sorry, does the Department of Health have at its disposal information from WA Police as to the extent to which? Uh, move on orders have been provided. Minister. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, Chair. So, honourable member, we don't have um, the, kind of the, the granular detail in relation to, to your question. Uh, I am advised, though, um, that DOH are aware that in the last year, for example, no move on notices were issued. Um, I do have some information to provide as to why police. Um, cannot use move on notices. So I'm told the anti abortion protest activity is a weekly occurrence outside the main abortion services in WA. The move on powers under the Criminal Investigation Act 2008 only provides the police with very limited ability to deal with the type of behaviours outside those health services, um, a behaviour that we heard about from so many people during the community consultation process. Um, therefore, those powers do not prevent protection, provide protection for women and staff from harassment as they try to enter or leave an abortion clinic. It is our understanding that the police uh, rarely use move-on notices outside those services, which for itself demonstrates that this enforcement power, whilst could be used in some circumstances, is currently not suitable to address the broad range of anti-abortion activity that targets patients and staff at abortion clinics. Move-on notices are only valid for a period of 24 hours or less. Also, this tool is a reactive one. By the time that those notices could be given by a police officer, the specific harassment of some patients or staff was already done. And so there's a clear need for new regulatory tools that will be efficient in deterring those behaviours to prevent them from occurring. So, Minister, is, is it the intention of this bill that um, there will be then the capacity for the, the government, uh, sorry, for the police to deal with situations where a person is hindering or obstructing?
Minister. Honourable Member, you're not, you're not solely referring to move on notices, are you? Minister. Obviously, police can use move on notices, you know, still if this bill passes or whatever. But what this bill before us uh, makes clear is that without reasonable excuse. So I'll draw, draw your attention back to 202P again, page 4, which talks about a person not engaging in prohibited behaviour in the zone, etc. And then for the purposes of that, a person engages in prohibited behaviour if they do certain things. But the bill makes clear that. Um, Certain things can happen, you know, without if, if the person doesn't have a reasonable excuse or interferes with or impedes a footpath, road, or vehicle in relation to abortion, um, or um, without reasonable excuse makes a recording by any means of another person accessing, attempting to access, or leaving premises at which abortions are provided without the other person's consent. So the move on notice stuff stays the same. But what this makes clear is what the, the new offence is. The Honourable Nick Graham. Yes, um, perhaps the, the best way to, to consider it is this way, Minister, is, is if somebody is at the front of an abortion clinic and they are hindering or obstructing a person going about their otherwise lawful business, will that behaviour be captured by this bill? Minister. Thank you. So yes, it would. The Honourable McGrath. And I take it, Minister, that that is because the definition of prohibited behaviour includes at proposed section 202P2A the notion of hindering and obstructing. Minister. Thank you. So the answer is yes, Honourable Member. Gentleman Graham. Now, um, Minister, is it the case that uh, WA Police can currently uh, issue a move on order uh, for a person hindering and obstructing? Minister. Uh, yes, Honourable Member, you are correct. I think you're probably uh, quoting from the Criminal Investigation Act 2006, I guess. But what the bill before us does, it makes it clear. That what, what the what, what the um, uh, well, not what the problem is, but um, what the obstruction is, and, it, and, it, and the bill before us now clarifies that when somebody is seeking to lawfully access an abortion service and somebody does X Y Z before it, um, you know, in front of them or to stop them, it, that makes that an offence. The honourable Nick Graham. Well, let's have a look at. Um, 
proposed section 202p, subsection 2. It says for the purposes of subsection 1, that is, that a person must not engage in prohibited behaviour, a person engages in prohibited behaviour if the person A besets, harasses, intimidates, interferes with, threatens, hinders, obstructs, they're the two terms we're dealing with at the moment, or impedes a person accessing, attempting to access, or leaving premises at which abortions are provided. And then it goes on to say or, and it gives a whole range of other things. Now the, the, the other matters, the subclauses B, C, D and E, are of no relevance to, to this particular discussion because if police, under the existing law or under this law, come to the conclusion that a person has hindered or obstructed, there's only one place they can go and that's section 202p 2a. They can't go anywhere else, that's the only place that they can then prosecute the offence. And my point is this, Minister, is that the WA Police have told Health that they haven't issued any um, move-on orders, despite the fact that they can issue a move-on order if a person has been hindering and obstructing. Now, what that makes me think is that there's two scenarios here. Most charitably, to the people who are involved in this activity outside of the abortion clinic, it could mean that there simply has been no instances of hindering and obstructing. I have to say I heavily lean towards that interpretation of things from the information that I've been provided. <clears throat> Nevertheless, let's say that I'm wrong about that and that there has been, on one or more occasions, instances where people have been hindering and obstructing. Now remember, I emphasise at this point my second reading speech. I believe it is a right of every Western Australian to be able to go about their lawful business unimpeded by the people. So I've got no interest, none whatsoever, of defending anyone who is busy hindering and obstructing another Western Australian going about their lawful business. None whatsoever. So I emphasise that. My point is this, Minister, is if Western Australian police at the moment are not, are not using the move on orders as they have said to the Department of Health, then that suggests that there is no hindering and obstructing going on. Or, worse, there's a problem, they can't actually prove that people are hindering and obstructing and this law is not going to make any difference. So my question to you is, what confidence we, can we have when it comes to the hindering and obstructing of people going about their lawful business that this particular bill will make any difference. Now, what, what I want to avoid is a discussion about the range of other things that this bill does. I'm not talking about that. I'm only talking about hindering and obstructing. And really at the heart of my question is to what extent then is this necessary or will it make any difference when it comes to hindering and obstructing? Minister. I'd like to think I'm an eternal optimist, honourable member, and you know, I'd like to rely on the, the advisors when they give me advice about about certain legislation. But certainly in the bill before us, what it does do is it makes clear that it is an offence when someone hinders, obstructs, um, while someone is attempting to access or leaving premises at which abortions are provided. Now, I wasn't here, and you probably weren't here either, when the, the legislation that, that we've referred to previously was debated in this place. I'm not sure if it's, you know, society up to now has has deemed that society society up to now has deemed that it's, you know, these things uh, were okay. That you know, someone could lawfully stand in the way of somebody else and hand them something or talk to them or give them information before they went to access abortion services. What we are making clear though now with the bill before us is that in future should that happen, and if somebody is leaving uh, an abortion clinic or is trying to access an abortion clinic, then the bill before us makes it clear that if you obstruct or hinder a person who's going about their business, it's an offence. And that wasn't clear or spelt out in the previous acts that we've referred to. Thanks, Mr uh, Chairman. Uh, Minister, I might take this up when we get to Clause 4. Uh, I look forward, like, can I say, generally look forward to clause four. Yeah, look, I think I'll take it up when we get to clause four, um, and maybe that also gives government uh, the opportunity to consider if there are any um, 
ancillary advisors that might be able to assist with respect to these matters, because. Yeah, but just, I, I, want, I just want to, um, uh, if you like, uh, provide effectively a question on notice because uh, the concern I have, Minister, is that the existing Western Australian law, that is the Criminal Investigations Act of 2006, already deals with this issue of hindering and obstructing. And I'm not at all clear how this is going to make anything, anything any different. That said, um, when we get to clause four, um, you, you might be in a position to just take us through then what will be the difference between a police officer deciding to proceed with an offence under this section, that is 202p, or choosing to issue a move on order? Because you've indicated that it will still be available to police to be able to issue a move on order. So why would a police officer proceed with a prosecution under 202p2, which frankly will take much more time and be much more costly than issuing a move on uh, order. That's the kind of information that I'd be looking for when we get to clause four. Now, that said, um, let's return um, forthwith to clause one. And um, Minister, there, there were a number of um, other issues in the discussion paper that were raised by the uh, submissions. <clears throat> now, one of them you were uh, addressing uh, with uh, the Honourable Leader of the Daylight Savings Party earlier, and uh, you indicated uh, uh, to him that it had been the decision of the government to proceed uh, along the lines of the Victorian legislation. I think, in fact, according to my notes, you referred to it being modelled on the Victorian legislation. Now, I noticed in this report that you kindly tabled earlier at uh, page two, which interestingly doesn't have a page number, but it is page two, that there it, re it references that the definition of prohibited behaviour should be modelled on Victoria's definition of prohibited behaviour in its Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008. Now, I don't want to, in Clause 1, now be having a discussion about prohibited behaviour. We'll deal with that under, cl under Clause 4. But my question is, is that the extent to which this legislation is modelled on the Victorian law? Is, it, is, it, is the modelling of our law limited to the definition of prohibited behaviour, or is it is it more than that? Minister. Thank you. So I'm, I, I am told that the bill is generally based on the Victorian model, honourable member. Um, so the purpose and definition of the bill are the same. Um, 
Obviously, we've spoken previously, or the, the Chamber has spoken previously, about the Victorian legislation being subject to a High Court challenge in Club versus Edwards, and that uh, in April 2019, the High Court delivered its decision on two, on, the, on two challenges to the constitutional validity of legislation establishing safe access zones in Victoria and in Tasmania. Um, the majority of the High Court dismissed the constitutional challenge to the Victorian legislation. Um, the High Court held that both Victorian and Tasmanian legislation burdened the implied freedom of political communication. However, in both cases, it was considered that the burden was justified by reference to the legitimate purposes of the legislation. And so our bill was um, carefully drafted to minimise any risk of being inconsistent with the Constitution, and therefore the Victorian bill was the one that was modelled. Thank you, Chairman. So, Minister, the purpose and definition in particular have been modelled on the uh, Victorian uh, legislation. Has, um, to what extent has there been any guidance taken from the other jurisdictions when you in, uh, listed the categories of stakeholders that have been uh, consulted? You mentioned WAPOL, you mentioned the government departments, you mentioned clinics, you mentioned the discussion paper. And you also mentioned the uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, what has been learnt from the other jurisdictions that has then been incorporated into the drafting of this bill? If I can draw your attention again to the report that I tabled earlier this evening, Safe Access Zones, a proposal for a in Western Australia, report number 20, 2020, report 2020. Um, page 43 of that report um, gives, Appendix 1 gives an Australian jurisdictional comparison of the legislation in the very different states. Um, so we have, we have looked at the legislation and, and, and conversed with the various jurisdictions about their legislation. Um, we have also spoken to the other jurisdictions um, in relation to the effect of their legislation and whether it's actually had an impact on, uh, on these protests that were taking place before. And I think at this stage we, we had been advised that the protests had stopped and, and, you know, and the, the advice was that the, this bill, the bills in those jurisdictions had caused protests to stop in those states. Um, we have though, as I said, modelled our legislation on the Victorian legislation, but there are similarities in some of the some of the areas. Um, so you know, and but you can see without going through all the detail, you can see uh, each of those jurisdictions there. There's a range of issues that have been established, and you can kind of go across the list and see that the the, um, the similarities between the, each, each of the pieces of legislation. Now, uh, Minister, when we say that the other jurisdictions have said that the protests have stopped, this thing gets to the, the heart of the type of behaviour that might be captured by this bill and other behaviour that, that might not be captured by this bill. Um, when we're talking about uh, protests, um, it, it would assist if it, for example, is, has any document been provided by these other jurisdictions that um, might be able to be tabled at this time so that we can clarify exactly what they mean when they say that the protests have stopped? For example, if when we talk about protests we're talking about despicable behaviour like spitting, then I'm glad that these things have stopped and they should have never have happened in the first place. 
and I, I still think that there are other laws, uh, for example, the law of assault, that can capture those things. But nevertheless, if the other jurisdictions are saying that the mere presence of this legislation has ensured that that type of behaviour has stopped, then that's, that's, that is welcome news. Um, but I don't actually consider spitting to be protesting. Uh, I think it's a completely different uh, set of circumstances. So that's why I would seek some clarification as to what the other jurisdictions are saying with regard to protesting. Because the types of people that I am actually concerned about with regard to this whole debate are the peaceful individuals that are there to genuinely provide compassionate support in the event there's a, um, a Western Australian woman with an unwanted or unexpected pregnancy who just wants somebody to walk the journey with them. That's the only person that I'm actually concerned about with regard to this legislation. I'd like to have some confidence that that person is not being captured by this legislation. I'd be interested to know to what extent that that discussion has occurred between the Department of Health and the other jurisdictions, if at all, and if there is a capacity to table anything that has come out from the other jurisdictions. Minister. Thank you. So I can't comment on the particular circumstance that you've raised, but I will draw your attention to the fact that um, this captures um, communications um, in, relation to, in relation to abortion in a, in a manner that is able to be seen or heard by a person um, accessing, attempting to access um, or leaving premises at which abortions are provided and reasonably likely to cause distress or anxiety. Now, if the situation that you described wasn't causing ang um, anxiety or distress, it wouldn't be captured by this legislation that's before us. It needs to meet that threshold. In terms of have we got a document from those other states and territories, we don't. It's been, but it's been conversations between the jurisdictions. Uh, in terms of protests, and that was the, the words that the advisers gave me, but it, it, it's, I think what was meant by it is the offending behaviour, the, the, beha the offending behaviour that's captured by the legislation that's before us, so that's probably a better, better terminology, better terminology to use than protest, which I think, when you use that word, you, you know, it connotes particular things. I think you make an excellent point, um, Minister, because um, uh, you know the offending behaviour. Um, I think that there there is a spectrum of views as to what the offending behaviour is, um, from you know the most abhorrent. Of behaviour, and we've discussed some of those examples earlier, to uh, what is otherwise what I would describe as genuine, caring, compassionate support. And uh, regrettably, there is a spectrum, um, and uh, I think that one side of that spectrum needs to be uh, protected. And I just want to make sure that that's not considered to be offending uh, behaviour or indeed offensive. Uh, behaviour in any way, but I, th I suspect that we'll be able to um, uh, unpack that uh, further in uh, Clause 4. So uh, I think, Minister, then really um, there's only a couple more questions that I have with respect to Clause 1. One is um, whether the government have or will be providing any additional uh, resources for the enforcement of these new laws. Minister. Thank you. Uh, so the, the police have not indicated that they need extra resources to be able to, to police uh, this legislation should pass. Of course, it's worth, um, I guess, reminding the House about the McGowan government's significant increase in the numbers of police officers at Waipole. And so an extra 950 police are entering the system. Um, you know, have started to enter the system and enter the system over the next few years. So yeah, we don't believe extra resources will be required. Bearing in mind, you know, it, well, at least in some of these cases, police are attending a situation anyway. However, it's something that will be monitored, and should there be the need, well, obviously, then, then would um, police would seek 
through the normal course of the budgetary process, police would, would come back to ERC and seek extra resources. And um, Minister, is there a particular unit within WA Police that, uh, that handles uh, these type of matters or is it just dealt with at a, a local um, station matter? I mean, when we're talking about the two clinics, obviously um, I think it's Midland and Belmont are the ones that, that spring to mind. Are they then expected to deal with these particular laws or is there a unit within WA Police that we're handling it? Minister. Thank you. Look, my understanding is it is the local, the local um, stations that deal with this stuff, but I am happy to, um, to take the issue on notice and perhaps I can provide an answer to the House in relation to that tomorrow, just to clarify that that is exactly the case. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Minister, I think that would be helpful because I guess um, uh, at the heart of all of this, and you know, certainly for those who are um, enthusiasts for this legislation, they want to have con con um, confidence that it will actually be enforced. And if Western Australian Police at the moment are already saying that they are not uh, using some of the existing mechanisms, for example, uh, move on orders, which would be enforced by local police stations, then it's not clear why there would suddenly be this confidence uh, that those same police officers, that those police, same police stations would uh, now be uh, proceeding uh, with these matters. Uh, but you've indicated that you might uh, be able to get some information about that overnight, so we'll consider that again tomorrow. Um, the other matter I wanted to ask, Minister, with respect to uh, Clause 1, is that <clears throat> there are a number of things that flow from this uh, uh, initial discussion uh, paper in, in particular, which led to Report uh, 2020. Um, Obviously, one of those things is this legislation and this bill. Uh, does the government have plans to, uh, to implement or to address some of the other matters that arise from this review? example of some of those other issues that you have been flagged that you think need action on? Yeah. Mr Chairman. You're on the Thank you. Um, uh, Minister, for example, um, approximately 500 of the submissions, you'll, you'll recall that in the language that the Department of Health used throughout this document is that they regularly refer to uh, the numbers in approximate terms. Uh, approximate fi approximately 500 of the submissions uh, received in response to the discussion paper discussed how some women are forced, manipulated and coerced into the decision of having an abortion, and approximately 250 submissions suggested better holistic counselling and support for patients to be made available. That's a couple of examples of things that I wonder if the uh, department has already addressed or is planning to address in due course. Minister. Thank you. Um, so what I can say is that um, obviously the submissions have been received and have been noted. Uh, the various issues that have come up uh, in those other submissions uh, continue to be under consideration uh, by the department. The Honourable Nick Okay. 
I'll, I'll move to the next area, uh, Minister. I'll make this observation. Um, the department have had plenty of time to consider these things. So, um, the greatest respect has an extraordinary 18 months over the last year, and this this agency has been the agency that has been responsible for dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So I hear what you're saying, and I hear your frustration, but a few other things have been happening at the same time. All right. Well, I would accept that. I would accept that, Minister, if I had confidence that the same people that are responsible for these things are the same ones dealing with COVID-19. That. What's actually happened across the People have been dragged from all sorts of areas yes. into focusing on COVID-19. Right. That's happened in health and it's happened in a variety of agencies around so, government. So, as I say, if I, if I had confidence that the same, one and the same people that were dealing with this matter are also the ones that have been seconded elsewhere for COVID-19 purposes, then I would say that that's fair enough. I, I, I personally don't have that confidence, but nevertheless I accept that that's um, where things sit for the purposes of this evening's debate. Can I just ask, um, uh, Minister, with regard to the consultation, and you did helpfully set out the, the five classes or groups of consultation and the stakeholders that were involved, I thought it was curious that in none of that was a discussion around the people who this is actually trying to address. So I don't like calling them demonstrators because the, the people that I know and have seen are not what I would describe as demonstrators, but I accept that some of the language that's been used has also been re referenced to protesters and the like. Uh, as I say, the people that I know are caring, compassionate individuals who just want to provide support if, if there is an interest in a person journeying with them. I just find it curious that it doesn't appear that there's been any consultation with, with, with those people. Um, is there a particular reason why there's been no consultation, or might they have been consulted but they've been overlooked from the earlier list? Minister, thank you. No, you've, you've, you've made the point. Um, so. Those people, I'm not going to call them demonstrators or protesters, but those people who stand outside and you know, try to um, discourage people from accessing abortion services or whatever, that there was an opportunity during the, the um, consultation process, and those organisations did provide a um, many of the, m many organisations who probably are aligned to these people or these people are aligned to. Did actually get an did actually get the opportunity to to submit. Most submissions were canvassed and considered, as every other submission was made. But government did make a decision that 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 that, that activity was wrong, and that where they were you know where they were affecting somebody else who was um, mm. trying to access lawful services, mm. and it was distressing those people. Uh, that 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 was wrong, and that needed to change. And so you know, so fundamentally. We're opposed to that activity where it affects or causes anxiety for someone who's lawfully seeking to access services, and so uh, there was no further uh, element of consultation. Now, in terms of your earlier comment, uh, I have been provided um, some further information. There is a WA Women's Health and Wellbeing Policy, and prior, prior, priority area B of that health and wellbeing impacts of gender based violence includes any act of violence that causes or could cause physical, sexual, psychological harm or suffering to women, including threats of harm or coercion in public or in private life. And the policy includes several actions to address the issue. The Department of Health also provides guidance, resources and training to WA Health staff in the area of family domestic violence and gender-based violence or honour-based violence, including coercion. The Department of Health is also updating its guidelines, abortion care for medical practitioners, information and legal ob obligations to include advice that medical practitioners performing abortions should consider uh, an appropriate environment for assessing the pregnant woman to ensure as far as possible that no coercion or pressure is being applied. Yeah. Uh, Minister, that, 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 on the face of it, from what I heard quickly there, sounds excellent. Um, are you able to, uh, to table that um, policy document, if it is a policy document? Is there a way that we can uh, access that? The, uh, while you're taking advice on that, I mean, 
the, the idea that there is now going to be an obligation on the abortion providers to actually ask and make sure that there is no coercion, I think, frankly, is long overdue. So if this is a new development, uh, I think it's a, a welcome one, but I'd like an opportunity to be able to uh, assess it if it is in a uh, format that can be tabled. Minister. Thanks very much, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so in relation to that WA Women's Health and Wellbeing Policy, I I'm advised it is a public document and so I can, um, I can seek to get a copy of that and provide it tomorrow to you. Okay. Members, the question is clause one to stand as printed. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you very much. No, it's been a long night and I uh, would ask for your uh, uh, Grace, in uh, continuing, continuing on just a little bit longer, if possible. <laughs> I bet, I bet. Uh, in, in the uh, second clause debate, there was some discussion or some, uh, I think um, the Honourable Martin Pritchard mentioned that, second reading, thank you, second reading, um, talked about that the idea of this was to not set, harass, intimidate, interfere with, threaten, hinder, obstructs, impedes, etc which is all captured in that second clause there. But further, it goes on to say that and says um, it, it can't be communicated to by means in relation to an abortion matter, that it can't be seen or heard. So that does seem to be a little bit different to the section A, and I know that we're not talking about the specifics of the clauses just at the moment, but in terms of a principle, it is the case, is it not, that really that this legislation is, and I think you, the, uh, the Minister actually just outlined in, in a previous answer pretty much what the position was, that even a person who is not harassing or seen to be what we would generally know as harassing, pursuing, intimidating, etc., hinders or obstructing, even just say a person standing there with a pamphlet would in fact be breaching this new law. Order, members, um, on that note, I'm going to interrupt proceedings to report progress. President, committee, the Committee of the Whole has considered the Public Health Amendment Safe Access Zones Bill 2021 made progress and seeks to sit again. President. Uh, the Minister for Mental Health. I move, that the, I move that the report be adopted. Members, the question is the report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, members noting the time, we will move to members' statements. Are there any members' statements? Uh, I'll give the call to the Honourable Aeol Makur Chuat. On Sunday, the 2020 Olympic ended, and the organisers are to be commended for making these games remarkable for our community. Australia are very proud. The Australian Olympic campaign has been the most successful one for 2021. But even outside the medal win, these games have been very uplifting for our community. On show, sheer grit and determination and a heartwarming friendship of our athletics. It was something special to see. So the diversity of the Australian team Today, in thankfulness, the Australian Olympic spirit and the thriving multiculturalism, I would like to give acknowledgement to my close person in the community, Peter Ball, and also the Australian favourite um, athlete who has made us very proud. At the Olympic team, Peter Ball 
broke his own local, um, local record in the 800, 800 meters semi-final. In the men 800 meters, Peter Bull had qualified for the first since 1968. He came forth and his achievement was celebrating, was celebrated by our nation. A little bit about Peter Bull. He, he was born in Khartoum in South Sudan, in Sudan. His mother, Anan Kuku, is a South Sudanese Nubian. And father, Abdallah, is, is also a South Sudanese. Due to civil war, Peter have the same story as me. Um, he went to Egypt in 1998 and stayed in refugee camp before coming to Australia in 2004. On a normal visa, humanitarian visa, as a migrant, first, him and his family lived in Tromba in Queensland, where his dad worked on a farm. And then when he moved to Perth, um, they were very lucky and they found many opportunities and that include his father. Peter career started with him being supported by the community and of course the blessing of his parents. At the age of 16, a teacher from school learned Peter's ability to run fast through another student on the sport carnival. She encouraged and asked Peter to run a 400 meter and 800 meter which luckily um, Peter done a very incredible job and he won. Helen's father, Brian Moore, became Peter mentor and buying him sports shoes for his first um, ever exciting running and enroll him in, in the athletic club. Later on, he helped him to find him a national competition club. And then later on in 2015, Peter moved to Perth to, uh, from Melbourne, from Perth to Melbourne, to train under a very um, successful coach called Justin Rinaldi, where um, he trained for the 800 meter. In a short time, he had accelerated, accelerated in his sport and in, competi and in competing in a world championship in 2016. He went to Rio and ran for that Olympic in 2016. And now, with Tokyo being over, Peter, I'm sure his main focus is to make sure that he's gonna break a brilliant record for Australian Olympic in 2024 in Paris. Along with his accomplishments, Peter has a degree um, in construction management and is planning to become an engineer in the future. He's also an ambassador for pushing barriers, and that pushing barrier is um, a non profit organization which helps refugees by providing opportunities for youth um, in helping them with the fund that include them in the Australian society through sport. Peter Ball journey is a wonderful example for our community and the gift that comes from embracing the multiculturalism in our community. The value of diversity is very important and in our society. It is a social and economic. When a government and the private sectors are not profit organizations provide opportunities for refugees and immigrants in our community, the benefits are greater for many. When children are involved in development program through sports, the art and technology, it is a result in participation and representation in the community and in the workforce. If we strategically um, invest in our children from a refugee background and immigrant backgrounds in the school system and outside this, this, um, the school system, they will become the contributors and the leaders of our, our future in the community. They will know their matters, they belong, and they have possibilities. They will become the pride of the community, like Peter Ball, inspired a nation, Australian nation, and all around the world. May I congratulate Peter Ball, you are a champion. 
for all the Australians. I wish you many blessings, as I too wish all the Australian Olympians the very best in their future. I congratulate all of you for all the great accomplishments that you have achieved. You have done us proud as Australian, and together we give plenty to be thankful for. Thank you. Thank you, President. Yeah. The Honourable Peter Collier. And tonight to make some comments with regard to a growing issue in the police force with uh, first responders and also with veterans, and that is uh, growing mental health issues. And uh, appropriate re um, uh, support mechanisms that exist uh, to uh, assist with those, uh, those wonderful individuals. Now, yesterday, the police commissioner and the police minister held a forum, constituted a forum, specifically dealing with this issue. And I'll take the words of the commissioner himself, where he said, where it said, speaking at a police mental health forum today, Commissioner Dawson promised to look for more ways to support officers. I call this forum today because clearly we've lost two officers in the last month, he said. I wanted to know what we are doing, are there any gaps in what we're doing, or is there, or is there more that we can do? Um, I applaud the Commissioner and the Police Minister for um, organising that forum. It is, vitally, uh, it is vital, it is needed, it is necessary, and it is getting to the point um, where um, um, more support is needed. And I've got a solution, and it is called Soldiers and Sirens. Now, the Soldiers and Sirens program is a program that was uh, that was organised and instituted over three years ago, and I'll talk about that one in a moment. Uh, but uh, it was set up by, it's a wonderful program, it was set up by uh, some um, former police officers to address the mental health issues experienced throughout the multi-uniform community. So it deals with PTSD, depression, anxiety, stress, and it does through, through a range of, uh, a range of um, strategies, President. Uh, psychological assistance, peer support, mental health interventions. Now, the program itself, I've done an enormous amount of research on this over the last couple of months in particular, and I will seek to table this document at the end of my contribution, President, and that gives a, a thorough outline of um, Soldiers and Sirens. It is a wonderful program. It goes through everything that they do, uh, everything that they do all, the support, uh, for, uh, all the support structures that they have in place, the mechanisms, and what they've done to assist literally hundreds and hundreds of uh, police officers serving and retired, um, first responders and also veterans. Unfortunately, President, it has run out of funding. The funding stopped on the 31st of July, so it is no longer e exists. Now, I take it uh, on board that uh, the grant, the original grant came from the federal government in 2018. I will say to, um, to members, I have been in contact with my federal colleagues, I'll continue to be in contact with my federal colleagues to get them to do all that they possibly can to continue to support this program. I've met with uh, the founder, Danielle uh, Baldock, and the CEO, Terence Cook, and we went through the processes of various ways we could potentially find funding. And this is where I'm calling on the state government to seriously consider funding this program. It's about a million dollars per annum, um, and quite frankly, a significant cohort of those that have, uh, that have been supported by this wonderful program are within the state jurisdiction. Police officers, um, uh, first responders. And it is really, really important these people get this support, uh, this support from, um, from soldiers and sirens. Now, um, I, um, as I said, I think that this program is magnificent. As I said, you're talking about hundreds upon hundreds of people that feel that they, they can't go anywhere within the current structures of their organisation. They feel that um, Soldiers and Sirens is organised and, and operated by people that have been there at the coalface. They're people that have been in uniform. They will listen to them. Uh, they'll be honest with them. They'll be empathetic with them. They'll be supportive with them. And it's not just what I've heard from Danielle and Terence. It's the research that I've done, and I've spoken to a number of former officers and a number of other um, um, uniformed personnel that have actually been um, the recipients of the support mechanisms provided by, by um, soldiers and sirens. And in fact, the minister himself acknowledges that I asked one, one of the questions I've asked with regard to this issue was last week, when I said, will the minister commit to funding soldiers and sirens in order for this essential service provider to continue to support many Western Australian police veterans and the other first responders? 
His response in part, because it was quite lengthy, but in part said, the Western Australian Police Force advises that officers are able to access private psychological and psychiatric support services from select preferred, preferred providers. Soldiers and Sirens was one preferred provider among a network of other providers that were able to encompass the additional capacity to ensure that all officers have access to support as required. So the minister himself acknowledges that it was a preferred provider. That is before the funding stopped. Now, having said that, President, I have spoken to a number of people. One of, that I spoke to, which was an extraordinarily um, difficult conversation, was with the wife of an officer who took his life just over a month ago. And I'll have more to say about her um, in uh, the week ahead. Having said that, it was, um, she's extremely traumatised. She's a strong advocate for soldiers and sirens. Um, she really wants to uh, prosecute an argument to ensure that the funding for soldiers and sirens is returned. But I will also take um, uh, read into the chamber, um, President, the comments of two other former police serving officers, both female. Um, the, the emails themselves are quite lengthy, so I'll, I'll just read parts of them that are relevant. Um, I have sought the permission of both of these individuals to read this into the chamber and to go public. Um, but um, uh, on, the, uh, on the understanding that they remain anon anonymous. Um, in one of the former officers states, in part, to be honest, most of my waypole related problems stem from the complete lack of debriefing and support after critical incidents. The incidents themselves were obviously the catalyst, but the feelings were all around being completely deserted, not supported, a feeling of having no worth at all as a result of the job that we did, the time and effort we put in and the things that we missed out on with our family and friends for the job, a feeling of being completely let down by those who were supposed to ensure our safety. Danielle was able to understand me and my specific type of problems because she has been a police officer. She understands the culture, the hierarchy, the accountability that most people have no idea about. I didn't have the work to waste time explaining acronyms to her or the intricacies of the job. As a serving police officer, apart from not being able to get counselling when you directly ask for it, there is also the fear of obtaining counselling through APOL counsellors, as there is the fear that if they deem you a risk, your gun will be taken off you. Without your gun, you're not operational, and without being operational, you're not really a copper. With soldiers and sirens, there is a sterile corridor, and it goes on. It's quite compelling. Another um, such response um, from another former so uh, serving police officer states, in part, then one day I came across soldiers and sirens. Their point of difference and why they are such a vital service is that all of their counselling staff and psychologists are ex-servicemen and women of our, or, or first responders. To know you are seeing someone who knows, Someone who is one of your own, who has seen what you have seen, understands the culture and trauma experienced, knowing you don't have to explain anything other than actually working through your trauma. I referred a number of colleagues and friends through the service in both defence and policing, all had a very positive feedback. We need to do better with our treatment of those who protect our communities. We need more secure funding for soldiers and sirens to enable them to expand, not let them fade away. The fact that such vital service was unable to secure funding is abhorrent. So, as I said, they're just a couple of examples, President, that of people that have actually experienced or benefited from the services provided uh, by uh, soldiers and sirens. In essence, um, so many police and uh, first responders and veterans um, are suffering in silence. Um, they witness trauma, in some instances on a daily basis, and they have to, that the mind is such a battlefield, and they have to deal with these problems in a lot of instances by themselves. Now, this organisation is providing and has provided, sorry, up until the 31st of July, very, very valuable support services for hundreds upon hundreds of these individuals. And I think at the moment, when the government does have um, you know, quite a sizeable surplus, I think $1 million per annum, or even half of that, to at least uh, get it operational again, is money well spent. You won't find any of those people that have uh, accessed the services of these people that would say soldiers and, service, uh, soldiers and sirens is not worthwhile. And I'll leave to finish with a, uh, with a um, comment from the minister from yesterday's forum, and he stated in the, uh, yesterday's Western Australia, uh, today's Western Australia, when he said, speaking today, Police Minister uh, Paul Papalia said that the stigma around seeking help needed to end. It is a natural consequence of being a police officer that you will confront traumatic, challenging environments, and over the course of your career, these may result in injuries, both physical and psychological, he said. It's vital that we do everything we possibly can to support our police officers. Hear, hear. I totally agree. So I will continue to advocate for the federal government. 
to, to my, uh, my uh, colleagues in the federal government to see if we can get some money from there. But as I've said, a significant a majority of the cohort of the individuals that access soldiers and sirens are police officers and, fir and first responders, which come under the jurisdiction of the state government. Can I urge the commissioner, can I urge the police minister, please reconsider this and provide some valuable funding to soldiers and sirens so that they can continue with their magnificent work. The Honourable Dan Caddy. Uh, thank you, President. Members, Friday of last week I had the very special privilege of speaking at the unveiling of the memorial to the USS Bullhead. For reference, the USS Bullhead was a Balio-class submarine, an American submarine, which departed Fremantle Harbour on July 31st, 1945, for what would be its final patrol. Fremantle Harbour was the largest submarine base in the Southern Hemisphere during the Second World War and the second largest um, submarine, Allied submarine base in the Pacific Theatre after Pearl Harbour. The USS Bullhead's final patrol was to be of the waters of the Java Sea and lasted only seven days. It was sunk after brief contact with a Japanese aircraft on the very day that the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, just days before the end of the war. The USS Bullhead was the last US naval vessel to be lost during the war, hence its significance. There were 85 casualties of that. 84 service personnel on board and the boat's previous commanding officer Walter T. Griffith, who had stayed on shore for this patrol and never really fully recovered from the loss of his entire crew and the fact that he wasn't on board. And in 1966, then Rear Admiral Griffith took his own life, the 85th member of the crew of the USS Bullhead, to die as a result of that action in August 1945. I did rise to speak today about what's happened in more recent times, but the history I've outlined is important to provide context. Three years ago, I met a very impressive and driven individual, Mr Tim Baldock. Tim was, still is, an amateur military historian and had just completed his first book, Fortress Fremantle, an exceptional book on the importance of Fremantle Harbour to the Second World War. Tim was also focused on having a memorial to the USS Bullhead built uh, somewhere at Fremantle Harbour, and he made it his mission to see that this would happen. Members, this, this is not simply a memorial to 80, 85 lives lost uh, during and after the war. This particular memorial stands for and represents so much more. 70 years after the creation of the ANZUS Treaty, um, the treaty that remains the foundation of our security relationship, standing so, uh, shoulder to shoulder with the United States, the USS Bullhead Memorial demonstrates the qualities and the commitment that is needed to not only defend our nation, but to unite an alliance. The memorial will stand as a constant reminder of the efforts of the US Navy during the Second World War and the strength, more importantly, of the alliance, which continues to this day. The relationship between our state and the United States in the military realm is a special one. Members may not know, but there is only one naval memorial memorial at Arlington Cemetery in Washington that is not for an American vessel. It is the memorial for the HMAS Perth. But back to Tim, because it's, it's him and his efforts that I want to point to and congratulate in the strongest terms tonight. He had been helped along the way by several others, including someone known to many in this place, Sean Lestrange, and also the Office of the US Consul General, two people who I would single out for their help. But it is to Tim and to the Baldock family that I want to say congratulations and thank you. Thank you on a, at a personal level for allowing me to speak at the dedication of the memorial, but more importantly, thank you for your vision and your drive and your hard work in making the USS Bullhead Memorial now standing proudly outside the Fremantle Maritime Musician, uh, Museum <laughs> a reality. This would never have happened without the work and determination of Tim and of the Baldock family, and they should be immensely proud. Uh, the Honourable Peter Collier, I understand uh, you have... Sorry, President, yes. Um, I did mention in my contribution that I would seek leave to table a document, capability statement from Soldiers and Sirens. It just gives an outline of the program. Um, um, members, the Honourable Member seeks leave to table that document. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. You. The Honourable Brad Pettit. Thank you. Thank you, President. This is the IPC release, what was perhaps the most important report of the year, if not the decade. 
Eight years in the making, 234 leading scientists reviewing 14,000 climate change research papers. And I expect many of you here are already across this, so I won't go through too much of the detail, but I think it is worth summarising very quickly that what this report talks about is that climate change is first, happening more quickly than thought. Humans are the primary cause. And I think the West, the front page of West Australian kind of summed that up um, very well today. That business as usual will see us exceed 1.5 degrees within a decade and well above two degrees this century. But importantly, and this is a bit I want, is that there is, is also a, a, some hope in this, in the sense that it actually says there is still a window available for us to, to avoid climate breakdown, but it's rapidly closing. Only rapid and drastic reductions in, in greenhouse gas emissions in this decade can prevent such climate breakdown, with every fraction of a degree of further heating likely to compound the, the accelerating effects. That's not me saying that. That's not the Greens saying that. That's the International Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading authority on climate science saying that. This report is a code red for humanity. The alarm bells are deafening. The, effort, the evidence is irrefutable. Greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel burning and deforestation are choking our planet and putting billions of people at immediate risk. There must be no new coal plants and no new fossil fuel exploration and development. Governments and investors and businesses must, must pour all of their energy into a low carbon future. You might think that was a Green saying that or me saying that, but it wasn't. That was the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. If this report and the evidence from around the world right now does not convince this generation of political leaders that we have to stabilise the climate, then I don't think anything else will. This is as clear as it can be. Now it's up to our political leaders to act. Again, that's not me saying that, not the Greens saying that. That's Dr Joel Gerges from the Australian National University, who was a lead author on the IPCC report. Yet more evidence of the cost of inaction and it's past time the government stopped spinning and start delivering for Australians. The bare minimum commitment should be committing to net zero emissions by 2050. Again, not me, that was Labor's climate spokesman, Chris Bowen. The science is very clear. We need to get to net zero before 2050. For anyone to, do, for anyone to be credible, we need to do more. We all need to set ambitious targets and put the policies in place to get there. Not me. Not a Green, that was a Liberal, Matt Keane, the Energy Minister from New South Wales. Who interestingly, that state has just legislated the biggest renewable energy package in Australia's history. The rest of the world understands that if we don't do more by 2030, we go over the climate cliff. After all, this report, failure to lift 2030 targets is criminal net negligence. That wasn't me either, but it was someone was a Green. That was the Greens leader, Adam Bant. I raise this in the Parliament because what happens in space in WA does matter. Often we don't think it, that we matter and it's, it's a federal responsibility. I, I really want to challenge that. Look, we all know that Australia is performing badly in this space. The Climate Change Performance in Index ranks Australia 54 out of 61 countries. Um, that was the generous one where we did the best. When the UN report on sustainable development goals came out, Australia was last out of 191 countries. So we all know Australian government isn't offering leadership in this space. But what Perhaps we don't know is that of this one of the worst performing countries, WA is one of the worst performing states. We are the only state in this country with, with rising greenhouse gas emissions, and we also are one of the few states without a legislated net zero emissions target. And I was really pleased to hear the Premier this morning on ABC Radio talk actually about actually that saying that. That was something that he was now considering in terms of actually um, changing our aspiration towards net, um, net zero to actually legislating that target. And I, I certainly uh, saw that as encouraging. Um, as, as the Premier said, this is where the world is going. But WA playing catch up is not the same as WA leading. And um, in, addition to the, in addition to our 2050 net zero target, the science is really clear that a legislative 2030 target in the range of 45 to 50% needs to happen as well. This is just unambiguous. This is very, absolutely clear from this report. And if anyone hasn't had a chance to read the report, I would just really encourage it. 
I really hope that we can debate in this chamber soon targets of this kind. I hope we can debate the policies that we need to get there to meet them. I think this is actually a really exciting time for this state. I, and I hope that this IPCC report, as I said, which I think is such an important report, actually creates a new kind of impetus um, in this parliament for both bipartisan, or we should say multi-partisan action in, 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 in the climate space. Um, all the polls show, show this is what, what, what we, what, what Australians, what West Australians what want to see happen. Over 70% 70, 70 of people want to see greater leadership by, by us in the climate space and want stronger action on it. Um, it's just up to us now, on the back of this report, to, to, to step up, and I hope we can match this concern with action. Um, I'm always like to err on the side of the positive. Whilst climate is undoubtedly a huge risk to this state, it's also a huge opportunity. And I just want to finish by saying I really want to realise that opportunity for this state and look forward to working with you all on realising that. Thank you. The Honourable Stephen Pratt. President, during the winter recess, Donate Life Week ran from the 25th of July to the 1st of August. This important initiative seeks to raise awareness and increase organ donor registration in Australia. In 2021, Donate Life Week is in its 10th year, and some of the key messages this year include if you want to be a donor, make sure you tell your family and friends. Registering is easy and only takes one minute at donatelife.gov.au forward slash register. All you need is your phone, Medicare card and one minute to register. There are around 13 million Australians aged 16 and over who are eligible to register as an organ and tissue donor, donor but haven't. This year's campaign aim to encourage up to 100,000 more Australians to register as organ and tissue donors. It doesn't matter how old you are, your medical history, your lifestyle, what country you're from, or how healthy you are. You can still register. For around 1,800 Australians currently on the organ transplant wait list, it's a matter of life and death. There are an additional 12,000 people on dialysis who may benefit from a kidney transplant. For others, an eye or other tissue transplant is a path to a greatly improved quality of life. Since the national program first began, more than 14,000 people have received a life-saving organ transplant. Around one in three people who have received an organ transplant are from regional Australia and often need to spend a long time away from home for a life-saving transplant. I'd like to acknowledge the more than 5,000 Australians and their families who have said yes to organ donation. COVID-19 has had a direct impact on organ and tissue donation. Compared to 2019, in 2020, there was a 12% decrease in people receiving a transplant, a 16% decrease in donors, and a 16% decrease in Australians registering as donors. This means it has never been more important to register as an organ and tissue donor and to encourage others to as well. Ultimately, the decision to donate your organs and tissue will come down to your family. 90% of families will consent to donation if you are a registered donor. This number is halved if they don't know you wanted to be a donor or you haven't registered. More information is available on the Donate Life website and on their social media pages. The Hon. Brian Walker. Thank you, President. One of the joys of our position is that we get a lot of emails. A lot of them can be disturbing, but sometimes you get emails which fill you with joy. I have unrequested a gentleman sent me uh, this, a detailed description. This is a 41-year-old sufferer of multiple sclerosis. Now, that's a pretty devastating um, uh, diagnosis to have. And if you'll bear with me, I'd like to, to detail what he said in his email because it brought me a great deal of joy. He said, on the morning of March the 13th, I was sitting in my neurologist's office in neurological distress. Well, you can imagine. My brain was misfiring and thinking straight was a challenge. I was sent in for an emergency MRI three hours later to look for progression. There was no progression, just multiple sclerosis, neurological dysfunction. After the MRI, I picked up the oils, cannabis oils, from the post office, and my life changed forever. Now, put yourself in that position, of course, uh, with a fairly serious, well, a very serious diagnosis, and you're trialling something that no doctor is going to say, well, give this a shot. 
I took the THC oil first, half a mil, because I'm a cannabis smoker and can control my high. Within 30 seconds, I could feel the chronic pain go away. I can now stand up straight and even pour a kettle left-handed pain-free. Okay. My first half mil of full-spectrum CBD oil, within 30 seconds, I could feel it ooze over my brain and essentially clearing my head of the constant brain fog 90% of MS patients suffer. Since that first dose, I have had a clear head. It has helped gain control of my condition, as I can now notice when the holes in my nerve fibres are opening up in the hot conditions, and I can act sooner, which cuts down on fatigue. He describes this further. He says, I call it liquid solder. It has prohibited and inhibited neurological function in my brain. The solution I have is a green sludge akin to raw cannabis. I've tried another brand with negative results, gone back to the other brand, and I'm back to normal again. Now, after a few days, I had a tingling sensation start on the top of my chest, front of shoulder. This slowly increased up to the three-week mark when it exploded through my body. This, I believe, was the endocannabinoid system opening up in my body. Since then, I've been one of the healthiest MS patients you could find. I still have some neurological dysfunction, but it is way more manageable with full-spectrum CBD oil than without. I have told my neurologist about this, and he can't explain it. My GP doesn't know anything about cannabis, but was happy to prescribe it, and she can't explain it either. I'm explaining it with my limited knowledge and just describing what happened in my head. So, there is my positive cannabis as medicine story for you. It has been an absolute game changer, just that now, I have every legal barrier in my way to gaining any gainful employment. Keep up the good fight, Brian. Isn't that wonderful? This from a gentleman who's based in Queensland. The law allows him there greater access to cannabis than here. So basically, it's a, a, a difficult uh, thing to, uh, to achieve, and it's even more difficult in Western Australia because of the restrictions we have. I wonder how many MS patients here would benefit from this. So what I'm asking here is the relaying information, a real life information, from maybe one person with MS and asking how many people in this state would love access to that same substance to give them the chance that they may be denied at present. Members, are there any further member statements? The House is adjourned.